it's not quite moist enough. And I can always add water after you've got everything in here too. So you're gonna put, put your soil in the bottom of the container and you wanna come up pretty close to your cut line because the soil settles a little bit and you're also gonna pat it down a little bit. So notice how handy this is. I just have my hand in the bottleneck like this to keep it from flopping back on me while I fill it up. And see, I managed to get dirt on my kitchen table anyway. That's par for the course with me. That's why I have a drop cloth here. Um, anyway, when I've got it pretty close to filled up to the top, then I'm gonna give it just a little bit of gentle patting down, just smoothing it down. We are sowing some pretty tiny seeds today in part. And um, because we're sowing tiny seeds, um, you know, you kind of want a pretty smooth surface. Um, okay, so the first, so this is my, I decided to do my swamp milkweed first, which is probably the easiest seed to sow. Um, if you start with your swamp milkweed, because this is a pretty big seed. Um, you should have enough seed to do about 20 seeds per bottle like this. Now, if you have a great big milk bottle, you would have room to do more than that, but you could just spread them out too. Um, but 20 is a good number. They don't all sprout. Don't expect them all to sprout, but that by giving you 20 seeds, that's why I make sure that you're gonna get some successes. So I'm just gently dropping these around on the top of the soil like this. Now, here's, here's a, a rule of thumb that you can always remember and keep in mind is uh, if you wanna know how deep to sow some seed, and the seed didn't come with any directions. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. If you don't know how deep to sow your seed, you go about the thickness of the seed itself. So some seeds are teeny tiny. That means you barely dust them with soil. These milkweed seeds, as you can see, are a little bit, they're big, but they're flat. They're kind of skinny. So I'm gonna put less than a quarter of an inch of soil on top of here. And I just kind of do it by just lightly, lightly sprinkling the soil on the top. Just barely covering the seed. You don't want to weigh down in there. They don't want to have to work. You'll see when they, when they start popping up, they practically push themselves out of the soil anyway. And their roots always know to go down and their little leaves know to go up. Okay, so you've got, you've got your you patted your seed in. I'll just put a little bit more in. Some of them are sticking out a little bit too much. Okay, so that's it. So this is now ready. Now, you heard me mention labeling it. This is the other thing I do. So, um, and if you don't happen to have, I get these nice big, um, kind of, we used to call them popsicle sticks from, um, from Michael's. But again, improvisation and reduce reuse is what we're all about here. I keep getting these chopsticks in our takeout um, and I had a lot of leftover chopsticks and it dawned on me that it makes a great uh, little label. You just have to write a little bit more neatly because you have to write small, but it works. And so you can put, you can use chopsticks or if you had a, like a leftover plastic tag from, from a plant you bought last year, or you could put some tape on it and reuse that. Whatever, the point here is, why am I so um, making such a big point about labeling? It's the darndest thing. They, they, things happen, one label gets lost, you're moving the plant, the stick falls out, and you're like, darn, where, you know, what is it? Or, or it fades or something. This is your insurance that you're not going to uh, forget what you put in the bottle. 
Um, the other thing that I always put on um, the stick when I put it in here is the date, because later on, you know, this is a, there's a lot of of um, variability in when you might put your seed out, and it's kind of interesting. Sometimes you say, "Wow, the stuff I put out in January." Did, a lot, did better than the stuff I put out in February or vice versa. It's just interesting to know. So I always put the date um, and then I put the number of seeds that are in here um, because then when very few of the, if, if, very, if a whole bunch of them sprout, then you can say, oh, I put 20 in and 20 germinated. Well, that's 100% germination rate, pretty darn good. So I'm gonna write down here that I put in um, 20 seeds so now I have the information that I'm going to wish I had handy on this little stick and I'm going to put it in here. Later on, I use these little sticks to prop the lid open. We'll talk about that when we get, get done with this, but um, I use it to prop the lid open when the war weather turns warm. Um, so in it goes and I pop it over the top and this is ready to get sealed up. So, my trusty tape gun that I use, uh, but any kind of package sealing tape is good for this. People use duct tape. I like the clear tape because I want as much sunlight to reach the bottles as possible. So I like this and I just bring it around like so, seal it up. One more piece for good measure. And presto, I am ready to go. Now, when I put this outside, um, condensation is gonna show up on the inside of the bottle really quickly. Sometimes within minutes of when I put it outside in the cold, the condensation forms, which is nice. Um, that's a way that you can tell at a glance that um, there's enough moisture in, in the bottle. Um, so it, watch for that condensation. Okay, um, Pat, I saw you keep on, did, does somebody have a question? Yes, um, Kara asked if you can use a quart milk jug or is that too small? Um, a quart is kind of tiny, kind of tiny, um, because a quart gives you a lot less surface area than this. But you know what? Give it a try. Maybe only put 10 seeds in so they won't be quite so crowded. Um, but if that's, I know people, some people have been in a panic state with me. They're like, I don't buy soda. I don't, you know, we don't, nobody in our house, you know, we don't, we, um, we buy paper cartons. And so um, improvisation, I will tell you that there is a wonderful group of winter sowers on Facebook. If you just type in winter sowers on Facebook, you'll see this group and that group will do I've seen them use anything for winter sowing because they're, I mean, some of, some of the people and gardeners in the group do put out a hundred bottles of things and they're basically, they're, they're out raiding their neighbors recycling to get more bottles, but they will, they will use anything. So, so these are my preferred things because I like, um, I like the size. I like what it holds, but there's no hard and fast rule that a quart, uh, quart size bottle wouldn't work. So that's the okay. only question right now. Okay. Is there another one, Pat? No, that, no. Okay. okay. All right. So the next thing I want to show you, tell you a little bit about these seeds, um, the next seeds that we are going to do, um, which if I'm going to do it before I do it, give me a second. I got to poke holes in here. Or I'll be mad at myself later. Um, you really don't forget to poke the holes before you put the soil in because otherwise it's kind of messy. So I'm getting my holes in for nice drainage. So by the way, if you did have a gallon of milk container, um, put about, like this has five holes in a gallon milk container, I would go for 12 or a dozen because there's a lot more surface area needs needs more uh, more drainage holes relative to the surface area. Okay, 
So um, here we have another bottle ready to receive. It's now I did I didn't get around to putting my white tape label on this. So I'm just going to quickly put. I'm doing the Joe Pie next, so I'm going to put Joe and Pie. Alice. Yes. Someone asked if these are perennial seeds. Yes, they are. Yes. Um, so you are, and, and I'm so glad you asked that because uh, because these are perennials, not annuals. Like annuals are zinnias and marigolds and things like that. They they bloom and they're done in a single summer. Um, and those are warm climate plants, by the way. But these are perennials, which will come back again and again in your garden. And um, we gardeners have a saying with perennials, the first year they sleep, the next year they creep, the third year they leap, which is a way of telling you that this plant is not going to get huge its first year. So you can, um, it, it's just going to act like a, a seedling and it may not even bloom, um, but it will, um, it's all the actions going on underground with the roots. So um, uh, that's something to keep keep in mind when you plant it, you're going to put it someplace where you know where it is uh, because it'll be a, a small plant rather than a big bushy plant like it will be in succeeding years and you don't want to forget it's there or mistake it for a weed. Oh. So. And um, Irene is asking, this. she might be getting ahead of, of you, but how long does a milkweed take to grow before you have to take it out, and how do you take it out? How long does a milkweed have to grow before you take have it out? To take it out, and then how do oh, you oh, take it oh, out? Oh, to pot it up. Yes, I am going to, I'm going to explain I'm going to get to that um, after we finish with this, uh, with sowing the seed on this one. Um, I am going to explain about um, what we call that. Yes, it's called potting up um, when it's ready, when it's outgrown its its little container here. Um, and the good news is you don't have to take notes like crazy because that information is in the handouts that. Um, the library will be sending you tomorrow. So we're, we will be good. Um, so um, the next thing, and again, I'm just going to kind of smooth this down a little bit because we're getting to the Joe Pie seeds are tiny. And what you'll notice when you get your Joe Pie seeds out uh, in your New York ironweed seeds is that they're very similar to each other. They both have, um, this is gonna be so tiny. I'm gonna hold it right up to the camera and see if you can see it. Um, you'll see the fluff on each seed. Can you see that? So that fluff is called pappus. Um, these seeds are dispersed by wind and that little piece of fluff helps the seed travel. Um, and uh, in, your, in your seeds, you may see some things that look like they might be seed, but if they're not attached to a little piece of fluff, that's just chaff. It's not, uh, it's not the business end of the seed, if you will. So the fluff has attached to it, looks like a little man in a parachute, um, a little tiny brown seed that tapers at the bottom. Um, and you're gonna take these guys and just lightly sprinkle them over the surface of your soil. And um, the Ecotype Project folks told me to tell you guys that this one um, really barely gets covered by soil. I mean, I'm just gonna barely dust it. It needs a little bit of light to germinate. Um, and uh, so as you're sprinkling it around, uh, because this seed was harvested by hand, uh, you'll see little bits of chaff and maybe a little petal or two or something like that. Don't worry about it. That can all go in um, and, and uh, in, into your soil because after all in nature, it's, you know, nobody's going around separating the seed out in nature. So it's just fine. Um, and I had, um, I, I told the library to give everybody a big pinch of this seed because it's not the, 
quickest to germinate and we wanted to give you the best chance possible that it will for you so that's what um that was our advice okay so now i am literally just putting i mean i'm pretending think you're putting cayenne on a dish you don't want you barely want so i am just barely um sprinkling my dirt and i don't even mind if some of the seed is showing i'm just patting it down a little bit that's all the coverage it needs um and uh and that's it for the for the joe pot you're what you're going to do we don't have to sow the uh the new york iron wheat tonight we may if we have time but we don't we don't have to i want to make sure i cover all the other uh information um but the new york iron weed and the joe pie look really similar the difference is if you could get a close look the fluff on the new york iron weed looks kind of like um strawberry blonde and uh, the fluff on this looks kind of ash blonde. So if, God forbid, you accidentally mixed up the two, if you have really sharp eyes, you would also see, um, besides the color of the fluff, the New York ironweed is kind of a tapering seed. And, or excuse me, the ironweed is, is a little bit more of a blunt end, and this is more tapering on the Joe Pie. So that's, that's, that's a piece of information to share. Now, I'm going to set this aside for the moment because I haven't made a tag for it yet. So I don't want to seal it up. But I wanted to um, share with you a couple other tips. Um, this is an ordinary um, makeup brush that's seen better days. Uh, it's really good for picking up little bitty seeds. Um, so if you're finding you're like, oh my gosh, I can't, you know, my hands are too big for this seed. Sometimes I just take the little brush and go, you know, pick it up and flick it off and pick it up and flick it off. And that's um, when you're working with teensy seeds. It's a handy thing to have. I'm sure you've got one rattling around in a drawer somewhere. Um, other things to tell you about, um, I mentioned the tape as a, the way I like to seal my bottles, but I just learned from one of my resources, there's another easy way to seal a bottle, and you might like this method better, and it's a way to reuse a bread tie. Yay! So um, instead of using tape, and this is handy if you discovered you were out of tape, you can put two holes opposite where it hinges. Just put two holes like this, and then you put your bread tie through, and you thread it through, and you just close it shut like this and keep it, twi keep, keep it closed this way. So this is a handy little trick an alternative means of closure. See, I told you the winter sewing people are very ingenious. They are always coming up with new tricks to do things better and new things to sew this way. Uh, so if you have, have some fun with this method. Um, a, a good starter to try besides this, uh, when you're looking at a seed catalog or if you're at the hardware store and see their seed uh, selection or at the, at, at, at one of our local wonderful nurseries, um, pick a kind of lettuce you like and start it in one of these. And uh, for lettuce, you don't have to start this soon. Um, the trick with all our um, winter sowing is we're basically mimicking what the seed wants to do anyway. So um, in the case of lettuce, lettuce sprouts pretty fast. So you wouldn't need to put it out in January. You can put lettuce out. Uh, I did this last year, March 15th. I put lettuce um, and I wanted a lot of it. So I put it in a gallon milk jug and you know, I had lots of little um, lettuce starts just, um, and then I, I took them out and, and planted them in my, in my uh, vegetable bed. So, um, I now want to get back to talking a little bit more about um, what you're going to do with your bottles, uh, the best place to put them outside. So uh, tomorrow morning, um, or whenever your bottles are ready, go out and pick a sunny place in your garden. And, um, and don't make the mistake of thinking this needs to be protected or sheltered, because that actually um, will hinder the process that you want, that the seed needs of this 
cold and warm temper temperature fluctuation. So you can put it right out in a sunny spot in, in your yard. I don't recommend putting it on the deck because the deck is kind of uh, temperature extremes. It's not like, and it's not, it's better to have the bottom of it in contact with the soil. Um, just for, for the moisture drainage and everything else. Um, and you want to put it someplace uh, where if you're afraid they're going to tip over or blow over or something like that, I mean, they're kind of anchored. But um, again, uh, with a little resourcefulness, look in your garage, see if you have, I had this, which is came from um, a nursery when I bought the plants and uh, they sent me home with this tray and this tray makes a really great uh, place to put my bottle so I just line up my bottles in this tray and they stay exactly where I put them but I punched out the bottoms of the tray so that they have contact with the soil so um, this is a nifty thing I reuse every year to hold my winter sewing bottles in uh, but if you don't have that you can um, put them all together and maybe uh, tie some twine around them or tie some twine through the through the handles if you have jug handles on, on your milk jugs um, or just kind of hem them in with bricks or rocks or something. Uh, and then, you know, if it's, if it's been a wild and windy time, you might want to look outside and make sure they didn't uh, fall over or get knocked over or your curious pet didn't knock them over. Um, once you've taken care of all that, you really don't have to worry about them for quite a while. So, so let's imagine that this, uh, and people say, oh my gosh, they got buried in the snow. No problem. That's, that is just fine. This is mimicking what the seed would encounter anyway. So it's all good. Um, Alice, yes. um, Irene is asking how many hours of sun should they get? Okay, so while they are um, out there, you want them to get as much sun as possible uh, this, for this winter spring period. So um, I hope you have a spot, uh, you probably have a spot that gets at least six hours of sun because all the leaves are off the trees. So um, any place like that is good. I put mine in full sun because um, we've been calling these mini greenhouses and they really do work that way. They also work uh, like a cold frame, if you've ever heard of a cold frame, um, because uh, the, what you're really doing when you do these is it still gets cold at night. It can still get below freezing in here, but it is protected from, um, if, if for example, it, later on in the spring, it, it got down to 32 one night. Well, inside here, you probably already have shoots coming up and everything, but they're protected by being surrounded by the bottle. So 32 degrees is not gonna bother, bother the plants in here um, later on when the sprouts are up. And the sprouts don't really show up until the day lengths have gotten a, a good bit longer and the days are a lot milder. So, I mean, I'm always out there checking just in case, but really, I'd be surprised if you see anything before April 15th. And it will depend on the kind of spring we have. So, um, could be that uh, around um, the beginning of April, we get crazy balmy weather. It's happened, remember? I think we it hit 80 one, time, one, one April morning. And then, then, you know, two days later, there was snow on the ground again. So um, what we do is we leave them sealed up like this. Um, even after the weather started to get a little bit balmier, but because this is working like a greenhouse, the time will come when you want to free the seedlings um, by opening this up so that it doesn't get too hot in here. And I, I tend to say um, you don't have to do it until you're seeing a lot, of, uh, a lot of growth coming up. If the seedlings are barely sticking their noses out, you really don't have to open it up. And then once I have them open, I leave them flipped open 
and you'll see this in the handout, but you may see this right now if you look closely. You can see oops, this here, and it's there. There it is. Here they are with their tops flipped back. That's why you have the hinge. And they're enjoying the sunlight. Um, on that particular night, when uh, after I took this picture, I saw that the temperatures were going to get down in the 30s. And so I went and I flipped the lids back on again. I didn't retake them. I just flipped them down. And, and that was enough protection. Um, that's generally, uh, these are native perennials. Uh, they are used to, they usually start poking up out of the ground in April. You can see the first signs of life. So um, that's, that's when um, you'll probably see signs of life here. Um, and back to the question of uh, one of uh, one of our participants was asking, when do you take them out? So um, when I take them out, and again, this is all on your handout, so don't take notes frantically uh, to remember. But I usually take uh, I usually pot them up around May fifteenth, and. Um, I like to put them, so I put them in little nursery pots that are about three or four inch pots at that point. And what I do at that point is, you know, you, you'll have a hunk of seedlings, a, a, a big old, a, you know, a bunch of seedlings. And I take a tray and I kind of, I just dump the contents out onto the tray and then I gently separate the little seedlings from each other and pot them up individually in those small pots. And so Maria is asking if there are some heavy rainstorms, could it possibly flood the bottles? No, no, because that's why you have your drainage. Okay. I mean, I guess the only thing you'd need to worry about is if let's say a gutter was sloshing so much rain out down where you had your bottles that they were literally sitting in two inches of water. But the whole idea is that's why we have drainage. So they're getting the same treatment that something in your garden gets. So it's not going to flood. And that's why we have nice potting soil in here. The water drains through it. Um, and uh, um, it, I, it wouldn't be a problem. Um, if, if, uh, if they're not getting quite enough sunlight, um, then they, you might see a little bit of green algae on the surface of the uh, of the soil, don't worry about it. That that happens, but basically, uh, if you think, "Oh my gosh, this is I can see it just looks sopping wet." Well, if you're really worried about it, I guess you could slip out there and make a, another couple holes in the bottom to help it with drainage. But honestly, the whole idea is this is the part that we're leaving to nature. So um, I haven't found it necessary to do that. So. Um, Anyway, so on about on or about May fifteenth, these guys are going to be ready to um, go live in your gardens and or live in live in pots. Like I like to put them in pots um, and baby them for a little while longer. Keep an eye on them um, because I may still be going through my massive weeding campaigns in the garden, and I don't want to be looking out, uh, watching out for a seedling that's three inches tall right then. So um, I may wait, let them get a little bit more uh, root structure on them and then plant them in the garden. Um, and then sometimes I'm going around giving them, you may end up with so many, you can give them away to friends. So that'll be nice. Um, so uh, let's see, I've covered, I've covered alternate means of closure. I've covered how you've taped them together. I've told you how you barely, bear, the tinier the seed, the barer you cover it, which means the job high gets just a, a skimpy little dusting and the New York ironweed doesn't get much more than that. Um, and Jeffrey, uh, has, Jeffrey has one question yeah. again about, I think he is not certain when you leave the tops off or on. Oh, oh, the tops? No, nope, tops are never on. This is where the water gets in. But so, the top of the, I think the container. Oh, so, oh, okay. All right. So um, 
when what I do is when around April 15th, I start watching. And if it's been a mild spring and very balmy and the seedlings are really starting to grow and I can tell um, the condensation when it starts to get a little too hot in here, remember I told you there will always be condensation, it starts to get a little too warm in here, you may notice, oh, there's no condensation anymore. It looks, and you can feel it and you're like, ooh, this is, this is getting warm. It's time to open them up and, and, and pop the tops back. Um, and by leaving the hinge in place, you can, you can allow for mother nature being inconsistent and flip the hinge flip the thing back on again um, if it's get you know if that warm spell that was history and it's getting down to uh, um, 35 flip it back on leave it back on so the only you really as I, I've been saying set it and forget it the time you start paying attention to these is when um, when the seedlings are up and the weather starts getting mild that's when you need to start babying them a little bit more than you were because at this point um, the seedlings have been well acclimated to shifts between hot and cold because it gets warm in here during the day and it gets cold at night but they aren't so tough that they could take um, being exposed to freezing temperatures um, and deep uh, hard frost overnight. They would not do well uh, with 26 with their lids off. But if their lids were closed, they'd be okay. So, and you don't really see below say 26 in the last half of April. So um, you'll see, they will do really well. Um, so you, you can flip the lids off anytime it's a nice day. And if it's not gonna be cold at night, you leave the lids off. Uh, just keep an eye on the temperature. Um, and uh, as I said, once they start, as somebody once said to me, when they start strangling each other in their little containers, which will be around May 15th, that's when you know it's time to pot up and just dump them out on a tray, gently separate the seedlings and put them in their individual little um, three or four inch uh, nursery pots. Or if you're in the tough love, uh, family, you put them straight out in the garden then. Um, some people do. I, I like to baby them a little while longer. So um, let's see. And Alice, Kara's yes. asking what size bottles you've used there. Um, well, uh, these, these are one liter bottles. This is a half gallon bottle. This too is a one liter bottle. So I, I tend to like I, if, if we drank soda, I would probably use two liter bottles too, but we don't have any, so I didn't do those. Oh, and before I forget, if you're improvising and you're using those, those salad boxes, um, the clear salad boxes, you need, bec because it's not a bottle cap situation, you need to make holes in the top as well as in the bottom because that's how the water gets in. So um, let's say you had one of those salad dishes that are yay big. I would crunch a dozen holes in the top, same as the number of holes you got punched in the bottom or one of those, because uh -huh. they're about the same area as a milk, as a gallon milk jug. So- I said we plant them now in the greenhouses. And in, the, in these bottles, yes. She and, thought you mentioned the directions for either C30 or C60, so that would take us to mid-February or mid-March. Thanks for okay. clarifying. Oh, sure. Yeah, and it, it is a little confusing. Okay, so if you, um, this is, if you're going out and buying seed at Prairie Moon and they say their germination code is C30 or C60. Either one can could be winter sowed right now. Because again, in nature, those seeds hit the ground last fall. Um, the reason Prairie Moon says C30 means 30 days and C60 means 60 days, that means for those 
um, a 60 dayer means it's got to have 60 days of being cold. So um, that's fine because if you're doing this in January or February, you still have 60 days ahead of you of cold. So not a problem. They put those codes on there. Um, uh, some people use a technique that's called cold moist stratification, which involves using your refrigerator. And in that case, they want to tell you if it says C60, it has to be in the fridge for 60 days minimum. If it says C30, it has to be in the fridge for 30 days minimum. But I just use that code as a guideline for keying me in to which seeds will do very well with this method. So um, it, it, um, if you bought some seeds and they said C60 on them, you could put them out tomorrow um, outside in the bottles and they would do fine. If they said C30, same things, you could put them out tomorrow and do fine because what happens is the seed really doesn't wake up until the conditions are right, which means this alternating warm, cold, warm, cold, and the moisture and the day length all of those things trigger the seed to germinate. So um, we're just helping them along a little bit by putting them in these little mini greenhouses. Uh -huh. um, the, the other thing about, and some people have said, why, why do I need to even put them in the bottle? If, if I'm really gonna do what nature does, why don't I just throw them out in my garden? And you can, but this is a little bit of, uh, protection. Um, so they sprout a little bit sooner than they would out in the garden. And also by not put, when the reason some of those flowers have jillions of seeds per flower is they have a very high rate of getting eaten by birds and mice and chipmunks and anybody else who's looking for a protein snack um, hits the seeds. So when we have them in here, um, we're getting a much better percentage of germinating plants than we would if we just tried to scatter them. Plus, scattering them, you know, you're not going to be able to go there and just get the exact right level and everything. There's a lot of, of loss involved when nature sows its seeds. We're gaming the system a little bit by doing this and ending up with more um, more seeds at the end of the day, uh, or more seedlings at the end of the day. Um, so um, let's see, what else? Oh, I wanted to tell you more about in, if you start having some fun with this and decide, oh, I'm gonna sow my tomatoes. I'm gonna sow my zinnias this way. The one thing to remember about winter sowing um, is that when you're working with a plant who was born in the tropics, which is, well, uh, they were born in, you know, tomatoes come from the Caribbean, so does uh, zinnias do too. Um, these plants do not enjoy cold weather at all. So um, you could, uh, some people do winter sow, quote, winter sow zinnias, but they actually only put them out um, like in late April. So they would do the same thing we just did, but put the bottle out in late April. And you might say, well, why would anybody bother to do that? And it's because you're still getting a little bit of a jump. You put the thing out in late April, the zinnia sprout, they get acclimated, but they're still protected from the worst. And so you've got some seedlings that are up and going weeks before you could have um, sowed them outside. Because if you read a zinnia pack, it says, so after all danger of frost is past. Well, when you have them in here, you're protecting them just enough that you can sneak that timeline up a little bit. So that's nice. Um, so the people who, who are winter sowers, who do things like tomatoes, which are also hot weather lovers, um, and zinnias, they're waiting until way late. Um, they're just stealing a little bit of time on what they could have gotten if they started from seeds in the garden. Um, the other thing um, to keep in mind um, with, with any seed that you think, gee, I wonder if I can winter sow this, is if you look at the back of the seed packet and the seed packet says, 
So when all danger frost is passed, then you know that's going to be a temperamental. It may not do that well. Um, and uh, But if it says, you know, so two weeks before last frost, then you know, well, this can take a little bit of cold, not a lot. Whereas these guys with their C30s and C60s, you know they can take a ton of cold. So um, that's a good way to gauge it. The other thing I would mention is um, what I also do besides winter sowing is I have grow lights and I start some of my seeds like my tomatoes because I'm greedy for tomatoes and I wanna get them started as soon as possible. Those I do start under grow lights with the heat mats, the whole nine yards, takes, it takes more effort. It's worth it to me um, because I love tomatoes. And I also sow some zinnias that way too, get a start on them. Um, but uh, winter sowers discovered that you can sow a whole lot more seeds than you have room in your house for grow lights by using this technique. So the thing is, find the plants that do best with this I mentioned lettuce, you could also do kale. Chard would do very well um, in these in winter sowing. Uh, arugula would. Anything that just doesn't care about the cold, and those are typical examples, uh, plants in the Nebraska family, would all do really well with this kind of, um, of a technique. Look at the seed packet, see what it says about when you're supposed to sow it, and if it's supposed to be after all danger of frost is passed, or a little bit before, if it's before, then you know that it's a good candidate um, for this technique. Okay, and um, Kara's asking, if you start zinnias in bottles, do you then not have to harden them off? That is correct. That is absolutely right. This process is mimicking that hardening off technique. They're getting that by virtue of getting their start here. Just as, you know, the, the cold frames that you may have heard about that um, some uh, gardeners have, a cold frame is basically a giant winter sowing contraption. Um, of course, the, the drawback is if you sow things, the cold frame, I don't know if you guys know, but it looks like a raised bed. It's got wood around the sides and it has a big piece of glass over the top. So it works like a mini, or, or a medium, I don't know, small to medium greenhouse in size. Of course, the drawback to the cold frame is that you're out there in the dirt in the middle of winter sowing <laughs> seeds there, whereas we're doing this nice thing in our cozy kitchen. So um, it, one of these days I'll probably put in a cold frame um, and play around with that, but I find that this is so satisfactory that uh, it's, it's just a really great technique. And one more question, uh, uh -huh. can we do less hardy plants in a fairly warm room in the basement that gets good light from two windows? No, it oh. is almost impossible to start seed with light from a window. Mm -hmm. You need that supplemental, a, 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 a bank of fluorescence, and they will tell you to put, you hang, when you're starting your seed, you hang the fluorescent light like two inches, three inches above, or LEDs either way, but that's to start, they're greedy for light, um, little seeds, little seedlings. So that would not work. Um, they would just be gangly uh, and sad if you tried to do that. So if, if you really want I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a trick you could do if you don't have grow lights and you'd like to start something like um, that is comes from a hot place. Most of the annuals that you know that you grow um, in in your seed growing, like um, besides besides zinnias, marigolds, or um, cosmos, or any of those kinds of of. Uh, flowers that come and go in a single season. Um, they all came from hotter climes than here. Uh, that's why they're annual. Some of them are actually perennials in their own country and they aren't perennials here because they can't make it. But you could, if you really wanted to futz with it because you didn't have grow lights, you could could start your zinnias or your, your not so hardy uh, flowers 
um, in one of these things and um, bring it in at night. But you have to be really on time. Take it out in the take it out in the sunlight outside in the daytime and bring it in at night and take it back out um, unless uh, it's gotten to be about fifty outside. Uh, that would be one way. Like I've I've considered uh, if I run out of room under my grow lights, I've considered trying that with tomatoes. But I'm afraid I would I'd forget one night and poof, all my work would be for naught. So um, it's it's really hard. I mean, some if some people maybe you have a sunroom, and the and it's facing south, and the sun just pours in. Um, I know people who will start seed that way, but then what they do is they take it outside. They take their little tray of seedlings outside every day to get real sunlight and bring it back in at night. So, um, but that's not winter sowing. So. Uh -huh. I think your answer just answered this next question. Can you use regular fluorescent instead of grow light indoors? Uh, yes, people do. Um, 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 but uh, T5 fluorescents are the best. Those are the little skinny ones. So, um, you know, if you've got somebody handy who can rig a pulley for, for you, you can get, you know, kind of like a shop light with a bunch, you know, you want several rows of fluorescent tubes in a shop light type thing, and maybe you have a pulley so you can raise and lower it over your plants. That can work. People do that in the basement all the time. Well, this has been wonderful. I think that is the end of the questions. I don't know okay. if anybody else has another question. Um, tomorrow I will send all of you the handouts from Alice. And um, the original handout that Amanda sent to you has some additions that Alice has put in. And so I'll send that again. So make sure to, to look at that. It, even though it looks familiar, there's more information on it. Um, thank you so much. This has been wonderful, Alice. Now I have to go, to go get my plastic <laughs> bottle and start. <laughs> Well, it's been fun for me, too. I just, uh, the pollinator pathway can use all of you helping um, sow these native seeds to um, help restore habitat. So thank you so much for listening in. for joining Darien Library this morning for House Plants 101, keeping indoor plants healthy and happy with Joy DiBiase of the Gardner Center, our across the street neighbor. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by the annual Friends of the Library campaign. We thank you for your support to make programs like this as well as our collections available to the community. And I hope everyone's ready to learn about plants and winter. I'm now ready to turn, going to turn the program over to Joy. Hi everyone, Joy here at the Gardener Center. How are you? I'm sure some of you recognize me from shopping here. And we got together with the Darien Library and we thought we'd give you a little bit of info on some of the terms that we use uh, about lighting and watering and how to keep your plants happy and healthy during the winter. So jump in anytime if you have questions and you just, you know, anything you want to know you can ask me. Um, I thought I'd start by talking about lighting and some of the language that we use when we talk about lighting, bright indirect light or moderate indirect light or low light. It gets a little confusing sometimes. People think they have less light than they do or more light than they do. 
So if you talk about bright light, bright light would be southern or western exposure coming through the windows, about five or six hours of great light flooding your room. If you talk about moderate light, it's more of an eastern or southwest exposure, not directly coming into the room, but if the room is not dark. But we also have corners, which are a little tricky, which would some people say the light's coming in the windows and it's beautiful southern exposure. But if you're in the corner, your light's not going sideways into the corner, it's coming out into the room and missing that corner. So you would be considered more moderate to low if you're doing corner pieces. Fortunately, nowadays, there are many plants you can use in a low light area. Not like years and years and years ago where there was only a couple of choices. There's actually quite a few choices now, which makes it helpful if you have a dark corner that you want to fill. Also keep in mind, in the winter, your light changes. So be mindful of some of the plants you're going to choose for an area that might get bright sun once the sun comes and changes in the summertime. We always say indirect because most of these foliage plants don't like the direct sunlight on them, especially coming through the windows. Because when the sun's coming through the glass, it acts like a magnifying glass and it's really actually going to burn them more than help them because they can't put sunblock on like we can put sunblock on. So we have to be careful about where you place them in the home. Um, so that's a little bit talk about lighting. Does anybody have any questions about lighting or? Nope, no question. Okay. I have a question. You have a question. What's a sign? So if your plant's getting too much light or not enough light, what will the leaves look like to show you, hey, I need help? <laughs> so it, it treats, it, if you're not getting enough light, sometimes your leaves will turn yellow or they'll turn dark colors because what's happening is if they don't get the adequate light and then they're drinking up their water that you're watering them with, they could possibly get like more of a fungal thing going on if they're not getting quite enough light. But it's funny because they act the same way if they're getting too much light, where the leaves can turn yellow, crispy, and brown. It could be too much light or too much water. <laughs> so <it's laughs> um, but like I said, they can't put sunblock on. So sometimes if they're in that really hard direct sun, they're going to get crispy, burnt leaves, just like we would get sunburn if we went out and didn't put sunblock on. Makes sense. I have a few more questions coming in. Oh, you got it, Pat. Um, one of our um, attendees is asking, what about corner light with windows on either side? So again, that take corner light, say on your plant, and I'm in the corner, and you have a window here, and you have a window here. Your light is coming out into the room this way and not actually coming sideways to oh, okay. me. So corners would always be considered more moderate to low unless you have windows on the opposite side of the room. Okay. Then you would be bright to moderate. Okay. Light never goes sideways. It always reflects outward. So even if they're in between the windows and the corner, the light's not coming this way. It's going out this way. Any other questions? Um, one of our attendees is asking about a peace lily. Okay. It's no longer flowering in spite of the fact re that she replaced it replaced with organic soil. Okay. And How? also on the same one, why do tips of leaves turn brown on the peace lily? 
So tips of leaves on the piece of leaf could turn brown from inconsistent watering. Peace lilies get very dramatic when they need water and they tend to wilt and faint. It's better if you don't let them get to that point because that will cause some browning on the tips. If you let them faint and then you water and then they pop back up like magic, but then you let them faint again and then you water and they pop back up. It's always better to keep them upright Oh. by keeping them consistently moist. Uh, consistent would be a word used a weekly watering, or sometimes the peace lilies have to do uh, multiple waterings during a week. Brown tips can also be caused from what type of water you're using. Some tap water is really high concentrated in chlor chlorine or fluoride. So some plants prefer to have filter water, filtered water used, or you can let your tap water sit out for 24 hours so that those minerals dissipate. And if the peace lily is not flowering, you can use a blossom booster. Give it a little boost. Maybe she needs a little help to flower a little bit. So they only flower maybe two or three times a year. It's not a continuous thing. So if she's only gone a few months without flowering, then just be patient. If she's gone a couple of years without flowering, then maybe a little blossom booster will be in the, uh, on the next checklist for the next time you want it. And um, we have um, someone who's asking, how do you know if you're watering too much or too little? Mm -hmm -hmm. Also tricky because some of the plants act the same way with too much water and too little water. It's some turn, you know, it's, it, they show the same signs when you're not watering enough or you're watering too much. Most of the time, if you're watering too much, your leaves will be yellow and mushy and black. And if you're not watering enough, they'll be more yellow and crispy rather than mushy. Okay. So it's a little tricky. Always wanna make sure your plant has good drainage. If you don't have, if you're planting in a pot that has no drainage hole, you always want to try to put a layer of stone, at least an inch to two inches of a layer of gravel or stone in the bottom of your pot to create a reservoir for excess water. And you can also invest in a water meter. They are super helpful, super inexpensive, and they'll be able to tell you if your plant needs water or doesn't need water at the moment. Great. 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 So why don't we go right into water? <laughs> when we talk about a consistent water. Uh, consistent would mean a weekly watering, say once every five to seven days. Moderate watering would be, say, bi-weekly, once every 10 days to two weeks. And when we say dry, it's maybe a month to eight weeks, which, believe it or not, some plants love to be bone dry. And people look at me and they go, really? Eight weeks? You want to water this thing for eight weeks? <laughs> and they love it. These, some of them love to be dry, drought tolerant, love it, prefer it that way, stick them in the corner, ignore them, don't water them. Does that sound great? <laughs> With all busy stuff we have going on, that's terrific. <laughs> um, again, water meters will, are helpful. Your finger is also the best way to tell if you need to water your plant. You take your finger, you stick it down into the soil, and not just the tip of your finger so it touches, you're going all the way down in, maybe an inch to two inches down, and you'll be able to feel in that soil if it's damp, if it's bone dry, or if it's wet. And uh, unfortunately, all different plants like all different types of watering, so you just have to figure out which plant you have and how much water it likes. 
always use warm water or lukewarm water if you can. Try not to use very cold water out of the tap. It's like us getting in a cold shower. You're using that cold water, pouring it over the soil, and it's going down into the roots, and it would be like us jumping in a cold shower, and nobody wants to do that. So there's a few different things. Some plants like to be watered from the bottom. African violets like to be watered from the bottom. They don't like to have water touch their leaves. Cyclamen love to be watered from the bottom because, and especially this time of year, you'll see cyclamen all over the place because cyclamen love the cooler temperatures. So they're more of a winter flowering plant. They are a tuberous plant. So they sprout from a tube. If you top water your cyclamen and you get water inside that tube, the whole plant rots. So always water from the bottom. Uh, your succulents can be watered from the bottom, so you're not getting water on your leaves or in little pockets, so the leaves aren't rotting out. Um, also, misting is a good thing to do during the winter time for certain plants. They're missing their humidity outside. I don't know if anybody else has noticed, but this winter has been horrible dry. My sinuses are terrible, terrible. So the plants need their humidity too. I run humidifiers in the house. They'll appreciate a good misting or run the humidifier if you have one. Um, it also helps to deter certain pests that you'll find during the winter time that like it dry and hot inside the house. Should I pause or should we keep going? We've got a lot of questions coming oh, in. Oh, go for it. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> um, back to lighting. Someone was curious, what if they have, you have skylights? What is your recommendation? Oh, skylights could be great. Skylights produce a lot of light. So even if you're not a lot of windows around, you know, the exterior, the wall, they produce a lot of nice, natural, um, bright light. And it won't be so harsh if the sun is coming through the skylight onto the plant because it's so far up so far away so you'll be nice bright light with the skylights absolutely kathleen wants to know if um she has put a plant in a larger pot and it hasn't grown in a couple of years and she's curious hmm, interesting hasn't grown and it's in a larger pot do we know what kind of plant it is Kathleen, can you share what plant you have? You put it in the chat or in the question. A rippled leaf? Oof. Uh, it says N-I, but a rippled leaf. And I maybe leaf. she's not sure. Peperomia, maybe? Ripple leaf could be peperomia. Um, some plants are slower growers than others. Um, I would suggest fertilizing it. Um, if, did it need to go into a larger pot? Was it necessary? Did you put it in a larger pot because it wasn't growing? Depending on what type of plant it is, is it getting adequate light? So there's a few different factors I would I would check there. Um, a fertilizing light requirement. Um, I don't know what type of plant. When you say ripple, it's, uh, it, it makes me think of peperomia plant, but it could be. She said she put it in a larger pot because it wasn't growing. Oh, uh, interesting. Really so just because it wasn't growing doesn't necessarily mean it needed a larger pot. Um, if you pulled it out and there was a lot of roots around the bottom, then yes, it should have gone. But if it wasn't ready to go into a larger pot, what happens is uh, now you have a lot of soil density and not a lot of root structure. 
So it's very possible that it could be being overwatered. All that soil density holds all that moisture. And even if it's dry on the top and you think it needs water because there's excess soil, it's possible that it's still moist down there and you don't need to water it. I have to see it. Um, but I would go, I would try a fertilizer. I would go straight for a fertilizer first. Um, I don't know if she's ever fertilized it, but that would be my suggestion, fertilizer and watch your watering. Maybe a different light situation, depending on what kind of plant it is. Now that brings up another question. What are the signs when you should repot a plant? Cause so, I'm always okay. apprehensive. Up potting, the plant will usually let you know when it needs to be up potted. You'll see roots growing out of the drainage holes, or if the plant's gotten too heavy for the pot it's in now and it's tipping over. Um, if your pot starts to bulge, like you start off with a round pot and now your pot is oval, when your pot starts to bulge. Uh, bulge. Um, if you see no new growth, that's sometimes a sign that it needs to be up potted, but we just had that situation where it's not growing, but it went into a larger pot. So again, that makes me think that it's not the problem of a lot of being up potted, but it needed fertilizer in a different lighting situation. Um, also, you should usually up pot your plants anywhere between 12 to 24 months. That is usually the best. Some people can get away with five years or so, but eventually they all need to get into a larger pot because they're growing and they're growing and they're growing. But yeah, the top signs would be roots growing, at, coming out of the drainage holes. The pot is bulging. The plant is tipping over because it's now too heavy for the pot that it's in. And when it is time to up pot, always try and go no larger than two to four inches than the pot it's originally in. So say you're in a four inch pot, you wanna to go to a six inch pot. If you're in a six inch pot, you wanna to go to an eight inch pot. Eight inch to 10 inch, then when you get to 10 inch, you can go 12 to 14. We suggest that because of the soil density problem like I just mentioned. If you take a little six inch pot and you plant it into a big 10 inch pot, now you have all this soil density and its root system is literally only maybe this big and you have all this soil around it. You're just asking for overwatering and root rot. Because you're thinking that it's all dry, you know, you look at the top, oh, the top is dry, but all down here, it's still all wet. So you water and water and all that excess soil holds on to that moisture and you're, it's a root rot just waiting to happen. So never go really two to four inches larger than the pot that it's in. And we also suggest here to make it easier on yourself. These black nursery pots that the plants come in, maybe not the prettiest things you see, but easier to up pot when it's time. So you take this black nursery pot and you plop it into a decorative pot that is a bit larger. So this way, when it's time to up pot, you can up pot into another nursery pot instead of trying to dig it out of that, that you know, decorative container, put it into the larger size nursery pot and plunk it right back into the decorative pot. It also makes it easier for you to solve any problems. If, if the plant's having issues, instead of trying to dig it out of a, a decorative pot that it's planted in to see what's going on with the roots, you leave them in their nursery pots, you can manage your problems easier. Thank you. 
and I'm going to mess up this plant name. Cyclamen? Cyclamen? Oh, yeah, cyclamen, yeah. Um, should it be an indirect light or, or direct light? Cyclamen can handle some nice, bright, direct light, especially at this time of year because the sun is not so strong. And this is their time of year when they like to be out in the cooler temperatures. Once the summertime comes along, you do want to pull it out of that bright sun, though, because believe it or not, the cyclamen actually love to be cool and not hot. They're one of those... Yes, plants who prefer to be cooler temperatures rather than hot temperatures. But they do like the bright light in order to get them to flower. And then someone wanted to know, um, when is the proper time to up-pot a Christmas cactus in its growth cycle? The Christmas cactus will tell you. It's, it's, there's no given time when, you have, when it's up-potting. Um, I would say don't let it go any further than two years than the pot that it's in right now i do some people do have them in their same original pots for five six seven eight nine ten years um the cactus doesn't mind so much to be a little bit pot bound but i wouldn't go any longer than two years on a clip and then back to cycling <laughs> and cycling um. Cyclamen was water from the bottom. Okay. Water is cyclamen from the bottom. Let them sit in a little tray of water, maybe about an inch to two inches of water. Let them drink what they want, and then off they go back to where you put them. And how will they fare um, in the shade on a patio? Cyclamen? <laughs> mm, probably not too happy because, again, they don't really like the hot temperatures. Okay. So I would probably keep the cyclamen inside for the summer. However, the Christmas cactus, whoever that person was, if you want to put your Christmas cactus outside in the summer in the shade, it'll love it. It's good to know. Yeah, cyclamen, they don't like it hot. No, they prefer the cooler temperatures. That's why you only see them out. If anybody's noticed, you can only find cyclamen for sale right around this time of year like november december january february once you get past february they're really not available anymore because they don't like it hot that's like me i don't like it hot either <laughs> <laughs> and then one more question about the christmas cactus what kind of soil would you recommend definitely a cactus or succulent mix for this christmas cactus a very a well draining soil so any any kind of succulent or cactus mix that would be great for the Christmas cactus. Now, I am still getting my green thumb and becoming, uh, you know, I'm new at my plant mom role. Do you have any recommendations for plants that are really just will survive anything? <laughs> yes. So plants that will survive anything would be a Xamifolia ZZ plant. Snake plants, cast iron plants. Yes, they're called cast of death. <laughs> the cast iron plant was actually the first foliage plant to be used as an indoor decorative plant. Cast iron. Aspidistrus cast iron. Those are the top three. Stick them in the corner, forget about them. Don't have to water them for two months. And they love it. Prefer it that way. Um, any of your pothos or philodendron are fairly easy. Uh, more of the traditional philodendron. Now we have all these new ones, these newfangled ones coming out now. These cross-pollinated birkins and brandies and pink, pink princesses, they're a little more finicky. You can, spider plants are great, super easy to take care of. Um, your peace lilies are easy to take care of as long as you keep up with your watering. Who else is easy? Um, Dracaenas are really easy. Pretty much any Dracaena. They're not so dramatic when it comes to water and they can actually live in some more moderate to low light areas. Uh, Aglaonemas or Chinese evergreens, also super easy. Um, 
So there's quite a few out there that are that are pretty easy. Peperomias are, are fairly easy. These are all more drought tolerant. So you're not having to constantly water, water, water all the time. Um, they actually prefer to be, you know, ignored and like to be on the drought side. So yeah, you have quite a handful of plants that are fairly easy for beginners. Um, more so than, you know, any other time. If I were going to start, like if anyone was gonna start an herb garden, what time of the year would be the best, like an indoor one? Indoor one, herb garden, that would be more of a Sean area. Okay, got it. To speak to. I'm more indoor foliage, tropical foliage, herbs, not my thing. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. That's everybody. okay, that's okay. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about, we were talking about brown tips or dry and crunchy leaves, especially at this time of year. Like I said, they're really missing that humidity that they had during the summer where, you know, it's super humid out and we're all dying and they're like, yes, yes, I love it. Uh, misting, a good weekly misting would be greatly appreciated, um, especially for your palm plants or your fern plants. Um, anything that has a thin, you know, a very thin palm-like leaf. Um, Calatheas love humidity. These, if they're little enough, take them in the bathroom with you when you take a shower and just let them hang out in there while you're showering. They'll love it. That, you know, that misty, warm humidity. Tap water, like I said, can cause brown tips just because some of our tap water is high in chlorine or uh, fluoride. So either let sit overnight or use filtered water if you could. And when I say filtered water, yeah, you can use your Brita, turn on your little Brita and that counts as filtered water. Yep, you can fill your watering can with your Brita, just as long as it's not cold water. Always lukewarm, because again, it's like getting in a cold shower. Uh, feed it, fertilize with plants. Some of them require only a fertilizing maybe in the spring and in the, in the fall. So spring, March, April, right before they start their new growth cycle. And fall would be September, October, before they start going into their dormant winter phase. Oh, I see a question, fig tree. Somebody just popped up with a fig tree question. Sorry, I'm a little slow here. <laughs> My fig my fig tree has brown edges on the older leaves on the lower part of the plant. Should I leave them or cut off the leaf? There's a lot of new growth up on the top half, so that part looks okay. Perfect. Cut off the whole leaf. They might be old leaves, and this does happen. Sometimes the, the leaves on a plant get to a point where they're just ready to expire, and they're older leaves is you're pushing out new growth and the older, some of the older leaves are passing away. Just cut the leaves right off. I would just be mindful of your watering if you are getting brown edges on your fiddle fig. They like to go dry in between waterings, but they can't go dry for a long period of time. So they can let them go dry, give them a thorough watering, it can't go dry for a long period of time, like, you know, for, for months. So just, I would just be a little mindful of how you're watering her, but cut those leaves right off. And if you're getting new growth, then she's fairly happy. And yeah, keep that in mind. Some of these leaves that are turning yellow and brown, if they're down on the bottom of the plant, some of them are old leaves that are just expiring and that just happens. If it's multiple leaves, more than five or six that are yellowing or turning brown, then you have a problem. And you'd have to just decipher each step and figure out what's going on. Is that the best indicator of something going, I mean, when you have like a blight or a, before you can see that the leaves have discolored? When you have 
when you have multiple, when there are multiple, I'd say maybe four, five, six leaves, seven, and this is all happening to all these leaves at different parts of the plant, top, over here, underneath, then you want to investigate what's going on. It, and it's funny because plants act the same way sometimes when they don't get enough water or when they have too much water. So it's kind of a tricky thing to try and figure out what's going on. Because some plants get yellow leaves when they have too much water or not enough water. Uh, Dracaenas are famous for burnt tips. Dracaenas and palms are famous for your, your little brown tips. This could be inconsistent watering. This could be too much light. This could be using tap water instead of filtered water. Um, some of them get a little finicky. So be mindful just if you see brown tips on your dracaena, it's not necessarily something that's terribly wrong. It's just could be a little simple fix. We just gotta figure out which one it is. Uh, feeding, again, I was saying once in the spring before they start their growth cycle and once in the fall before they go dormant, there are some varieties of plants that would prefer to be fed more often, more once every three months rather than only twice a year. These are more your fast growing plants like pothos or spider um, or philodendron any uh, spathophyllums, believe it or not, any of your faster growing plants, because their roots grow quick, quick, quick. So they're taking up all that nutrition from the soil. So they'll require a bit more fertilizing throughout the year. And a water-soluble fertilizer is fine. I use the water-soluble fertilizer here. You know, a little blue powder. I find it easier to measure, easier to control. Um, I like the water-soluble fertilizers, like the Jack's Classic. Um, there was actually something written in, let me remember, there was an article in New York Magazine in 2019 uh, naming the top 10 fertilizers, and Jack's Class Classic was actually on that list as top 10 houseplant fertilizers. Yep, little blue, the little blue powder stuff that you mix with the water, it's great. It's, you know, it's fantastic. It doesn't have to be, you can use organic if you like to. Organic will work. A little smell to it, but it dissipates quick. But a good old Jack's is great. Um, and when you fertilize, you're fertilizing, you know, it's an up, down, all around situation. You're fertilizing, nitrogen is for your foliage, phosphorus is for your roots, potassium is for your blooms. So, you know, that's what your numbers are telling you when you see 10, 10, 10, it's an equal portion. 10 for the foliage, 10 for the roots, 10 for the blooms. If you have a plant that's blooming, you want to have a higher potassium level. So you maybe want a 10, 10, 20 or something like that. But yep, super, yep, water soluble blue stuff, fantastic. Thank you, I was oblivious to that. <laughs> Oh, also brown tips. Keep in mind this time of year in the winter time around your heating vents. If you have heating vents that are around, you know, your palms or your dracaenas or your ferns, maybe think about moving those plants at this time of year so the heat's not coming down on them or coming up on them because uh, not going to like that. The, no, the dry heat, they won't appreciate that. Um, brown tips, see, tricky, tricky. Fertilizer burn could also cause lots of browning or black tips if you're over fertilizing or 
if you've done a heavy fertilizing and then your soil goes bone dry in between waterings and then you water, that fertilizer becomes about 10 times more potent. So that can cause burning to the leaves, blackening or, or, or brownness or so. Be mindful of that also when you're fertilizing. Make sure your plant is moist or damp before you fertilize it and try to keep at least a consistent moisture level throughout however the plant likes it. Now someone wanted to know back to your um, your vent comment. Now, would you suggest moving all the plants from the vent area or just certain ones depending on how they're looking? Just certain ones. You don't have to move everybody from the vent. Only certain ones that'll be temperamental and dramatic about the heat coming from the vent. Um, I would definitely palm plants, uh, calatheas, ferns, and anything else that has a really thin, you know, that very thin palm-like leaf, those would be your top ones that aren't going to like it in the heat, near the heating vent. Um, and misting, again, some of these palm plants, I would definitely weekly mist them. This time of year, they're super prone to spider mites because spider mites like it at this time of year when it's hot and it's dry. So um, definitely your palm plants and your thin leaf dracaenas, give them a good weekly misting. Spider mites can't build their, net, their webs in moisture. So the more moisture you put on the plant, the less they're gonna wanna hang out there. <clears throat> Anybody have any questions about bugs? No, but tell us about bugs. <laughs> tell about bugs. There's a lot of different kinds. They're environmental. They just come, unfortunately. They're just, nobody, you're not doing anything wrong to cause the bug, it just happens. Uh, there's many different kinds. We just said spider mites. Spider mites, mealybugs, aphids, and are your really top four that are house plant bugs. Um, mealy bugs look like little pieces of cotton, little tiny pieces of white cotton. Aphids come in a few different colors. Uh, usually your indoor ones would be black or green. And scale looks like a little barnacle attached either to the underleaf or the stem. It looks like a little tiny, almost like a little barnacle. Uh, what they do is the bug attaches itself to the plant and then it performs it, it uh, forms a protective coat around it like an armor which is why they call it scale it looks like a little barnacle super easy to remedy as long as you catch it you know before even if it if it is a bad infestation you can with work and time get it under control uh, mealy bugs are my least favorite can't stand them. They drive me nuts. <laughs> oh, and fungus gnats. Fungus gnats is another one. Fungus gnats are a soil insect, not a foliage insect. Um, fungus gnats will come from the soil. They'll come from overly damp or wet soil, and they're easy to get rid of too. It's just each one has a different way a treatment um fungus gnats i don't gonna freak everybody out when i say this fungus gnats lay their eggs in the first top two to three inches of the soil so to get rid of them a little mosquito bits on the top of the soil scratch it in a little bit that'll take care of the kids and little sticky traps will take care of the little flies and they look like little fruit flies um and they thrive in moist or wet soil. Again, mealybugs, environmental, aphids, environmental. If you have your plants outside during the summer and you're going to bring them in for the winter, I suggest you hose them off 
Oh. This will get rid of any debris or any little insect that's, you know, hanging out on there that wants to come in the house and say, oh, yeah, I'm going to live in the house during the winter, and then, yeah, we'll be all right. Hose them off, check the soil, get rid of any debris that's in the soil. If your soil looks a little meh, not so much, change out your soil and give it a good fertilizing, and then it's ready to come in for the winter. Does anybody have any bug questions? Um, Ellie's asking the little gnats that seem to come with the amaryllis bulb, where did they oh, come from and then where did they go around the house? Interesting. I don't know if I've ever experienced them with an amaryllis bulb, but that would be a fungus gnat. Um, and they come around now, I know they get all up in your face. They like it all around here and they look like little fruit flies. Is is her bulb planted in water or soil? Uh, soil. So I would ease back on your watering. Um, I would I would water less to keep them, you know, at bay. It's it's possible it was one or two gnats that were either in the soil or on the bulb when, when it came, but I would I would let the soil go a bit dry in between waterings for the amaryllis. And if you do that, your amaryllis will actually last a little longer because if you keep them consistently moist, they bloom faster. If you let them go a little bit on the drier side in between, then they'll last longer in bloom. Okay. Um, and someone's asking, uh, they use sticky traps to capture the yep. bugs. Is you there a better way? Sticky traps to always, sticky traps to catch the adults, but you have to get in that soil and get rid of the larva or the babies because they're just going to turn into more adults. Oh, okay. So sticky traps for the adults, and we suggest using mosquito bits to sprinkle and scratch into the soil, which will get rid of the larva. So kill two birds with one stone. Okay. Um, yeah, the, uh, the, the spider mites like it at this time of year. This is the time of year for spider mites. They like it dry and hot. They build their webs in between the leaves of the palm plants or right at the base of the frond you'll see little tiny webs in there so misting like i said misting will definitely help keep them at bay during the winter i know we could go on for like two hours with this zoom thing <laughs> <laughs> and let's see wait um what would be your pick for a large showy plant for a sunroom Ooh. Oh, for a sunroom. Is it a heated sunroom? I'm I'm betting it is. Okay. A large showy plant for a heated sunroom. The first thing that popped into my mind was a bird of paradise. Ooh, pretty dramatic. Yes. There, oh yeah, lots of, I wish I could take you with me out into the floor right now so I could show everybody a bird of paradise. <laughs> uh, yeah, large, the first one that popped in my mind would be definitely a bird of paradise for a large showy plant for a sunroom. And yes, it is heated, so that was... Okay, good. Yes, we sell mosquito bits. I see a little question that says mosquito bits. Uh, it's a little granular. Uh, they're almost like a light brown, little chunks, little bits. They're called mosquito bits. Oh, okay. Yep. And we sell them if you need them. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's bird of paradise for the sunroom for sure. I have two really large ones right now if anybody's interested. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I think that's all our questions for right oh, now. Okay. So now I'm trying to think if there's anything we didn't cover. We talked about fertilizing, uh, talked about up potting talked about brown tips again lukewarm water try and use lukewarm or filtered um, let your tap water sit out overnight 
water soluble fertilizer is fine. Um, insects, again, it depends upon who they are, what they are, what product you need to use them. Sometimes even just a thorough weekly washing of the plant. Like when I say washing, I mean just rinsing, not soap and water washing. Um, don't let your plants sit in water. We were talking about how we do take the nursery pot and plop it into the decorative pot. If you go flush to the bottom of the decorative pot, and you're watering, watering, watering. Be mindful if there's watering collecting at the bottom of the pot. This will cause wet feet for the plant, which will then cause root rot. Um, easy way to fix that is you get a little maybe two inch piece of styrofoam to put in, on, in the bottom of the pot so you create at least a little reservoir for excess water to go. Um, I will say that overwatering is the most common killing of plants. It, it's always easier to fix underwatering than it is to fix overwatering. So keep that in mind. Uh, let's talk a little bit about succulents and watering succulents. Succulents will actually tell you when they've been overwatered or they need water. They, they're like camels, so they store water in their leaves. And if you're overwatering or you're you know, too heavy handed on the watering with your succulents, the leaves will become super, super plump and fat and start to get a yellowing to them. And they're really firm, and and you you know you squeeze them, so they're just fat and firm, and starting to yellow. Total sign of too much water. When they need water, what they start to do is they start to take water from their own leaves. So the leaves will start to get a little limp, a little weak, and even start to wrinkle a little bit. So now they're telling you, okay, let's water a little more. So they're, they're actually kind of good at telling you, hey, listen, this is too much and this is too little. So those are little signs you can look for with the succulents on, on watering wise. And then you have cactus, which you can go a month without watering the cactus because they store their own water. And Joy, someone's asking, you had mentioned wiping off the leaves earlier. What you do you wipe, wipe, wipe do you wipe them with? So just a damp if you're if you're dusty or if you're, you know, if, if, if lots of dust in the house or especially during the winter time, just a damp paper towel. That's it. Damp paper towel would be fine. Yep. Great. Good. And let's see, is there anything else I can pick up? Um, some drama queens when it comes to watering, certain plants that like humidity. Again, anybody who likes humidity, if you don't have a humidifier or if you don't want to mist weekly, I'm telling you, if it's small enough, take it in the bathroom with you when you're in the shower and it'd be great. It'll love it. And then you just you know, put it back where it went after you get out of the shower, you just dressed and put it back where it belongs. Yep. You think you remember to do that? <laughs> Joy, I have a question for you. Um, I've seen a lot of people just in this past year do a lot of propagating, and that's very new to me. Can you give kind of like a quick tutorial or guidance? So some plants are much easier to propagate than others. Um, some plants require air layering, which is a whole nother conversation in itself. Um, usually just a quick, straightforward propagation is you take a cutting from your plants. You either go into water or root tone, powdered root, root hormone, and then into soil. Um, it depends upon what it is. Maybe we should do a zoom on propagating because that's a whole that's a whole situation in itself. Um, super easy propagating plants though are philodendrons, pothos, any of the Tradescantia. 
um, which people will recognize if I say its common name is Wandering Jew. Super easy to propagate. Most of your succulents are super easy to propagate. Um, snake plants can be easy to propagate. Some re spathoth uh, I'm sorry, not spathodons. Philodendrons and pothos are an easy water propagate. You take your cutting, you can already see some of the stem has roots on it. You drop it into your water. Make sure you change your water daily or every other day just to keep that fresh water in there. You're going to sprout roots. It'll usually take two weeks to a month for roots enough to plant into soil. Um, the Tritoscanti or the Wandering Jews, super easy cut, a little bit of dip in a rooting hormone powder, and just straight into soil like that. It's crazy. They they're just propagate like crazy. Uh, Dracaenas are easy to propagate too. Uh, Dracaenas, if you chop a, their head off and a little rooting hormone powder straight into soil, it'll take them about a month and super easy to propagate. But getting into the whole propagation, it, it, again, would be a whole nother Zoom conversation. Okay. We have a few more questions. Um, someone's asking, what do you feed cyclamen? So cyclamen would be a blossom booster. And cyclamen would be, I would do the cyclamen probably once every three to four months to keep those blooms going. Uh, any kind of blossom booster. Okay. And again, water cyclamen from the bottom, everybody. From the bottom. And um, overwintering begonias, do you cut them back? It depends on what kind of begonia it is. If it's an outdoor begonia that you're bringing inside, that would be more of a Sean question. Okay. Most of your indoor begonias, like your maculatas or your rex begonias, um, your reger begonias, nope, they just live in the house all year long. There's nothing, you know, don't cut them, you're not cutting them back or anything. Nope. Um. Okay. Um, someone, the, back to the cyclamen, um, this person's asking uh, uh, miracle Grow. You can use miracle Grow. Okay. You, can, you can use miracle Grow. Um, again, try and get something that says bloom booster or blossom booster for the flowers to get those flowers going. And I oh. would again do that probably, I would feed it once every three to four months. Okay. And Elizabeth's asking, are air plants succulents? Air plants are technically in the succulent family because they don't require watering or, or, or soil. You do, though, with your air plants, the best way to, to treat them is give them a weekly soaking take the air plant off of its display and soak it for about an hour to an hour and a half in water. Monthly, I would add some succulent or cactus fertilizer to that water. You can also mist, but you have to be careful with how you mist your air plants. If you're misting, 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 and you're getting water into like the cup of the air plant, it's very possible you can rot them. So the weekly soaking is always best, the best way to do, to take care of the air plants. Okay. And how do you get amaryllis to bloom again after they kind of petered so, out? Another Sean question, amaryllis would be a bulb, that would be either a Tracy or a Sean question. Okay. Not a problem. And I think that's the end of the question, so. All right, and we killed it just right by, with four minutes to spare. <laughs> Perfect timing, Joy.
Thank you so much for I joining hope us. This everybody week. had a good time. And and I hope I was informative. And, and again, if you need any questions, you can always, you know, we know where to find you. We know where to find me. <laughs> five days a week, nine to five. <laughs> Thank you again. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Pat. just scoot right into a PowerPoint presentation in a moment, but I wanted to mention um, questions. So as we're going, if questions pop up, uh, just go ahead and write it in the chat box and that way you won't forget. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll take hopefully like 10 to 15 minutes and just answer as many as we can and that might be a good time too. You could even just take, you know, the, um, uh, put your mic on. And if you wanna just go ahead and verbally ask a question, that, that would work great too. So that's what we'll do for questions. And I'll also mention that there's a lot of information um, on all these slides. So I don't want anyone to get overwhelmed. Um, after the presentation, everyone's gonna be getting a copy of the PowerPoint. So you can just tune back in at your own time. There's a lot of recipes and um, just a lot of information. So don't get overwhelmed. It's It will be here for you later uh, to check out. And for now, you can just sit back and just absorb as much as you can. Okay, so let's get into it. All right, so here we are, nourishing the nervous system, herbs for stress and anxiety. And to begin, I just wanna kind of ground everyone together and just do a few deep breaths together for a moment, just to all arrive um, and just set the tone for the next hour. So if it's feeling comfortable for you, I'd love it if you just close your eyes, feel your feet on the floor, and maybe put your hand over your heart. And let's go ahead and just take three really deep breaths together, in through our noses and out through our mouths. Okay. Okay, beautiful. So let's get going. Um, okay, so before we talk about any plants, it's important to really zoom out and really think about lifestyle. So these are all the pieces that we really want to have in place in order for our nervous systems to really work optimally. So I'm just gonna briefly go through each one. So the first piece here is going to be sleep. So when we're sleeping, we're in something called the parasympathetic state. And this is when our nervous systems tell us that we're safe, we can rest and digest, uh, we can repair our cells. It's just a, a very nourishing, restful time for the nervous system. But when we're not getting quality sleep, virtually every system in our body begins to have challenges. So there's a lot of plants that we're gonna talk about today that actually support sleep. Um, but honestly, the best thing that you can do is just work on each of these other pillars here. And all of these things in 
you know, working together are really going to be the best thing to support this sleep piece. Okay, and the next piece, of course, is going to be stress management. So our bodies are designed to handle short-term stressful situations. So our nervous system is basically the sensory machine. We're just walking around gathering information through our receptors, sensory receptors, and then deciding if it's time to slip into our sympathetic, which is our fight or flight response, or if it's safe to kind of relax and go into our rest and digest or parasympathetic response which is this response we just talked about that happens when we're sleeping. So the classic example of kind of when these stress responses get triggered um, is an example that uh, someone came up with. So you can picture maybe being like one of the first humans um, on the planet and you're out uh, maybe gathering food, um, gathering berries, something like that and you perceive that there's a tiger close by. So basically what happens is your immune system shuts down, your digestive system shuts down, your reproductive system shuts down, and your cardiovascular system really lights up and it pulls blood away from those non-essential organs and it rushes them out to the extremities so you can have energy to either run or fight. So this is obviously super helpful if you're actually fighting a tiger, but the problem is our nervous systems have not really adapted to the modern world. So the amount of tigers that are coming at us, you know, may have declined, but the amount of everyday constant stress that we're experiencing has infinitely multiplied. And the trouble is, our body can't really tell the difference between you know, one of these everyday stresses and the massive stress of an actual tiger. So every plant that we talk about today is going to be useful in getting us out of that fight or flight state and back into that parasympathetic response. Um, and I really hope this list doesn't stress you out further um, but I mostly just want, I wanted to create like some sort of compassion for our sweet little nervous systems and um, just remind you that, you know, there's a lot coming at us every day. And, you know, there's, you know, we're, you're going to learn about so many plants today that can support your stress response, but there's also a lot of other stress reducing techniques um, like meditation or you know going for a walk um, singing in the car maybe deep breathing like we just did um, all of those things are really helpful so yeah it's just something to think about and one thing on this list I just want to um, mention is alarm clocks so if you are someone who's starting out your day with a super loud, um, really intense alarm, you're instantly gonna get yourself into the sympathetic response, into that fight or flight state. So if you can, that's one really small thing that you can do to support your nervous system. Just, I mean, if you can get away with no alarm clock, that's great. Um, if you need one, maybe reaching for like softer sounds um, just to kind of ease you out of sleep would be really supportive. Okay, and the next piece I want to go over is um, sunlight. So yeah, getting outside for some natural sunlight or supplementing with vitamin D is going to be really wonderful support for the nervous system. And I know it's winter and it's, you know, the sun is less and less, but um, if you can get outside even for those five minutes, you know, like at the height of the sun, that little sun that's peeking out, if you can just get out there and get as much as you can every day, that would be so helpful. If not um, supplementing, I would highly recommend. And then there's also a lot of um, sun bearing plants. So a couple to think about are St. John's wort or chamomile. 
And these are plants that really bring in the warming light of the sun into your body. So that's another way you can energetically receive the medicine of the sun. But again, that's not going to get you that vitamin D per se. So making sure to supplement or actually getting outside would be my recommendation there. Okay, the next piece we want to think about is hydration. So ideally, everyone should be drinking half of their body weight in ounces every day. I'll say that one more time. So every day, it's important that we drink half of whatever we weigh in ounces of water. And virtually every human is going to be chronically dehydrated. So just fixing this one piece is going to help with fatigue levels, um, inflammation, depression, anxiety, insomnia, and so many more pieces. So that's a, a really easy, really important one. And then moving the body. And this doesn't have to be crazy. Um, you know, you don't have to become a marathon runner or something like that. But just, you know, every day, maybe a little light stretching or some yoga, um, some cardio if that was feeling good. Um, even just walking uh, around the house if it's too cold, um, up and down the stairs a few times. Um, if you can get outside, you know, 10 minutes, just walking 10 minutes a day is really, really supportive just to get the blood moving and um, supporting the nervous system in that way. Okay, and then this last piece here is so critical, and I know I'm not going to be making any friends with <laughs> telling you about this one, um, but it's so very important. Um, most of us are experiencing levels of systemic inflammation because of our diet. And this just means that our diet is so acidic that it's causing inflammation in the body. And our diet is acidic when we're eating excess sugar, processed foods, too much caffeine, etc. And this is really important to think about because when our bodies are inflamed, we get stuck in this cycle of producing too much cortisol and other stress hormones. And this really messes up our nutrient absorption, our GI function, our sleep, and our ability to clear out toxins in the body and a lot more. But then all of these things, they loop back and then increase inflammation in the body. So we're kind of locked into this forever loop of really not feeling our best. So when we think about nourishing the nervous system, uh, we really want to think about decreasing inflammation in the body. And one way we do this is changing our diet um, to an anti-inflammatory diet. And a, a really good model to reach for is um, the Whole30 diet. It's a pretty popular diet. Um, there's a lot of recipes online, a lot of resources for that. And that's just going to have you reaching for, um, you know, food as close to their their whole original source as they can be. So just nothing processed, um, you know, beautiful vegetables, every color of the rainbow, healthy grains, really good sourced um, meat if you're a meat eater. Yeah, so these are um, the foundations. And let's get into the plants. So, yeah, as you're, you know, continuing to learn about the plants, uh, you'll find that whatever plant you're researching is going to have a list of plant actions next to it. And these are really important to get to know because at a glance, you'll be able to quickly discover, is this going to be a plant for me or for the person who I'm wanting to help? Um, or not. And all of these plant actions that we'll talk about here are all going to be indicated for the nervous system specifically. So the umbrella category um, that all of these plants fall under are going to be called nervines or nervines. And this is a general category of plants that include any plant that's going to support the nervous system. 
And then we have uh, nerving stimulants. So these are going to be plants that are indicated more for um, depression. So if you are someone that needs just a little stimulation, a little support, um, getting out of bed in the morning, um, a little support maybe with your memory, your cognition, um, maybe when you get stressed out, you kind of get a little foggy or start to forget things. Um, a nervine stimulant is going to be the plant you want to reach for. And then we have nervine relaxants or sedatives. So these are going to be plants that directly calm and relax the nervous system. And these are going to be plants you want to reach for if you're leaning more towards anxiety. If you are using words like, you know, gosh, I feel so fried or so frazzled, um, things like that, then a nerving relaxant or a sedative are going to be plants that you're going to want to reach for. And then nerving tonics or trophil restoratives. So these are plants um, that actually feed and generally tonify the nervous system. These are going to be long-term plants. So stimulants and relaxants might be plants you reach for. You could be using them consistently, you know, long-term if you were working with chronic depression or chronic anxiety. Um, but more so than not, they're kind of you use them on the days that you really need them. And the difference with nerving tonics is these are plants that you're really gonna wanna use every day because they slowly build up in the body and slowly restore um, the nervous system. And they're great for that deep burnout, um, chronic stress, depletion after chronic uh, drug and alcohol use. Okay, and then hypnotic nervines. So these are gonna be the herbs that um, support the body through sleep. And then adaptogens. These are a really beautiful class of herbs to call on. Um, they basically just support the body, deal with any kind of stress. So whether it be emotional stress, um, environmental stress you know maybe you are experiencing like there's a toxic toxicity in your work environment something like that you're working around chemicals um or maybe you're experiencing a environmental stress of a physical stress from um like the food that you're eating maybe you're eating a bit more processed food than you'd like to something like that um, adaptogens just really come in and help bring the body back to its homeostasis. So whatever's going on, um, adaptogens are just very supportive for just bringing, bringing you back to kind of your square one. And then antispasmodics, um, these are going to be great for someone who, when they get stressed out, they, they tense up, their muscles tensing up and maybe they, um, yeah, are always like rubbing their neck or kind of rolling their shoulders when they get stressed out. Um, these are plants that come in and just help relieve those cramps, help relax everything. Um, they're really great for migraines. If you're someone, when you get stressed, um, a migraine is not too far away then antispasmodics are going to be really supportive for you. Antidepressants, of course, are going to be herbs that just support the body, move through depression. And then analgesics are going to be herbs that support the body um, through pain. Okay, and as we get to know the plants, I just wanted to share this model. Um, this is something I like to call plant of the week, but you could also stretch it out to plant of the month model. And yeah, it's basically just a really wonderful way to slow down and connect with one plant at a time. So after our presentation today, you know, you're going to have a list of, oh my goodness, I think there's 
gosh, maybe 20 or 30 <laughs> plants in here. There's a lot. Um, so you can, you know, just pick through them, see which one is resonating with you, and then take your time and, and really get to know it. Um, one of my favorite sayings in plant medicine is plants are people too. And I love thinking about that. It, it resonates with me so, so deeply. Um, these plants totally have their own personalities and their own way of meeting you wherever you're at. Um, you know, and that can change daily. That can, it's not gonna be the same every time for many of these plants. That can change with the, the preparation that you're taking, you know, whether you're enjoying a cup of tea or a tincture or um, another preparation. And that can also change with the amount of medicine that you're taking. So you can experiment with, you know, different amounts. Maybe one day you'll have an entire pot or an entire cup of tea. And maybe the next day you'll just have a few sips and just feel more of like the spirit medicine of the plant. So yeah, these are just some suggestions and the sky's the limit with this. So if there's other ways you can think of um, to interact with the plant, I would I would recommend you just trust your intuition and yeah, just take your time getting to know, getting to know these sweet plant spirits. Okay, so I thought it would be fun to talk about some of the plants that are in your tea blend. And if anyone has not picked up their blend yet, or you know, maybe you weren't able you signed up after they were all gone. Um, I, I tried to pick plants that were very accessible. So these are all plants for the most part. You could probably get, yeah, I'd say most of these um, with the exclusion of maybe Hawthorne. Um, but you could get most of these at your local grocery store, um, you know, just in tea bag form, and then you could kind of blend them together. I basically did equal parts um, for everything with a, a maybe two parts of oat straw and two parts of Tulsi, but everything else was equal. And yeah, I just, I wanted to go over um, in depth uh, the first three. So we'll do that in a moment. But I also just wanted to mention um, these last four um, as well, just because they're wonderful plants to get to know. Um, there's going to be whole slides on um, Hawthorne, or actually, no, excuse me. There's uh, going to be a slide on cinnamon later in the presentation, but these other ones, I don't think there is one. So just briefly, um, Hawthorne is so supportive to the nervous system. It's wonderful um, for the heart. So if you are someone, when you get stressed out, if, um, you know, maybe your heart starts to race or you just kind of feel that tension in your heart space, maybe there's some heartbreak there or some grief um, or some trauma that you're working through. Um, Hawthorne is a really lovely, uh, it's a nerving, but many herbalists think it has adaptogenic properties. So it's something that, you know, you could take every day just, just to kind of support stress in general, but it does have that affinity for the heart space. It also has um, these really big thorns and, you know, rose, of course, is really similar. Um, and I, I like using plants that have thorns in them when I'm thinking about supporting the nervous system because energetically I feel like it kind of creates a little bit of a boundary you know these are both of these hawthorn and rose both of these these plants are relaxing to the nervous system they're heart opening they're supportive to the heart and the cardiovascular system on both the physical and energetic level but then they also have that thorniness about them and I just I feel like it helps us stay open and um, move through whatever, you know, grief or wounding we need to move through, but keeps a little boundary around us as well. So, yeah, and then dandelion root, um, I'll br briefly mention when you're thinking about supporting the nervous system, 
Uh, reaching for roots is another wonderful thing you can do. Um, yeah, any root, but dandelion root I like specifically because it's very supportive to the liver. Um, so it, so the root medicine kind of grounds you back into your body. And then it's a alternative um, and supportive to the liver. So it's really going to help expel any of those excess stress hormones. So any of that extra cortisol that's hanging around or um, even just kind of heavier emotions like fear or anger, um, grief, things like that it just supports the liver kind of kick that out of the body when it, when it's time to let that go and then yeah i also just want to mention i don't think i wrote this on your tea bags but i would recommend a cup of this tea three times a day if you were really really wanting to medicinally work with this tea for your nervous system um, otherwise, you know, just a cup here and there when you're wanting to, you know, have a quiet moment with yourself is going to be very supportive. Um, but if you were wanting to kind of come in with with a little more um, medicinal intention, um, I would recommend three cups a day. Okay, so let's get into the first plant in your tea blend, which is Tulsi. And I'll just share um, all of the slides that we go through today are going to be set up in this exact same way. So I just want to let you know what you're looking at. Um, so Tulsi, this is going to be the common name. And then underneath here, Oximum Sanctum, this is going to be the Latin name. And of course, this will change for every slide. Um, but I just wanted to differentiate these and um, call your attention to them. Um, the Latin is kind of set up as a last name, first name situation, last name, first name. Um, and this is important to think about because when you're sourcing these plants on your own, um, if you're just going by the common name, this this could get a little messy um, because there's actually many different um, species. This is going to be the genus and this is going to be the species. Um, so in many um, plant families, there's many different species. And it's really important to get um, the specific one that you want um, for the specific uh, medicinal and energetic medicine that you're looking for. Um, so just pay attention to that as you're sourcing your herbs. For Tulsi, there's actually um, a handful, I think three, different medicinal varieties. Um, so it's not just the sanctum that you can reach for, um, but for other plants, it's going to be the exact um, Latin name that we have on the slides that you're gonna wanna find. Okay, and this next piece um, is gonna describe the energetics of the plant. And this just describes um, how it behaves on the tissue states in your body. So you'll see here in actually many of the plants that we talk about today are going to be cooling post-digestion and warming pre-digestion. And this is just an example of truly how uh, magnificent and uh, insightful and curious these plants are. Um, they're coming into the body. They're not going to do the same thing every time. They're going to come in and really take a minute to assess, like, what's going on? What, what needs to be done here um, in this moment? And, yeah, I, I love thinking about this. Uh, I think that's a, a big difference when you're thinking about pharmaceuticals, um, just the intelligence of the plants. And, yeah, they're, they just want to help. They want to do what you need. So, um, yeah, this cooling post-digestion and warming pre-digestion is just going to be the energetics of the plant on the tissue states. And then right here, these are all the plant actions. So you'll probably recognize some of these we talked about earlier. Um, I did want to 
list out some of the other ones of this plant and many of the plants that are in the slides, just to show you um, the vast amount of things that these plants do in the body, um, just how truly profound their medicine is. And as you get to know them, um, you'll get to experience these firsthand um, and call on them for different reasons. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to show you how much Tulsi has going on here. Um, yeah, and Tulsi is referred to as queen of the herbs. It's one of, gosh, one of the oldest, like most revered plants. Um, it has more than 3,000 years of recorded medicinal use. Very, very sacred to um, Hinduism and Ayurvedic medicine. And Tulsi is really wonderful for chronic fatigue syndrome. So again, it's just kind of rebuilding that nervous system. Um, it's great for when you're not getting that much sleep, um, but you still have to be nice to people <laughs> the next day. So yeah, this is, it's just a, such a lovely plant and it's highly indicated for brain fog. Um, if you're someone when you get stressed out, um, you just can't seem to remember things like you're running to the kitchen and you forget why you're going in there um, or you're forgetting things like mid-sentence. Um, Tulsi just helps bring circulation back into the brain um, so you can just have a little clearer cognition through the stress that you're dealing with. It's very, very balancing um, to cortisol levels and very supportive to adrenal glands. This is really important to think about um, with that piece we were talking about earlier with our um, inflammation in the body. So when there's excess inflammation from our diet, our cortisol levels, our stress hormones really skyrocket. So Tulsi is such a beautiful plant to call on just to help balance everything out. And yeah, one of my favorite pieces about Tulsi is that it interfaces directly with our hypothalamus in our brain, and it helps us to heal patterns of inherited stress or ancestral trauma. This is very important to think about. Um, if any of you have been studying or just keeping an ear to the ground um, with the science behind epigenetics, um, this your ears may perk uh, with this piece about Tulsi. Um, yeah, it's just we're finding more and more that a lot of our stress response is inherited. And honestly, you know, there's so much daily stress that we have to deal with that it does not have to do with our ancestors and our what, what we have going on in our DNA. So I really, really love Tulsi. Um, for stepping in and kind of just helping us let go of those inherited stress responses and um, really give us a fighting chance, you know? Um, yeah, so that's Tulsi. There's some other things here. I would say that um, I would not use uh, Tulsi if you were pregnant. Um, some herbalists, you know, might say, oh, you know, a cup of tea here or there would be okay. And I might be a bit conservative with saying that you can't, but I just, I wanted to plant that seed in case anyone was pregnant out there. Um, it's just because it interfe interfaces so much with our endocrine system, our hormones. Um, so therefore, I, I just like to give it a little space around um, pregnant women. Okay. Oh, and I will say it's also wonderful for um, uh, stress that you're experiencing, especially surrounding um, menopause and perimenopause when hormones are kind of doing that roller coaster. Um, Tulsi is very, very supportive for just balancing all that out. Okay, and this is a recipe that I'll let you all go back to in your own time. Um, it's so easy to make. Herbal honeys are, could not get any easier. You just fill 
a jar with herbs and then cover it with honey. <laughs> you let them sit, um, you know, for three to four weeks and then strain out or not. You can even keep the herbs in there. And um, yeah, Tulsi honey especially is just a really beautiful flavor. Tulsi is a little spicy. Um, so yeah, this is just a wonderful remedy you can try out on your own time and you can make any of the plants that we talk about today. So if you're really feeling drawn to any of them, I would, um, I would recommend trying out an infused honey. Okay, the next plant I wanna talk about is lemon balm. So this is also in your tea. And as we can see, lemon balm, first of all, is just so lovely looking and smelling um, and then as we can see it's it's cooling post-digestion and warming pre-digestion so this is the same as the Tulsi and one connection I want to make is um, in the plant actions here we see the word carminative and we also see the word nervine so a carminative basically means um, any plant that helps the body with digestion. So it's gonna support you through gas or bloating, something like that. And this carminative action is going to be responsible for these energetics right here, why it's cooling post-digestion and warming pre-digestion, because these two elements in the body are gonna support digestion in the best way. But when you have a carminative that's also a nerving, you can bet every single time it's gonna be a wonderful plant to help relieve uh, stress that's held in the stomach. So if you are someone, when you get very stressed out, um, if you, gosh, maybe, you, you like aren't hungry, you know, you can't, can't get anything down. Or maybe you get really bad stomach cramps or bloating, or maybe you have to run to the bathroom because you have diarrhea. Um, or the flip side, maybe you are so stressed out that you just kind of are clenched and holding and um, finding yourself a bit constipated. Anything, any imbalance that's going on um, in the stomach, in the GI, um, that is stress related, lemon balm is going to be so, so supportive for you. And any plant that's a nerving and also a carminative is going to be supportive for that. And as you go through the slides, you'll be able to see there, there's quite a bit. Um, lemon balm is amazing for folks who are, I would say like maybe the type A's amongst us. So those of us who, when we're stressed out, we kind of get a bit stiff and rigid. Um, maybe we bust out our to-do lists or we just get hyper-focused on achievement or some goal um, that must be obtained um, in order to, that we think that will make us less stressed out. Um, lemon balm just really comes in and helps you just quiet all of that and calm down and feel into your body, feel into your heart space and um, just not be so, so yeah, hyped up on checking things off the list. And it's beautiful um, for heart palpitations um, that get worse with stress. So very similar to the Hawthorne we were talking about earlier. And also great for stress headaches. Um, and we talked about the, the GI already. Okay, and then lemon balm is also really beautiful for um, bringing light to the spirit. So specifically the light of the moon. And, you know, this might seem I don't know, maybe sound a little hippie or something like that, but I, I just have found this again and again, that there's some clients uh, that I work with who are experiencing, um, you know, levels of depression and they are really needing um, 
some light in their spirit. But when I've tried herbs um, with them, like St. John's wort or light chamomile that have those really bright um, kind of solar light energy, it often backfires. It's, it's often just a bit too much. Um, and many times these people are, might consider themselves like night owls um, or yeah, just people who energetically don't really vibe with that bright solar, you know, get out there and put your face in the sunshine kind of, kind of a personality. Um, so if, if that's resonating with you, um, lemon balm might be a really beautiful plant to reach for, to lighten your spirit without really overwhelming you with that bright sun energy. And then it's awesome for insomnia caused by grief and sadness. And oh my goodness, I feel like many of us may be familiar with that um, these days. So yeah, just a, a really wonderful one. It's safe, it's awesome for kids and elders. Um, yeah, great for recurring nightmares. Um, and then yeah, just if you're feeling burned out, um, if you found like, you know, oh my gosh, I've just been stressed out for months and months and months, and I'm tired. Um, drinking lemon balm, like a quart, a quart of lemon balm tea every single day, um, just to get you back on track. You know, try that out for a week, and um, I think you'll you'll feel a lot better. And then I will mention lemon balm is cooling to the thyroid, so it's just something to think about if you are on thyroid meds, if you um, identify as having a hypothyroid or Hashimoto, something like that, I would stay away from lemon balm on a on like a medicinal level. So um, if you wanted to take the tincture every day or like drink a whole quart of tea every day, but you had a hypothyroid, that wouldn't be a good idea. If you wanted to just have a cup of tea here and there, um, that's 100% safe. Um, yeah, if anyone is is experiencing hypothyroid symptoms and they have a tea blend, you know, for instance, that's 100% fine. Um, you can have a cup of your tea blend, no problem. Um, it's just if you're really, really taking um, high am amounts of lemon balm. Just wanted to mention that as a contraindication. Okay, and you can go back and look and look at this on your own. This is um, a glycerate recipe. This is great for kids. Um, glycer glycerate is basically a plant sugar, and um, yeah, it just couldn't be easier to make. It's very similar to the honey, um, and it's just a great alternative. You know, maybe you don't have time to make a cup of tea, but you know, you or your child or anyone in your life is just feeling a little stressed um, and needing that lemon balm. Um, this creates an alcohol-free version of, of a tincture, essentially. So it, it's preserved, you know, longer than a cup of tea. It's um, always there, you know, in a little tincture bottle. You can just reach for that when you need it. Um, yeah, I'll let you check that out on your own time. Okay, and the next plant I want to talk about is milky oats. So in your tea blend, we have a version, um, a different part of the plant, which is the oat straw. And the oat straw is so, so supportive. Um, it's full of nutrients. It really feeds and tonifies the nervous system. Um, it's going to be a nerving tonic. Um, and yeah, it's just a, a beautiful part of the plant. But I specifically here wanted to talk about milky oats. So the oat straw would be all of these above ground parts of the plants. And this is just like a, a wild oat plant. Um, so oat straw is going to be all of the above ground parts, but dried and then chopped up. And then milky oats is very specific, and it's going to be um, the milky latex that are found in these little pods right here. 
And if anyone has been around these in the early to midsummer, um, you'll know how much fun it is to kind of run your fingers through, get a handful of these, and then you can actually pop them. And um, this beautiful milky um, latex comes out and this is the medicine, this is, this is the milky oat. And this, the magical, profound thing about this is that it actually repairs the myelin sheath of frayed nerve endings. So frayed nerve endings happen um, after chronic stress, chronic drug and alcohol use, um, poor diet, autoimmune imbalances, epilepsy, MS. Um, there's, there's so many modern conditions that um, create these frayed nerve endings. And milky oats, along with another plant, skullcap, and with skullcap, it needs to be the fresh tincture. So both the milky oats fresh tincture and the skullcap fresh tincture are going to bring this um, this healing, uh, beautiful repairing medicine to the fr to frayed nerve endings. And this is really special. I I can't think of a pharmaceutical that does this. Um, so it's really special medicine to know about and to have on hand. And yeah, it's, as you can imagine, it's just great for um, cases of nervous stability um, when you're just so tired um, and that's connected more to depression and that deep burnout, um, folks with loss of libido, um, yeah, it's just really wonderful, nourishing medicine. And then the, um, so again, the oat tops are gonna be tinctured fresh and the tincture is a alcohol extraction. And then the dried stalks, um, the oat straw, again, is gonna be what's in your tea blend. Um, so these, again, are just really great mineral rich um, part of the plant. And they combined really, really well with other really um, mineral rich plants like nettle, red raspberry leaf and red clover. And if you were really wanting to support your nervous system, yeah, just on a basic level, like something you could start doing tomorrow, I would highly recommend infusions of oat straw and nettle. This is my favorite blend, oat straw and nettle. Um, an infusion is just a very long brewed cup of tea, so like eight hours. <laughs> and um, I'll describe how to do that in a minute. Okay, in the next and potentially last plant we're going to talk about is um, chamomile. So I couldn't leave this one out. Um, Ah, chamomile is just the mother of healing plants. And I think many of us, I don't know, maybe put chamomile on the back burner because it's so common, you know, maybe it's a plant we've grown up with. Um, but the medicine of chamomile is profound. Um, ah, it's good for all types of anxiety and stress-related disorders. Um, I love chamomile because it's so safe. Um, it's safe during pregnancy. It's safe for children, safe for elders. Um, it's safe for any SSRIs or MAO inhibitors that you might be taking. Um, so yeah, if you're already taking medicine for your stress or anxiety disorder, chamomile can just be another, another gentle friend in the mix. Um, and yeah, it's so supportive. Again, it's gonna have that carminative and nerving action. So that means it's gonna be very supportive to folks who hold stress in their stomach. And something that's, yeah, just kind of interesting about chamomile is um, there's a couple different ways to prepare it and making a cold infusion is actually my favorite way to enjoy chamomile. Um, so making a cold infusion, 
you're going to get more of the anti-anxiety and antidepressant qualities. And then making a hot infusion, you're going to get more of the calming to the GI and supportive to sleep qualities. And when you make a cold infusion, this is so easy. Um, you just fill a quart-sized mason jar with maybe three to four tablespoons of chamomile. And this could be, does not have to be fancy. You could go to the grocery store and get, you know, a box of chamomile tea and just throw in four tea bags and then cover that with cold water. And then you're gonna to wanna to just leave that, shake it up and just leave it on the counter overnight for like eight to 10 hours. And in the morning, you strain out the chamomile and just drink it first thing, drink it throughout the day. Um, it's truly one of the most supportive things you can do. Um, it tastes sweet. Um, you know, the bitter taste in chamomile is going to come more from the hot infusions. Um, the cold infusions has a, a sweeter, um, just a lighter quality to it that's really lovely. And it just really slips you into your parasympathetic nervous system, like right off the bat. Okay, and then, um, yeah, this is just another recipe for a cold infusion, adding cinnamon. Cinnamon is so lovely. Um, cinnamon is moistening, it's uh, lubricating, it's a potentiator, which means it's gonna turn up the plant actions of any plant that it's um, combined with. And it's also so good for, um, it's a nerving stimulant, so it's good for when we just, you know, need a little, um, need a little push to like get through the day. But it's also so grounding and really roots you into your body and helps you just feel safe. Um, I associate cinnamon with just, yeah, just feeling like safe in the home and safe in the home of your body. So I really love this one this recipe. And then cinnamon is great for curbing um, uh, sugar cravings. It's a blood sugar regulator. So um, again, if you're working with that inflammation piece in the body and really trying to cut back on sugar, this would be a really great remedy to reach for. Okay, friends, I think we're running out of time. I know we're going so fast. I just want to show you one more thing. Um, yeah, there's so many slides here for you to check out, but I do just want to show you this so quickly, and then we'll jump out for some questions. Um, if I was were to recommend like ultimate nervous system support, this is what I would recommend. So please go back to this slide. Um, message me if there's any questions or if you need clarifications with things. Um, oils, I cannot recommend um, body oiling inside the body and out. Um, I cannot recommend that enough. Um, yeah, I just, if you can picture like bumper cars, it kind of oiling outside the body kind of just creates this buffer where all of the sensory information that's coming at you every day nonstop. Um, if you oil your body on the outside, it kind of just lets those things bounce off a little softer. And then um, oiling your body on the inside with really healthy oils, healthy fats like avocados or nut butters, something like that, um, really kind of feed and tonify the nervous system in a similar way to that um, skull cap and milky oat um, plant actions that I was talking about earlier, the ones that really coat the frayed nerve endings. So yeah, the oil on the body, inside the body, doesn't quite do, have the same action, but it has a similar effect where it just kind of creates a little buffer. And then oiling your ears. I just don't want you to forget that. It's one of the most calming things you can do for your body. Okay, friends. And then I'm just going to zip through this just to show you. There's so many plants to explore, so many. 
so many new plant friends to make. Um, I do just want to show you that at the end um, is my contact information. So yeah, I know we just went through so much. Um, so if anyone has questions and yeah, just wants to um, go down any plant rabbit holes, um, I would be so honored to do that with you. And places to source herbs. So these are some links. You can actually click on them. And, um, you know, I would first would suggest maybe connecting to your local herbalist or, or local herb farms if you have them. Um, choice, these are some of my favorite um, organic herb farms that where I source a lot of my medicine if I'm not growing it myself. Okay. Stop sharing here. Nora, that was amazing. You've given us so much information. A lot. And I'm excited to go through the PowerPoint again. Yes, good. There, there, there's so, so much and so many more plants I wanted to share. I had to <laughs> cut myself off. <laughs> <laughs> and now we, there's a few questions in the chat, which I'm going to read to you. Okay. So someone wanted to know um, what quantity of Tulsi would you recommend for it to be effective? Yeah, so um, I would say I, my question to answer that question would be, are you thinking about tea or um, tincture? Could you answer for both? For both? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so... Um, if you were going to start a relationship with Tulsi, I would suggest going all in. And if you, you know, wanted to do like a quart of tea a day, um, just, you know, making it in the morning and just sipping that throughout the day, I think that would be a really lovely way um, to interact with that medicine. And it would be very effective at that level. Um, if you didn't want to make a whole quart, you could just do three cups of tea a day. That's like just a general medicinal um, amount to take. And then for tincture, um, yeah, you could experiment with the dosing there. Um, I tend to recommend about a dropper full, which ends up being 30 drops, but it's about a dropper full, um, three times a day. I find that to be a really nice therapeutic dose. Um, but some, some herbalists might recommend even a little less, like, you know, 10 drops three times a day, something like that. So I would, um, yeah, I just encourage you to, to trust yourself and, you know, you could start with a full dropper full or maybe start with 10 drops and, just see how it feels and with with all plant medicine um i believe once you kind of quiet down and start your relationship you are going to feel something um you know right off the bat that's been my experience with clients and personally um but also plants have like a slow build you know so it might be that you drink a quart of tea for like a week or two weeks and then suddenly you notice like oh I'm really chill <laughs> and I wasn't before um and you might not notice until that mark if that makes sense so I hope that answered your question thank you for Claire's yeah. making some fun noises okay let's see here um Amy wanted to know, she has a few questions. Cool. So you shared a recipe um, for the lemon balm and the Tulsi, and she wants to know if you're using the plant or like the tea, like a dried, um, the dried plant. Yeah. So um, let's see, for the, for the glycerin, um, yeah, I would recommend you can use um, either fresh or dried plant honestly for all of the remedies that we shared but i believe um my the, the amount of herb that i suggested for each recipe is going to be a dried herb amount so that is the same thing as tea 
you know, just tea is just really chopped up, fine, um, dried amount of the herb. So yeah, you could even get like a box of Tulsi tea and just cut the bags open and pour that into a jar and then pour honey over it <laughs> and make it that way. Yeah. And, and especially then, in winter, I feel like where there's not a lot of fresh um, plant access, um, that's a really easy, nice way to go. And then she wanted to know, is there a difference, um, you know, in how you're going to drink if you make it from the plant versus from the tea? Um, yeah. yeah. Great question. And again, it's, yeah, it's just like, pr you pretty much substituting plant um, for tea. It's like the same, same, same situation it means the same thing. Um, yeah. Drinking these plant first tea, like loose tea. Yeah. So it's the same. <laughs> Sorry. Just That's repeating okay. That question. And then um, she also wanted to know, for all these plants, does it matter what time of day you drink it? You know, is there a better time to drink certain plants than others? Yeah. Or, um, you know, before a meal, after a meal? Yep. Um, yeah, for so it's gonna change with, um, from plant to plant. For most of the plants in the PowerPoint, um, so none of those plants are gonna have like a caffeine content to them. So as far as like, oh, should I not drink it late afternoon or before bed, something like that, um, there's no worries there. Um, in general, I feel like a lot of these plants um, are supportive to digestion. So, you know, I find, I'm looking for like a quart jar and I actually don't have one around right now, but I usually just have a quart jar of tea with me all throughout the day and I'm just kind of drinking throughout the day and that's what I recommend to clients as well. So yeah, there's not really, I would say any time is a great time that works with your schedule and making enough um, ahead of time, you know, I think making that big, if you're doing an overnight infusion, you make it the night before, or if you're making just like a regular um, quart jar full of tea, making it in the day. If you make a big amount and you don't have to make it every time, you can just kind of sip through it. So that's what I would recommend. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, there's a few more. Someone wanted to know um, what plants are best for hypothyroidism? I know you talked about it a little bit. Yeah. And if taking medication, um, you know, does that change your answer? Yeah. Um, most, mostly I find when working with um, hypothyroid, hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's, if someone is taking medication, I tend to kind of let the, let the medication kind of do the heavy lifting there and then support the body um, in other ways that it's needing. So oftentimes that looks like, you know, working with like leaky gut or working with, um, yeah, just plants that support the adrenal glands or um, plants that support uh, the GI in general. Um, if I'm, if they're not on medication, uh, there are definitely plants that really kick the thyroid into action. Um, I believe there's a, a slide about this plant, but ashwagandha is a really nice one. Um, and that's a, a nervous system plant. You know, it's, it's an adaptogen. So it's gonna support the body, deal with stress, but then it really kind of gives a little, um, little push to the thyroid, which is nice. And then any plant that is warming. So like cinnamon uh, would be another nice one to reach for. Um, what else? I mean, cayenne, <laughs> if you could handle it. Um, yeah, th those are the ones that are coming through. But if you, if whoever wrote that question, um, Amanda, it, if you wanted to email me and kind of go into that a bit further, I'd be happy to share more resources. Thank you. Um, is the recommendation, so you said um, to drink, you know, so much water. Now, 
would the tea be counted towards this? <laughs> and the water you should drink every day. Great question. Um, in addition, yeah, there <laughs> there is a, a time in my herbal practice where I was very strict about this, and I would say, no, it does not count. Um, but now I feel like um, yes, you can you can include that and. I would encourage you to just have a little more water as well. You know, just the the tea is great, and it's going to be um, definitely flushing out the body, uh, flushing out the kidneys, and that's really important. Um, but there's something magical just about regular old water. Um, so I would shoot for um, shoot for you know at least getting in um the half your body weight in ounces and then if that involves the tea that's great and if you can have a little more water um that's going to be supportive to your body too now we have a question um does does cinnamon increase blood pressure oh great question um (laughs) yeah i don't believe it does. I think it is a hypotensive. Um, it's supportive to the cardiovascular system and it's relaxing to the blood vessels. So when you, yeah, when you get stressed, um, often like veins and arteries kind of get tight and that's what creates that, um, higher blood pressure. But I believe cinnamon um, is a relaxant in that sense and really just supportive to the cardiovascular system um, working optimally. So it's going to relieve some of that pressure. Okay, our next chat uh, question here is, um, someone said, I assume tinctures are always stronger than tea leaves. If so, the tinctures are the best way um, to get core of the effect i don't know if i'm reading this right Mm -hmm. how long do you recommend doing the tinctures for um are they more expensive than tea leaves Mm. really good questions you're such great questions thanks everyone yeah so in some ways they're stronger um you know it's really going to depend on the plant and the way your body um, reacts to either medicine. Um, You know, for Tulsi, for instance, I think Tulsi is a beautiful plant just to drink as as a tea. That's like primarily the way I would recommend it. Um, Traditionally, that's the way that it was used. Um, The tincture is going to do a better job at extracting some of the phytochemicals that are really relaxing to the nervous system. Um, is that necessary? It's it's just kind of a, it's one of those things that you're just going to have to experiment um, for yourself and just see like what, what is aligned with your body. Um, the, the good thing about tinctures is they're so convenient, you know, and um, yeah, they may be just a hair stronger, but you also have the option, you know, it's just here. You don't have to go and make a cup of tea. If you're running out the door, this can just be in your purse um, or your pocket or whatever. And um, they last for five years. So that's a pretty good shelf life. <laughs> so um, yeah, I would say just convenience um, wise, I tend to reach for tinctures um, when a client I'm working with has the luxury to really slow down and carve out the time to make a cup of tea three times a day. Um, we'll go the tea route, um, but otherwise, I find tinctures to be convenient. And how long do you recommend doing the tinctures for? Yeah, this is going to be different for everyone. Um, In general, I think the three-month mark is a pretty um, nice time to just check in and see, like, wow, what are are the big shifts that have happened um, and and where do we need to go from here? And especially if you're working with adaptogens, so Tulsi, for instance, um, is going to be an adaptogen 
you're going to want to change out those plants every three to four months. So, yeah, it, I mean, the goal of herbal medicine is not to be taking it forever. <laughs> you're, you really, it, it's like the, you need to go back to those pillars that we were talking about um, with the sleep and the diet and the stress support and the moving your body in sunlight. Um, those are really going to be the pillars. And then herbal medicine is just like the icing on top to kind of just be a support and then bring everything um, back to homeostasis, you know, back into balance. Um, yeah. And then tinctures are a lot more expensive. Um, yes, I would say in general, um, especially if you're buying um, herbs in bulk. So if you like, for instance, went to um, some of the links at the end of the presentation and were ordering like pounds of whatever herb that you wanted from one of the herb farms, um, that's gonna be a lot cheaper than if you were to get, um, you know, like eight ounces of a tincture or something like that. Um, but then again, they just, they're convenient, so. Hope that helps. <laughs> Not sure I made a case for either there, but um, yeah. You're unbiased, it's appreciated. Yeah. Okay, and then our last question that we have here, are plants, are all these plants safe with daily vitamins and supplements? Great question. Um, all of the plants that we've talked about, hmm. yes, I would say, Again, um, you in general, I feel like um, plant medicine is, you know, generally safe. There are some, uh, there can be some con contraindications, more so with pharmaceuticals. With daily vitamins and supplements, you should be okay there, um, but you're going to want to check. I can't say that as a broad statement. Um, the best thing to do is really um, check specifically with the vitamins and supplements that you're taking. Um, you know, one thing that's coming to mind is, um, you know, if you were taking hmm, maybe like an iron pill or something like that, um, and also drinking like a quart of nettles every day, that might kind of shoot your iron levels a little too high and that can be the case for more of those like really mineral rich plants. So like the oat straw and the nettle that we talked about. Um, other than that, I can't imagine a contraindication, um, but please email me if there's, you know, something really specific you're curious about. I'd be happy to do the research on my end and just make sure that you're covered. Um, Cause yeah, in general, I, I don't think that would be a problem, but, I think it's good to always just, you know, double check everything that you're putting into your body and just making sure that everything will be harmonious in there. Does anyone else have any questions? How, oh, I'm seeing one. Can I just mention this quickly? I know we're a little over, um, but how important is it to eat organic vegetables and fruit? I just want to say um, very important. <laughs> I'm just seeing that piece up there. But something that's, um, I think, even more important than that is um, good quality water. So just really paying attention to... Um, yeah, just if you can, drinking spring water, um, just making sure it's uh, really going to be full of that um, high mineral content and um, just as healthy as can be, like kind of staying away from the, the bottled water, things like that. Um, so I would say water first, and then um, if you can afford it and you have the resources, um, definitely organic uh, food when you can. That's just going to support the liver, um, not get too overwhelmed um, with, with the toxicities that are in our everyday food. 
Well, thank you for all these questions, everyone. It's just so encouraging to see so much uh, interest in the plants. It makes me so happy. Thank you for your time today. Yeah. I think we'll definitely have you back. We've awesome. got so much more to learn. Awesome, I know. Sorry to overwhelm everybody. Oh, no, no, this was wonderful. Very exciting. Thank you so <laughs> much. And I hope you have a great day and everyone happy Thanksgiving. You're welcome. Oh yes, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thanks, Amanda. Bye, thank you. Bye. I'm proud of the work the Darien Foundation has done over the past 20 years. If you live here, our work has likely impacted you, your family, and your neighbors. Since our founding in 1998, we've provided more than $4.2 million in grants, which create opportunity for Darien's youth, support our town's safety and security services, and enhance the overall quality of life in Darien through collaboration with community organizations. As a family that's relatively new to town and planning to make this our long-term home, I'm grateful to see my community and my family benefit from the Darien Foundation. When I learned that the edible gardens at the elementary schools, the generator at the Darien Library, and the playground by the Sound were all funded by the same organization, I raised my hand to get involved. I'm proud to support an organization whose impact I see every day in our schools and throughout our community. So far this year, the Darien Foundation has awarded $138,000 in grants to enhance our community. In 2013, the Darien Community Association opened a four-acre bird sanctuary thanks to a grant from the Darien Foundation. The serene wooded glade has attracted numerous birds, bees, and butterflies, as well as more than 200 school children and other visitors. This year, they added a new pondless waterfall, as well as more trees, plantings, signage, and benches. In 1976, the Darien Historical Society and Darien High School students built the Middlesex, an authentic replica of the 18th century whaleboats. These were used by local patriots in the Revolutionary War to fight the British Navy in Long Island Sound. The Darien Historical Society is restoring this artifact so that it can be part of Darien's upcoming 2020 Bicentennial celebrations. The live turtle exhibit continues to be the most popular attraction for children at the Darien Nature Center, which welcomes over 16,000 visits annually. A new forest and pond ecosystem will allow visitors to engage with several species of turtle that will live together in a 50 square foot habitat that resembles their natural home. This has been such a special collaboration between the Darien Nature Center and the Darien Foundation because not only have they provided generous funding to us, but we've been able to meet with members. Welcome to session four of our budget workshop. Tonight, the schedule will be the Darien Fire Department, the Neroten Fire Department, the Neroten Heights Fire Department, EMS, Police, Public Works, sewer and then parking fund. And I think we might have um, our, I know Chief Anderson is joining us and Ed, uh, Department of Public Works Director Ed Gentile is joining us. Kate, do we have any uh, fire chiefs? We do not. Okay. okay. So do you want to stick with the plan to start with them? Yeah, so we'll stick with the plan um, to start with the fire department and we, I don't know if we have any uh, Board of Finance or Finance and Budget members here, but we're going to do what we've been doing in the past. We will go through the operating, then we will go through the capital for each ind individual department. Then we will open it up to um, questions from the Board of Selectmen. And then if anybody is from um, Board of Finance or Finance and Budget, and they want to type in um, their questions in the chat, that way we will um, be able to address. And then tomorrow we will start deliberations. So tomorrow we will start our meeting 
with public comments. So if anybody um, has been following along and has um, questions or concerns they want to bring to our attention tomorrow at the beginning of the meeting, we will um, be looking for that feedback. And now I will turn it over to Kate. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and let's make sure I get the right one. Okay. Kate, is that really your wall? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's one of those, those one of, uh, you know, those things you can add to it. Okay. Yeah, you don't want to see the, the background here. It's, uh, yeah. you know. Oh, I'm Jen. Okay, so um, like Monica, Monica said, we're going to start with uh, the fire departments. So first up is Darianne. Okay. Oh, I mean, I need to move a little, a few things out of the way to make it easier to see. Okay, if you want, you could just hit that little carrot next to reference years and it'll collapse all of those. <laughs> Thank you. The things uh, we learn. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> that is really good to know. Okay, so I'm still making a little bit. Okay, so, um, you know, one thing here, the first line, big increase percentage-wise, not a lot dollar-wise, it's $1,000 um, training services. Um, they're asking for more funding than they had last year to bring um, outside training people in. You know, um, as they get new members, they need, be, need to be trained in things like Firefighter One, um, but the more senior members continue to need training in different specialties, and um, we do really advocate um, training there. The next line item, it doesn't look like there's a big increase to you, but um, the department had asked for $12,000 to do an audit. Um, that is not, you know, their expenses that we pay for are part of our annual audit. They were looking for an audit of their um, separate funds, and I didn't feel that that was an appropriate expense for the town. So I cut it. Did something change? Did they ask for an audit? Uh this is the because of some reason, and did the other departments ask for it as well? No, no. Um, this was the first time they'd ever asked for it. Um, we, you know, we didn't get a whole lot of explanation because if you know, the people we met with um, were more the operational side, not the administrative side. Um, but um, they have significant funds um, as a five hundred one c three, and any audit of that should be paid from those funds. Um, the rest of their accounts, there really isn't a lot of change um, in here. Um, and I didn't change a lot. Um, you know, I should say, um, well, I should, here we go. We do have some, their, their potable water up, you know, percentage wise are significant, but dollar wise are not. But these, I looked at the sewer and the potable water, and those are based on actuals. And um, I think that the numbers are appropriate. Um, you know, when dealing with the fire departments, I try and make sure I'm looking at them um, a bit as a whole and trying to be fair in um, making sure that there, there's not great discrepancies in the funding levels. Um, I have tried to look at, you know, what kind of objective measures could we use? Could we look at the size of their district? Um, the number of parcels, the number of calls. Um, and it's, you know, it's not so easy because it doesn't matter the size of your district. You have to have a firehouse and that's going to require certain costs. You have to have equipment that requires certain costs. So it doesn't matter how many calls you go on or how big a district is, those um, overhead costs are going to be there. Um, unfortunately, this year we didn't get call information 
from um, from Darien or Neroten Heights. Um, we do get it from Neroten. Um, because you, you'd see there is, um, you know, Darien and Neroten Heights actually tend to do a lot more calls. Their districts are bigger. They have the highway. Um, Kate, we've gotten those in the past though, right? We have gotten those in the past, yes. No, Kate, actually, I, I have them. I have, have them? It, yeah, I have it for Darien. Okay. Um, and I don't know how to share that right now, but we can, we can send it out. Okay, that'd be great. But so you see, otherwise, you know, this is um, really a pretty much status quo budget. Um, there's not a lot new here. Um, the other thing I did try and do with the different fire department budgets was keep the increase of, for each one to no more than 3%. Um, I stand corrected, Kate. I have it, but the numbers aren't inputted. Okay. So I just have blank for 2021. Okay. All right. Um, if you're all okay, I'm going to move on to Neroten. Do you want to do their capital? I thought I'd do all all three at one time. Okay. So again, with Neroten um, training, I don't think I made any changes to their training, no. Um, where I did, I cut some professional services. Um, again, this is an issue of whether or not it's an appropriate expense for the town. Um, they've asked us to pay for directors and officers insurance premiums. This is for their administrative side, and I felt that, that wasn't something that we should pay for. Um, and I'm honestly on the on the fence about the tax preparation. Um, it's not about the firefighting side of it. So on the fence about whether or not we should pay for that. Um, pay they've, for that Kate, do we pay for that for anyone else? Yeah. And so if we cut it, I think we should be cutting it for all of them. Um, equipment maintenance. Um, I think they did a good job here of laying out um, their, what they're doing in terms of preventative service, anticipated repairs for each piece of equipment. So I think they did a really good job of laying that out for us. And I appreciate that. Now where I did make a cut, um, I believe it's here. <clears throat> um, I cut back their facility maintenance and repair. And, you know, my reasoning here was um, this is the smallest building. And I compared the facility maintenance and repair for each of the departments. And Neroten's was, on a square footage basis, was um, twice what the others were, more than twice. Um, and you have to account for things like, you know, if they've got an elevator, it doesn't matter how big your building is. Um, you know, you're going to be paying the same amount. But I reduced their um, their request, trying to bring it down, you know, closer to what the costs were for the other departments, which are physically um, much larger square footage wise. And so it's a, bringing it back to a level budget to the current year. Excuse me, Kate, this is Mike. But I, I don't know if they're going to have anyone here to sort of advocate or explain why they put in these expenses, but if they're actual real maintenance, you know, it, expenses, I, shouldn't those be provided uh, if they actually exist as opposed to evaluating them on, well, how many square feet do you have? I mean, they either have them or not, well, they're either legitimate expenses or not, right? Right. So the problem, Mike, is you get things like they've got $17,000 and they say facility repairs, plumbing, electrical without a lot of detail to know how much that is. You know, where they do have um, numbers, okay, you know, we can quantify that. Uh, you know, $10,000 for landscaping service. Um, you know, some of these, it's hard to compare 
And so taking a look at how their square, their cost per square foot compared to the other departments was a measure I could use to see whether or not their number was reasonable. Okay. Um, so special equipment repair, a um, bit of an increase there. Um, they have maintenance repair for the fire boat and the Zodiac. I felt that was reasonable. Um, telecommunications, I reduced it to reflect the current um, the current and historic actuals. And I think electricity, um, I believe the same thing. I adjusted it downwards to reflect the, um, the historic actuals. Um, and again, with potable water and sewer use charges, looking at the, the actuals um, brought them in line with what their actual numbers have been. Motor fuel and lubricants, you know, aside from what they get from the um, public works, they do have to gas up the boat. <clears throat> and the rest of the dollar amounts, you know, they were small. Percentage-wise, it might be big, but they felt they were reasonable. A little bit more for turnout gear, and that can depend on how many new members they have, how old some of the turnout gear is. Um, that can cause swings from year to year. Yeah, that's my that was my question. They don't get turnout new turnout gear every year. I would imagine that no. lasts a pretty long time. Well, depends on your definition of pretty long. Um, but there are standards for how long you should um, gear should last. Um, and some of it depends on their changeover in membership. If they get an influx influx of new members, um, you know, they might have some old gear they can pass along, but that also depends on size. So um, it can vary. Same thing, air cylinder replacements, those have useful lives and they have to be replaced periodically. So overall, I tried to, you know, like I said my target with these budgets was no more than 3%. Okay, there's nothing else there. I'm gonna go on to the heights. <clears throat> <clears throat> so last year, um, because they had some increases in other areas, um, we'd cut back their training dollars a little bit to try and bring them all in in a certain range. Um, so they've asked for an increase in training this year. Um, and you can see they've spelled out they want to send somebody to officer training. They have EMT. Um, bailout training, um, firefighter two, all good things. I think, you know, training is very important. Um, professional services, again, that was the DNO policy here that I said, you know, I didn't feel we should be paying for it. Some minor increases in equipment repair and facility maintenance repair. And again, you see, like, see this number 34,000 compared to 40,000. Um, in Neroten. There's not a lot remarkable um, in this budget. Um, not big changes. Um, tires, this is just a function of what they um, had to buy last year compared to this year. It's not really a decrease. And again, you see, you know, turnout gear hazardous materials handling, um, just replenishing supply and going to, they've had to change the kind of um, foam they use for firefighting to um, green foam. Um, and again, these, these numbers down here, these are, these are changes that um, basically these are their proposals um, where it's cut, it's not my cut. These are adding some standpipe equipment, some nozzles, um, important equipment for them. 
overall, I think you know they they came in with a, a responsible budget. Do we have any questions on the heights? Okay, for all three departments, um, I was recall discussing I don't know a couple of years ago that you wanted to rethink the grant process or certain aspects of the relationship with the departments. That one of them beyond <clears throat> beyond the granting of that grant was going to be that whether the town takes over or has a greater role in their payables as opposed to them doing it themselves. Um, how did all that sort of turn out and what is your current thinking on the oversight of that? Um, you know, honestly, you know, we did make the change where we're paying a lot of the expenses directly and I'm not, I'm not convinced that it's been the best, best method. Um, I honestly, if you, I were going to do it again, I might say it, when you total up all their operating budgets and including the fire commission, we're talking about um, 900,000 or so. Part of me would be inclined to say here, fire commission, here's the $900,000. And um, have at it. Um, In other words, you know, I maybe treat them a little bit more like the library. Ask them to put together a budget for all three as one entity, and give them a grant. Um, you know, it's it's a difficult trying to be equal or trying to treat them equitably. Trying to recognize that two of them. Um, have much greater areas to respond to um but that doesn't mean you can't fund the third um but how do you treat them equitably what should we be paying for what should they be paying for uh it's a lot it and it'd be a big change to, to go to a grant for them it would be a big change and and you know the other um you know one of the issues i think we have it's not something they've done, but there is no oversight, independent oversight. There's no department head. There's no independent commission. So that is a discussion, you know, that perhaps we will have in the future. I'm going to okay. quick touch on the um, fire commission. So we've put some things over the years under the auspices of the fire commission that are shared things. So the first one you see training services, um, all the firefighter one classes are gonna be, are run through the fire commission. Um, they pay dues to some of the professional organizations. They, um, the fire commission is responsible for testing their SCBA units, the hose testing, the ladder testing, pump testing, so they handle that for all three departments. Um, we also provide an employee assistance program for the firefighters. Hey Kate, all of, yep. the, all of the individual testing for the fire um, firemen is done by each house, correct? When you say testing, what exactly do you mean? Any any kind of um, continuing education or new testing for a new a new volunteer? Um, it depends. So the firefighter one is run through the fire commission. That's the basic that they need. Okay. When you go above the firefighter one, that's run by each house. Okay. Not to say that they can't do it all together, but we budget for firefighter one under the fire commission. Um. The medical services line is for their annual physicals. And I reduced that a little bit based on what we were actually seeing in numbers um, and expenses over the years. Um, software maintenance, everybody's got it. Um, this is for their e-dispatch um, software.
um, equipment repair maintenance. Um, these are some of the breathing systems, the sea, the sea legs, some of the ground ladders. <clears throat> Um, yes, Sarah? Jumping ahead a little tiny bit, under emergency communication services line, mm -hmm. have we, where are we in the discussions to maybe combine the dispatching? We did have that conversation a couple years ago. I don't know. Well, we wanted to get back, to, we wanted to get to having nine civilians in right. the dispatch center and right. have them operate for a while. Um, I will tell you the firemen are going to oppose um, bringing oh, the dispatch under um, back under. Um, well, I shouldn't, you know, make it that definitive. So far, they haven't been in favor of it. Um, and I, the chief, um, is very willing to do what it would take to get this back and have our dispatchers do it. Um, so we need to have discussions now that we're about up to full strength. In the civilian dispatch, we need to have discussions. We need to talk about what kind of reports we want. Um, what you know, what are they getting now, and um, how could we best do this? I really, it is a goal. I just don't believe it's going to be in this fiscal year. But actually, that's you know bringing us down to the the bottom of the budget again. It's it's not a very um, remarkable budget, no big changes. What we really need to look at with these um, departments is the, um, how do I find my tabs? Um, <laughs> okay, the capital. Um, okay. Their capital is the biggest capital request that we have when you add the three together. Um, Darien Fire. They're looking to, uh, looking to um, upgrade, get a mutual aid radio, and I probably should go back to the details. Um, this is so that they can communicate with some of the other towns that we um, have a mutual aid agreement with. I think it's it's an important um, purchase. Bailout kits, these are, um, you've probably heard, they're, they're higher harnesses that would allow them to um, bail out from um, an upper floor if they don't have a ladder available. It's a life-saving piece of equipment. I believe it's important for them to have, particularly with um, some of the development that's coming in downtown. hoses and fittings we have to replace them periodically as they get older and as they get damaged the ladder monitor um mm -hmm. i'm just bringing up the description of it because i don't recall um all right I have to go to my notes and see if I can remember what the ladder monitor is. And I don't know. I'll find it, Kate. Jen, do you know if we have anybody from the fire department on here? Uh, I do not see anybody. Okay. Nope. Okay, this is the ladder monitor for Darien, right? Yes. Okay, so it is a $9,700 item, and it is useful life is 20 years. Um, what problem does it address? It, it's a limit on how the current unit works on the truck. Um, most cost effective and mo it, there's not a lot of, um, basically the benefit is increasing our capabilities with the current ladder truck. Yeah, and I thought he explained when we met with him what exactly the ladder monitor did. 
That's what I'm looking for my notes, see if I have that. And I don't know how much time you want to spend on $9,700. You know, let's let's move on, and we'll yep. we'll we'll, move, we'll come back to that um, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay. okay. Yep. At some point, can we have a discussion, and not tonight, um, about the different radio line items? There seems to be radio <laughs> line items, right? Like everywhere, like capital. Everywhere, operating. yes, there are. Yes. Well, because they all have them, and they have to be updated on a regular basis. Um. And, and they the software you know, and the maintenance. And yeah, the, and they have different purposes. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, might be best if at some point we have somebody like Mark McEwen or Bobby Bush come in and explain some of it. Yes. Um, okay. So the last one there is the rescue jacks. These are um, heavy duty jacks that are used for um, things like if they have a truck rollover on ninety five to um support the truck while they while they get to do the work that they need to on it um i think that's an important um piece of equipment for for them considering the you know they have to respond to 95. and they also can hold up the building right kate yes yeah um okay and i'm, I found I'm the, sorry um, this is this is Mike, I apologize. Um, for a rescue jack that's going to be primarily used on 95, is there an ability to make a grant application to the to the state for the some of these expenses that relate to the services like on the state highway or federal highway? Um, I am not aware that the state has um, any kind of program for that. Um, there are grant programs available for fire equipment, um, and I can ask that question of them. That's a great question, Mike. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go back out, and we'll go to Neurotin. Um, so the first one up, um, Neurotin has proposed a bunk room conversion. I think this is a great idea. Um, they would like to convert some of their space to a bunk room and a work room. Uh, the concept is, you know, partly to get people to be willing to um, basically stay overnight to be on call at times. Um, and the work room part of it is to set up workstations where if they have members who um, have the ability to work remotely, that they could work at the firehouse and be available to be on call. So I think it's a really great way to attract members to keep their numbers up, <clears throat> be able to respond to calls. Um, apparatus tires is just what it sounds like. Um, some of their apparatus, the tires can be very expensive. And then water rescue suits, um, they need to be just like their turnout gear periodically they need to be replaced because they do have useful lives what i didn't fund here um a training projector they asked for um sixty five hundred dollars and um <clears throat> they want to be able to um well they do do training in their firehouse <clears throat> and they're not happy with their current setup and how it looks um using a small projector in the screen. And, you know, I cut it because, quite frankly, you could do what we did in 206, um, get a large screen TV. Those cost less than $900. You plug the laptop into it with a USB cord and you've got a very good display. So I think they could do what they're asking for, for quite a bit less. And that was that was it. That was the only change I made there. Okay. Um, on this one, oh no, it's no, it's at the heights. Okay. Excuse okay, me. so let's go to the heights. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah. <clears throat> 
Okay, so the Heights had a couple things. Um, AED replacements for their um, their apparatus, um, but that was an important one to do. Um, attic insulation, um, they had made some, um, they had to do some repairs on the firehouse. Um, and as in doing the repairs, I believe it was asbestos removal, they had to, um, they had to remove the insulation in the attic. And so they're asking for funding to put it back, which I think um, considering that we pay to heat the building would be a really good use of our money. Uh, the next one, just a major service to one of the um, pieces of equipment. This one, um, the joint and mortar repair, this $13,000 um, addresses one side of the building. Um, they've they've noticed and had inspected the, the building and the bricks and the joint and the mortar need to be repaired. So all four sides need to be done. And um, so right now they're actually only asking for like one side a year. Um, we did talk to them, see if they could get us a price to um, speed that up a bit, but we didn't hear back from them. This is something that I um, think could be a good use of um, ARPA funds, but it absolutely, I believe, you know, should be done. And I think, I don't believe that I changed anything else. I don't think I cut anything. Just go back up here. Monica, you had something on one of these? Um, at engine 23, do we know how old that is? Um, no, I don't. Um, we can find that out for tomorrow. And I, you know, I'm hearing you on the ARPA for the, uh, the joint mortar, but if there's, a, if there's cost savings in doing the whole building at one time, I know they haven't come back to us, but we should probably look for yeah. that. Well, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I thought it'd be good for, for the ARPA money is if we use that and did it all at once. Right. Um, because I don't, I don't see the, you know, spreading it out. I appreciate their um, desire to be responsible with the town's funds, um, but you know, maybe this is the time to do them all, all at once. Um, they do have replacement of some of their SCBA units. These are things that are ongoing, the portable radios, um, things that you can see, we, we do it in cycles. So it happens um, every year. I don't know if you can see that, it looks like it's probably pretty small print for you. Um, but you see like the SCBA doing it for several years, same thing with the radios we do it in cycles um, because they only last for so long. Okay, I'm gonna... Okay, we'll come back to those. Um, so the last one, the big one, the fire commission. So they've asked for a few things at the drill tower. The first thing they asked for was a classroom. It was a $120,000 request. Um, and it would involve putting a portable there and all the associated costs with that to create a classroom. Um, look at the proposal details. I do think it's a... Um, you know, it's a good project. It's a worthwhile project. Um, some of these things, if they want to host training sessions for other, not just themselves, but other communities, they really should have the class on site where they also do the burn, um, the burn training. Um, I just felt with a lot of other things happening, this was not um, something we could afford to do this year. But again, I think this might be a great project for the ARPA funds. Hey, we have the. Um the elementary schools coming down, the portables coming down there, would it be at all possible to repurpose 
from the schools? Well, if the schools, I don't know what the schools have planned for them. Um, if they had planned to sell them to another community. Um, I think that's probably, that's worth asking. <clears throat> they don't say where they were planning to get it. Um, but I think that's, that's a good thing to look into. Um, <clears throat> so they wanted to do work on the grounds as well. Um, when they're doing um, live fire training, live burn training, they should have a second source of water. Um, so they need to extend water main and install a hydrant in order to have that second source. So that's in there. Um, they want to upgrade the catch basins um, because of the kind of work they're doing up there. They get um, debris into the catch basins, so they'd like to upgrade them to be able to catch that better. Um, paving the parking lot, I deferred because of the size of the cost and let them get these projects. They've got some projects still outstanding from prior years that they haven't completed, like the fencing, uh, the expansion of the concrete pad. So let's get these other projects done first and then look at paving the, repaving the parking lot. That was my thinking there. Then the big nuts. Replace, replacing the engine. So I'm going to say, Monica, based on this, I'd say the engine is probably at 20 or, or getting a little bit beyond 20. Um, so in the attachments, I just put their apparatus replacement schedule out there and it says the original purchase year. And then if there was a refurbished year, that's in there as well. Okay. So, <clears throat> you know, my suggestion um, would be to fund these from bonding if if the projects are to go forward. And Sarah, you were raising your hand. Yeah, I just don't know where we were in that discussion with the bonding. We haven't bought a truck and an engine, I should say, in a few years, is that correct? We actually have one um, that's in the process now. Okay, um, and we haven't contributed. We have not contributed to the vehicle right. replacement fund anymore. That was done away with. Um, is there any way to spread these out or not really? Well, bonding spreads it out. Yeah, no, it does. I just don't know where we are in the discussion. We've been talking about that for a bit. Well, I believe um, the one that we're about to purchase or that we've got um, under contract is being bonded. Correct, Jen? No, that is no? being paid with the remainder of the apparatus uh, replacement reserve funds. Okay. Yeah, we cleared out that account to pay for this truck. And then the idea was we would bond for these trucks going forward. But <clears throat> I, I mean, our decision is is around whether we need to replace these trucks, how to pay for them, leave that to the Board of Finance. They'll decide whether to tax or bond or, or whatever, that's their job. And then Kate, I had two more questions. Yep. Um, the traffic preemption system, I feel like we've talked about that and there was a priority to that. Did we decide not to do that or? That is um, an is that older last... project. Okay, so this is, uh, and that's the extended concrete pad that we did that already. Right. No, we have, well, it, we approved it already. It right. hasn't been done. So let's, where's their six year? Um, I'm just trying to remember. Right. So let me make this a little bit bigger. The traffic preemption was appropriated in 21, 22. Mm -hmm. um, and as was the concrete pad. So those are, the money's already there for those. But they haven't been done yet. The concrete pad definitely has not been, um, and I don't recall the status of the preemption system, but I don't think it has been done. Okay. So like I said, I, you know, I think they have things that they need to get done up there before like we do the paving of the parking lot. Absolutely, and the fiscal year is not over yet, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, just going back to that paving, I mean, the, the parking lot is, is safe correct it's not like it has potholes or something or if they they do they can repair those do spot repairs i mean it's not a safety issue right uh right let me i'll bring up their explanation um <clears throat> well the pavement is 
it's old and it's showing wear and tear. Um, you know, they feel it needs to happen as part of the infrastructure of the dual ground. Um, so there's been damage to it, but like I said, I, I, it's not that I don't think we should do it, just that they've got other things they need to get done first. Um, and, you know, considering that they haven't gotten that concrete pad yet, they want to install um, this um, additional water main and hydrant. Um, I think that's a lot to take on and get done and get the paving done. So I'd like to see the water main extended, the catch basins done, get that complete. Then next year, let's do the paving. Okay. Jen, do we have any questions in the chat? We do not. Okay, I'm seeing stuff. Okay. Okay. Um, David Martin asked why New Roten's equipment repair maintenance was up so high and the others were not. Um, I, that's a good question and I can't answer that tonight. Um, um, some of the the rescue jacks, you know, for Neurotin, um, some of that's based on their request. It was in next year because they requested it. Yeah, Kate, if I could just log one, one thing. Um, I guess it would it would be helpful, and we don't have to do this right now, but maybe over the course of the next year or so to think about this. I I think we ought to have a, a clear view on the fire protection requirements for all this new development. I'd just like to know what it is, and I'd like to be comfortable that this these budgets and plans, both for this year as well as uh, upcoming capital projects, that uh, somebody's checked the box on that, that we know we have all that in place. But the second thing is that I've looked at these fire budgets for more than 10 years. And I guess the thinking about what would be a benefit, just given the, the change in roles that we've, we've had, is to get a more holistic view of trying to answer the central question, which is what fire protection capacity does this town need? And, mm -hmm. and they had fresh year. Now, I know there's been some consultants that have looked at that. I can't recall when we last did that. And they've come in and sort of poked around at that. But, uh, you know, again, new administration, it might be time, uh, particularly given how spread out so many different things seem to be in terms of the individual purchases by department. Uh, I guess Sarah brought up again the whole point about radios. It just it feels like this just this whole spread of spending uh, across all of this. And we, we just haven't been able to take a clear step back and look at this uh, holistically with an eye towards answering that central question, which is what fire protection assets do we need in place? And the last thing I'd say is that I recognize the value of having these three independent departments. Um, I looked very closely at that for a long time, and it still seems to me to be a good answer for, for lots of reasons. Uh, that may not be the most efficient answer, but I can understand why that's a good thing for the town, and so I remain supportive of that. But I still think that you can have individual fire departments but you can also take a holistic view of all this, including the fire commission and everything else, because I don't think we have a, a clear and crisp answer to uh, that that question, which is what, what fire protection do we need and, and are we getting that in the most efficient way? Right, so, you know, actually one of the prior studies did answer that in, you know, in a couple different ways. And, you know, part of it was, you know, if you want to continue with the three different departments, um, or if you want to merge departments. Um, we'd put out an RFP for a study of our emergency services, and it goes beyond just the, the fire departments, but um, looking at dispatch, looking at our emergency management, looking at, at the fire services. And um, <clears throat> over the weekend, I was reviewing the responses. And um, I do want to recommend one of the... Um, consultants, I'm going to have to come back to you guys for about $12,000 um, to add to my budget to <clears throat> to pick the, my preferred vendor. Um, but one of the things that we've asked 
we are asking to have looked at is, you know, how we're, how we're set up, how we're administered. Are we doing that the right way? And I think that's one of the keys to addressing some of the things around um, joint purchasing um, to make sure that we're doing things in the best way. Clearly, volunteer fire departments are a tremendous cost savings to the residents. Um, but just because it costs us less than a paid fire department would, we still need to make sure that we're spending town taxpayer dollars wisely. Um, and sometimes it's hard to, um, you know, hard to say that, you know, like, oh, we value you, but, you know, we still need to make sure we're spending our dollars in a, in a smart way, um, you know, and have people not assume that asking that question means you don't value them. We, we absolutely value them, but we still want to make sure that we're spending the taxpayer dollars properly or as best we can. Anyway, just a, a fresh look at that in the coming year, yep. I think, would be benefit, beneficial. This is a good time to do it. Yep. <clears throat> and, you know, if I could ask um, Board of Finance members or F&B members, if you have questions, to direct them to Jen through the chat function, not to me, because it's hard for me to, um, to keep checking on those. Okay, um, I do have one that's come in. Yep. Um, regarding the three engines for Fire Commission, they're asking for all three for next year. Can we push one to next year? Should we push one to next year? Yeah, um, I just would point out one of them is a rescue truck as opposed to an engine, um, two different functions. <clears throat> um, and I think that's a that's a valid question. Um, okay. Um, if there's nothing else on the fire departments, um, we are done with the fire departments. And going to head over to the police department. And the chief is with us tonight because um, it's a big budget and I know an awful lot about it, but it's always helpful to have him here. Um, <clears throat> so, Uh, I'm going to start out in, in administration and um, address the big one right away. In this budget, um, the chief has asked for a full-time IT support position. I am supporting that. Um, they, you know, they have unique needs in the police department with their software, but it's not just their software, it's, um, it's technology. One of the issues um, they face more and more is FOI requests. And um, one of the roles of this technology person would be to, <clears throat> to deal with the um, body camera footage um, you know, depending on the call involved in an FOI request, um, you, you can have multiple cameras that have to have people's faces um, redacted or blurred out. And that can take a whole day with two officers doing it. Um, so that's an important thing. It also, um, it would free up some of our other officers who are now doing IT support function to do the jobs that they're supposed to be doing as police officers, to be you know the captain of the administrative services, to um, to be a patrol road supervisor, um, get them back out there, actually being police officers. Um, you will see in this budget too some reductions um, based on retirement of um, our administrative captain. Today was his last day. Um, we are going to miss Bob very much. Um, but I'm going to stop there um, because I think this IT support position is um, a big change. And I'm sure you have some questions. And the chief is here to assist in answering them. Um, so any questions? Yeah, this this is another one of those things that I, I, I'm supportive of that. I, I get the whole need for for IT support in a uh, in, in an environment like that. But 
one of the things I worry about is that this is another thing where maybe we would benefit from more uh, just holistic thinking and checking. So, for example, I know Jeff Adams runs IT for the schools and that we get his services to support the town. And then I'm sure that the library's got its own IT director. And here we're going to put in another one in the police department. And I just want to make sure that we're taking, we're, we're asking that background question, which is, okay, we think holistically about the town's IT needs and how all that needs to be coordinated, you know, single point responsibility, consolidated purchasing. I mean, all those types of things that would ensure that we're efficient. Uh, I think that's important. Now, maybe this person is really just a help desk role as opposed to, you know, a system administrator and kind of doing all that. Uh, if it's that, and it's really just about freeing up officers from uh, largely IT support tasks at the department, uh, making sure their phones are working, what have you, I, I think that's okay. But if there's any aspect of this person's role that kind of cuts into something that feels more systems oriented or like a townwide role, I, I'd, I'd question that, but as a general matter, I'm supportive. Okay. I, I, I agree there, I think, and I'm looking at the IT committee that we, um, that we just recently formed and I'm wondering, and I'm sure the chief can answer this, if this person, if, if this job that they will be doing is really, really specific to the police department, or could we, should we be looking at this as a, a more holistically for the whole town, in, in, including um, the Board of Ed people? Well, good evening, folks. It's a pleasure being here as always. Yeah, this is this is more of a position directed toward police department operations. We're not looking to supplant town IT. Our systems hang a lot on their servers, but we need someone that speaks the language with a Jeff Adams so they can handshake and make sure that they are on the same page. Now, as Kate, as Kate mentioned, some of the things that we have here are just completely foreign to other IT type operations, like our our nice recorder for all our incoming phone calls. When we get an FOI request, somebody has to actually go into that system and pull that data out and review it before it can be released. Same with body cam footage, as she mentioned. If, if we're at a, a major scene and we get a, um, we get a request to FOI for body cam footage, that might be five hours worth of footage that we have to watch every minute of it to ensure that we're not releasing information that the state precludes them from releasing. So. It's not somebody that's going to be doing, uh, you know, design of all new servers. It's going to be operational more than anything else for us, but somebody that speaks the language. And, you know, for even our portable radios, we had Lieutenant uh, George Patone here for years and years and years that would program our radios. He was a midnight lieutenant. And he had the computer system to program our radios. He is now retired. We don't have that luxury anymore. Uh, we need radios programmed now. We have to play, pay the rack rate at Northeast Communications, which is substantial for them to work on our, our radios. Uh, Sergeant TJ Moore, who's been here for quite a few years and is our IT supervisor, I believe that he will be setting sail to retirement in the not too distant future. We're not gonna have the luxury of somebody in-house that's gonna be able to do these things. Chief, do you see any corresponding reduction in overtime from other officers? Uh, not, well, we do pay TJ Moore some overtime when our systems crash. And, you know, the, uh, I think this board has probably heard that our telestaff system, which is UKG Kronos, was subject to ransomware for the last six weeks. We've been without our system. Just to point to his technical expertise, the fix, uh, the fix worldwide for the billion dollar company came out of his private company. So that's what we have right now. So, yes, we do pay him some overtime. Uh, to work on these kind of things. Whether or not we could get it all done with a full-time IT professional, yeah, I think that we might get some overtime reduction there if we have a 40-hour employee, a week of employee here doing that. TJ Moore is a road sergeant. He's a road supervisor. He does the IT stuff in addition to his regular duties, and he's willing to do it. I don't, I don't know when he sleeps, actually. <laughs> You know, on the town side, one of the benefits for us would be um, freeing up the member of the RT department that supports the town now. It would get us more time with him because he wouldn't be spending as much time on the police.
Okay. Any more questions on that? Jen, any from uh, commissioners? No, there was one question. If you could just scroll down a little bit, someone had inquired about seeing a fully loaded cost for a position. On all of our position request forms, which are attached in OpenGov, you'll see at the bottom the salary, Social Security benefits, retirement, and then a total cost. Jen, was this cost based on um, the DC plan or the DB plan? Uh, this one, as it's expected to be non-union, is a pension. Okay, um, thanks. Town pension. Okay. All righty. So go back into administration. Um. Slight increase in holiday pay. Um, that's a contractual item. Um, slight decrease in conferences and meetings. Um, here, professional services, you see decrease. Um, we had originally budgeted for anticipated promotional testing um, to happen in fiscal 23, but it's actually going to happen in fiscal 22. Um, so we were able to remove that cost from the next year's budget. Clothing, again, that's contractual. Slight decrease in the cost of uniforms. Um, we didn't have to buy as many Molly vests this year, or we won't have to buy as many Molly vests. Um, <laughs> we're not, we cut the um, budget for prisoner um, meals and food. It's not that we're gonna feed them less. Um, we just have less prisoners um, overnight that, or, you know, at meal times that we have to feed, we're just not keeping them there. Thank you for explaining that. <laughs> um, all right. I'm going to go in alphabetical order just because that's the way it is here. Um, this is the animal control. Um, there is not much, um, going on here. No real change from last year. Slight increase in uniforms, it's $50, though. So, um, that's a contractual item. So, so things like veterinarian bills don't go up as the animals get You old. know, that's a, um, that's a, it's, it's something that's going to fluctuate, depends on um, if we have an animal that we have to pay for or not. This is, um, this is not our, um, canine officers. This is um, think the dog warden. Okay. Okay. Communications. More radios. Pardon? More radios. More radios. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what you see here is um, basically the effect of last year. Um, we had budgeted for the going to the nine officers. Um, our actual original budget was to hire them in January. And then we sought a transfer um, early in the year to speed up the hiring. So what you're seeing here is the impact of going to the full, um, full nine for a full year. Um, you're gonna see an overtime increase here um, with the expectation that we will be at nine civilians. Um, the overtime in the dispatch center will belong to the civilians. We will only be going to police officers um, as a absolute last resort. Um, we will be looking to um, perhaps sign on some per diem dispatchers to um, help with overtime. Um, um, holiday pay, the dispatches are entitled to holiday pay, same as um, police officers based on the fact that they have to work on holidays. And radios, always the radios. Um, sorry, I've just been joined by my four-legged assistant. Um, any questions on communications? Okay. Yes, I have one in the chat. 
Uh, if we are fully staffed in dispatch, why do we have 65,000 in overtime? Yeah, because dispatchers will get sick. They will go on vacation. Um, there will be emergencies where we perhaps need to have more than two in the, in the uh, dispatch center. So um, if we break it down, <clears throat> the assumption is, I don't know if you can read that, um, 90 days of vacation backfill, 45 sick day backfill and 18 personal day backfill plus three emergency storm where we'd have to bring in other people. So nine is basically the, um, the minimum that you need to run 24 seven with two dispatchers on each shift. So there will be overtime. Um, the only way to eliminate overtime would have been to hire another um, dispatcher, which is a much higher cost. And can you explain the term backfill? Backfill, um, meaning to fill a vacancy. So if an officer or a dispatcher rather is um, on vacation or out sick, we need to fill that spot. And then related with the overtime now in civilian dispatch, is there a reduction in police overtime? We will get to the patrol in a bit. That's it. Okay. Next up is fleet services. This is our mechanic. Um, <clears throat> small increase in dollar wise in overtime. Um, in addition to being a mechanic, he does help thing with things like snow removal and other building maintenance things. Uniforms, tires for um, <clears throat> the fleet, they are expecting a price increase, which is the reason for the increase in that budget. Otherwise, um, it's a pretty stable budget. The Detective and Youth Bureau. So, you know, you're seeing a decrease here. That's not that anybody was let go. That's just um, based on changes in who's, who's in there. Um, we are um, reducing over time based on historical data. That was their proposal. That was not me. Um, holiday pay again. Um, this is based on the contract. Um, what we went to a couple of years ago is the officers have the option to choose pay or time off. And so, you know, we have to do every year an estimate of how many will take each um, the various options. Um, equipment rental. What did we? Something is costing us less than it was. The fingerprint machine, I believe. Yes, that's a new reduced rate with the new uh, state supplier of the live scan fingerprints. Okay. And otherwise, oh, this is a new item. The technical investigation unit. Um, this is, if I remember correctly, Don, it's our basically our dues for the um, the computer. I'm sorry, Don. Can you help me out with that one? Sure thing. This is this is our annual participation fee with the state's attorney's technical investigation unit. It involves uh, specially trained investigators from every Fairfield County agency, and they work out of a lab in Weston. These are the investigators that do this part-time, but they do the investigations that are very, very sensitive, mostly involving uh, child pornography and that type of investigations. So it is run by the chief state's attorney for the state of Connecticut. Uh, they're very diligent and they're very highly trained doing very onerous work that we don't like to discuss all that much, but that is a state set fee from the state's attorney's office for our participation in that unit. And it's but, a new fee this year, correct? It's been born out of the alarm fund. Okay. The discussion, I think it just should be part of the operational budget. Um, it's, it's, it is nothing new. We've been part of this, this task force and this technical unit for uh, since the heyday of Chief Lovello. So it's been many, many years. It's just where the money uh, for the participation fee is coming from. Okay. 
Do we have any questions on this budget? Nothing in the chat. Okay. So Chief, that was coming out of the um, the false alarm fund before? Yes, that is correct. So one question that just popped in is why did that change? Uh, through discussion, as I mentioned, that this is an operational expense that will be year after year, that I just think it's more appropriate to be in the operating budget, being that it's an ongoing operational expense for something that the police department uh, unfortunately needs to do on a regular basis. You know, I, I have to agree with that. I don't believe it's something, because it's an operational expense, I don't think we should be um, putting a lot of that thing into the false alarm fund. It should be something that's recognized in, in the tax supported budget. Yes, agree. Okay, going to move to patrol. And so here I'll um, show you, if you take a look, you're gonna see in patrol every officer, their educational stipend step increases every single patrol officer. So this is not all 51, but you know, this is where the bulk of them are. Um, what you will see here, if you go into the detail and scroll all the way down, um, we've made some adjustments and see, <laughs> it's a long way down. Um, made some adjustments to reflect the retirement of some officers. Um, so that's where um, activity you'll see there. Um, That's why the reduction in the um, budget is not a cut in our officers. It's just reflecting the fact that we've had some senior people retire. Um, Over time. The new IT hire was in there, Kate? The, no, the new IT hire was in the administrative. Okay, I thought Okay. That. Um, so patrol over time, I don't know why I can't get this little thing to get out of the way. Um, it's broken up and you can see, <clears throat> it's broken up into the reasons for, um, reasons for the overtime training. We see a lot of training going through here, firearms training. Then we get down to the bottom. Um, there is backfill, there should be backfill for vacation um, in overtime, but um, this, this is the general overtime. This is where, you know, it may not appear to be a reduction, but we no longer have overtime occurring from these officers um, being in dispatch. We also no longer will have officers on regular duty in the dispatch on the midnight tour. Um, so they'll actually be out on the road. Um, that is, let me go back out and see if I can get back in and get rid of those. Okay. Um, there's not a lot, um, special equipment repair, small increase there, operating supplies, um, about $3,000 there. Don't recall if that was anything in particular. Traffic signs, yeah. Um, and these are replacements for our speed sentry signs, for helmet cams. Um, Just on the helmet <clears throat> cams, if I can jump in real quick. That's yeah. for the Southwest Emergency uh, Regional Response Team. Uh, that team, the regional team found out through uh, the state that they are required like every other officer to have body cam or a helmet cam on during all operations. So being that that team is made up of uh, seven or eight different agencies, they didn't want to spare body cam videos. They want to run on one platform, which certainly in my mind is the best case scenario that that video will be available to the Darien Police Department, but it will actually be video of the Southwest Emergency Response Team all on one platform.
Okay. <clears throat> Personal protective gear. Um, buying 16 vests. This is a number that can go up and down. Um, some of it has to do with how many new officers we have, um, how many officers the gear is expiring or, you know, at the end of the useful life. So this is something that will fluctuate from year to year. And because we um, budgeted with the anticipation of several new officers due to retirements, um, you'll see a bit of a cost increase there. Just as a point of reminder for or, or new members of the board, we budget for the full expense of the uh, ballistic armor. However, through the Ballistic Vest Partnership from uh, the Department of Justice, we get 50% reimbursement. We can't count on that from Congress year after year after year, but in, in, the, in the time that I've been doing it, we've always received the 50% reimbursement, although we budget for the entire amount. Um, <laughs> weapons, this is not um, a reduction. It's we don't need the training cartridges for the tasers um, because we, we've got new tasers. And that is the end of patrol. Are there any questions on patrol? None in the chat. Okay. Professional standards? Oh, sorry, just one quick question. It, yeah. In terms of um, salaries, the retirees are in there and the new hires that are replacing the, them should be in there as well? Right, so what you'll see is, um, you might see like, uh, here we have a patrol officer at step five. Um, and if he retired, they're gonna be replaced with a patrol officer at step one. And there's quite a significant difference in the um, rates of pay between step five and step one. So okay. that's where you see down at the bottom um, it's a couple step ones. Well, no, actually, all we did was calculate the difference between the five and the one gotcha. and put it in as a reduction. Gotcha. So, um, yeah, actually, you can see here that 26,000, that's just one going from a five to a one. Gotcha. How many new hires are we looking for? Two? We've had um, Captain Shredders. We have four openings. Sergeant, we, we have four, four openings. One. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And we're going to have additional, you know, openings be, but by the end of this calendar year, I'm quite certain. Yeah, and so what we tried to do was the ones we know, as as we learned about them, um, we reflected um, the changes um, as best we could. Professional standards. This is. Um, their training and education. Um, don't believe there's um, you know, we do have training here. Um, so this wasn't a decrease on my part. This was based on their request. You can see there's a lot of training that they go through. Sarah, are you? Sorry, the dog's barking. Um, quick question for you. Uh, or maybe it's not quick. Um, Chief, we talked last year about the fact that the budgets were starting increasing based on um, response to the police accountability bill. Do we have a, an idea of what this year's budget yeah. has as far as dollars um, in response to that? Well, in the well, when we get to capital, we'll, we'll see a, a request for professional services um, to go over our general orders to ensure that we are in compliance with that. In addition to that, we have budget requests here for mandated mental health assessments that are required for all sworn officers in Connecticut on their three-year replacement cycle and drug testing for 20% of our uh, department. Actually, it's, it's drug testing for recertification cycle and then 20% of our department for the mental health. So that's in there as well. But some of the training, that we're doing is in response, even right. not by, to the letter, but as in response to the police accountability bill to ensure that we are providing best practice and we are up to date on all our general orders to ensure compliance. I just wonder if we should publish that somewhere. D for Kate. I, I... Um, the amount? Yeah, we're doing you it. You know, yeah, Don, if we could work on that and see, you know, like what the, the cost impact is, um, 
we could include that in some of the narrative. I mean, I'm proud of our town chief. You said many times you've already had many of these things in place. I know that you're doing more every year because of it. I'm just curious. And the training that we have to do for, uh, you know, some of these things in, in response to state mandates, some of it we did, it was more codified where we have to do additional, like for human trafficking, for example, is a state mandate that we do human traffic training for all officers every year. So I can certainly get that list of, uh, and put a dollar to it on a yearly, uh, on a yearly basis. Okay. Um, records. There's um, not a lot of exciting stuff happening in records. This is where our software maintenance is. So you can see um, a lot of different packages that the police department use. Biggest thing here is the um, body camera licenses. That's an annual fee? Yes. Wow. It's mainly the storage. Um, Chief, just curious, how long do you have to keep those? Uh, it's all mandated by state statute. Some things like a, a routine traffic stop, if you want to, if there is such a thing where no uh, complaint is filed or there's nothing pending, I think they can go after 30 days. Other things have a 10 year retention cycle. So it all, it's all on a list of how long we have to keep each, each individual case. I think uh, car crashes, I think are typically a couple or three years to ensure that civil suits are not filed. You, and it's kind of on that retention period. Uh, you don't want to get rid of something too soon in case it gets requested, but you don't want to be having the situation where you're retaining data on the cloud for uh, a millennium. So there's a slide. Is that, is that something that the I, the new IT hire would manage? Or is that? Yes, he would, or yes, she okay. would, depending on okay. he or she, yes. So currently it's being done by officers. It's done by the administrative services captain, the IT supervisor and the records uh, officer. We have three people kind of with their thumbs in the pie and they all do a very nice job working together uh, to get it done. But, you know, some days we have a captain and, and maybe the administrative lieutenant or the records officer. All they did for an entire day is watch video and redact. Uh, and we cannot charge under state statute for FOI for time or materials for releasing these things. So it's an expense we have to bear, but that's certainly something I'm looking for the IT person to spearhead and take care of the lion's share of it. Question Thanks. in the chat on that one, Kate. Do we anticipate the double digit increase in maintenance software each year? Oh, um, no, I, I, I sure hope not, but um, we're kind of at the mercy of the software companies. And I always find that the increase in software support generally outpaces um you know other index you know like cost of living index indices um but it's not usually that high um <clears throat> crossing guards um you may not have known this but the crossing guards are town employees. Nothing terribly remarkable there. Hey, can you explain why they're not, why they're town employees not on their board of ed? Nope. <laughs> um, we have looked into it. We've talked a number of times about um, trying to make that a board of ed responsibility. Um, the chief has reached out to his peers and um, the majority of the towns, um, it is a town um, responsibility under the, the police department. Um, why it started that way, I don't know. Maybe because they're generally an extension of the police department. Don, do you know anything? Well, I mean, I could speak to it a little bit. I mean, we would talk about it uh, on the board from time to time as an expense. 
generally as it related to a town expense or an educational expense and obtaining access to the school buildings i think whether it's through roads or sidewalks or police protection is a uh is more naturally a town expense i mean at the end of the day it's all, all of our same tax dollars but uh, i think that's the general uh you know, philosophy. It's the access to getting to the physical plant is more of a town responsibility. If it helps at all, we do get credit when um, when this school files all their expenses and they look at the in-kind services that the town provides on their behalf. We, you know, we do get credit um, for the cost of that. Do they answer to the board, of, to, to the school, or do they answer to the police department? Police department. Okay. Yeah, they answer to the police department. They're trained by the police department. And somewhat unfortunately, when they're out, they are, they are backfilled by a police officer. So on some mornings over the last three weeks, we have had three patrol officers uh, doing school posts because of sickness and COVID and other illnesses on the part of the uh, crossing guards. It's never been a problem about uh, training them or even maybe filling their spot when there's an emergency. It's more about the administrative tasks of trying to find crossing guards, mm. one, and then have the administrative lieutenant gets the phone call in the morning that I'm out ill today, and then the position has to try to be filled with an officer. Uh, something we arm wrestled a little bit with the Board of Ed, but uh, as Kate mentioned, right up on top, uh, I, I conducted a poll of my peers in Connecticut, not just Fairfield County, and the lion's share of them do fund their crossing guards from the town side of the budget and they run through the police department. And you know, we did look at um, outsourcing it and the cost was just astronomical. So we did not go there. Commissioner Hayes can give you that number. He did it again just recently. If I'm not mistaken, it's at least double, if not triple, what we expend for, for crossing guards to ha have it outsourced by a private company. They take the liability insurance. They do the backfilling. They do the overtime. But it is very, very expensive. Okay. Um, last category here is the station operation. Um, <clears throat> so the salaries in this are civilians. Um, we do have a new um, staff member there um, going through steps, which is the reason why you see a slight increase. Part-time salary, same, the opposite. We have a new employee there, so it's a little bit less expensive than it was last year. Um, overtime salary is minimal. Um, they have their own waste disposal, facility repairs, um, and equipment maintenance is ongoing, trying to... Um, keep that building functioning. I think we've got it in a much better place um, with all the different um, systems. Um, Sewer's up 94%. Yeah, I looked at that one and um, it's legit. Um, I looked at, because <laughs> I thought, eh, but I looked at what their actuals were and, and that was legitimate. I did knock their electricity down a little bit based on the actuals, um, but yeah, sewer. Um, and again, heating fuel up a little bit. Um, I do try and look at the actuals and make sure that the numbers are on target with, with what they're doing. Okay, and, and folks, on the sewer use charges, Ed, when oh Ed, yeah. <laughs> Ed comes out a little bit later, he might be able to expound on He's it a on. Bit more. But some of that is our jetter system that we have to install in the sewage pipes because of the ongoing backup that we had time and time and time again. So the DPW graciously installed a jetting system that jets hot water through through the pipes to keep them clean so we're not out there in zero degree weather trying to get our pipes clean. But it space. does increase the flow. Correct. So and we, um, cut it, we cut it back substantially, and <laughs> we had another uh, we had a backup incident last week, so we had to go back on. We're going to try to monitor as we go forward to make it as frugal as we can with extra water going through that system, but we're going to have to keep it operational, especially when it's five degrees like it is today. Yeah, and unfortunately, this was something that was a bad design, and um, we're not going to be able to really fix it. This is the best fix that we can find. How long have we been able to go without a problem? 
uh, we were doing very, very well <laughs> this past winter until this latest one. And because, you know, we did, because of our water use was going up exponentially, we, the DPW looked at it and cut back the water flow. But now they cut it back probably a little bit too much when it's this cold. And that's why we had the issue again. So again, we're going to try to keep watching it and get a happy medium where it's optimal and, and not excessive water, but enough to keep it clear. Okay. All right. Let's go to the Capitol for the police. Do it this way. Look at the six year plan. All right. So small capital, $5,000. Um, put that forward. Vehicle replacement. Um, mm, pull that up. Sorry for the slow connection. So we're replacing two vehicles. Um, one would be undercover. One would be marked. I mean, the second one might be an administrative vehicle. Is it administrative? Because of the fact of the COVID problem, yeah. we basically got two years worth of cars in one fell swoop. So that's why we're not asking for cars. So it's a significant savings in the next fiscal year but it's not going to be sustainable but at least we get a little a little breather a little breather this year we weren't able to get patrol cars for quite some time <clears throat> um okay replacing an aed uh replacing the mdts um this is in both this and the aeds these are ongoing things that have to happen on a regular basis um, as they reach the end of the useful lives. So this is where the next one down, this, um, oh, I'm sorry, not quite there. CCTV system, um, the camera system at the police department is aging and it doesn't cover everything that it should cover. Um, so we would like to replace it, um, get up-to-date equipment and get coverage in all the areas that we need to have it. Um, Okay, Next, is, there, yeah. is there any resale value on what we take out if it's still working? On the cameras? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Um, have to look into that. I think it would be minimal. And when we are replacing CCT, uh, CCTV cameras ongoing now, we are ensuring that the cameras that are put in are, are high def spec where, where in the event we do get funded for a new system that those cameras will be able to plug and play with a new system. And the police commission and I had a quite extensive discussion on this CCTV. The Mars now 11 years old in the building. What really came to, to bear is when we had a young lady vandalize our, poli our police memorial out front and we did not have uh, significant video footage for us to determine who did that. So when we have video lapses of coverage in front of the police department building that that was kind of what drove this discussion okay the um the next item the daigle law the general orders this is um what dom was referring to earlier um to upgrade yeah. the general orders yeah we have we have very smart people here and we've had very smart people here for a lot of years doing our general orders including you know chief lavello who was an attorney who did a lot of them uh, we got a very a lot of people who did a lot of work here but with police accountability uh, we're looking to have an outside company probably the daigle law group who does our a lot of the training for use of force and and that type of thing to look go over our general orders line by line to ensure that we are in full compliance with not just police accountability in the state of Connecticut right now, but to get us set for CALEA certification, what is currently required from the state of Connecticut by 2025. And I think so, in the current Chief, environment. Is, Chief, I'm sorry, this is uh, Mike Burke. Um, do you see that as a, 
potentially an ongoing expense or do you feel like a, like a one pass through and then not much updating after that? I mean, how do you see this going forward as a recurrent expense, if you will? Yeah, I, this this would be a, a not a one time lift, but it will be a one time lift of this expense, and then a a minimal probably review cost every year, uh, only if something comes down the pike that is significantly changed. So I, yeah, I would not I would not envision any type of number approaching this after they go through this and get us ship shape where we need to be. Because I would think there would be some sort of economy of scale as these new policies come out. This law group would be looking at it. It would be the same applicability for every one of their clients. It's not like they'd be reinventing the wheel every year for uh, Darian. They would be doing it for all of their clients, right? And that is true. There, there's no mandate that we take every uh, recommendation that they give us. It is still incumbent upon the department to whether, whether or not our general orders are going to reflect what they tell us. Now, most of the case, smart guys like me defer to smart people like them and we'll do it but it's still kind of up upon us at the end of the day but yes you're right most of these things are going to be streamlined across all their client base which they're not just in connecticut they're across the country as well so chief Thank along you. with that they offer a this same group offers a video training program um that that is um matched up with this did you consider adding that request uh, I could check with TJ White. I believe we get that component with our Power DMS that we uh, use. They're partner with Daigle Law Group, so we do uh, video training with them quite often. Okay. okay. Um, next one was the drone. And if you remember a couple nights ago, we talked about um, that our emergency management director um, saw the drone. Um, the police department did as well. Um, you know, be useful <clears throat> in searches, rescues, crowd monitoring. We have an officer who is certified um, to fly drones, which is um, a necessary step. Um, the chief has indicated that he would be happy to um, share the use of the drone with other departments, you know, where they need it. Um, you know, so for emergencies, um, possibly for the building department. Um, so I think this is, <clears throat> it's time to, um, to go forward with one of these. So chief on this one, your quote is three thousand dollars less than the um, emergency management system quote. Did you are are you um, just a better negotiator? <laughs> I would defer to Captain Marin on that one. He's doing the he's doing the drone oversight, but he he, he can squeeze a nickel pretty good as well. Uh, I I know he did he we went and did a lot of research from a lot of different agencies as to what we thought we would need and those uh -huh. are the numbers he came up with. And these prices are going down all the time. They're not going up. If this was funded, I would hope that we could bring it in at that number or less by the time it was funded. And to Kate's point, thankfully, we, we don't have a town where we would be running a drone every day. So we do need some utility for our drone operator to have time on those gimbals. So he's ready to go when we do have an emergency. Hence, he can work, you know, mutually with planning and zoning or fire department you know, maybe not maybe not available 24 7 but certainly on a, on a you know combined effort when they need that so i, I think it's a win-win for us yeah there was definitely a lot of demand for this from other departments coincidentally all this year and i know last year also so um Sounds, sounds like a program that's time has come. Yes. You know, someday in the in the Jetsons future, some police departments are already dispatching drones to, to calls for service. They're not even dispatching an officer. There's California agencies that are dispatching a drone first and they get on scene to see if officers are needed there and if, if they are, what type of uh, 
officers mm -hmm. needed. So I would think at some point in this building, you'll see some, time, uh, some kind of drone heliport on our roof where we'll be able to deploy drones right here from the police department. So how, how many people do you think should be qualified to operate it in the police department? Well, right now we need to start with one, right? Okay. I mean, at some point in the future, I would, I would see that we could probably use a second one, but we have to walk before we run here and make sure that we're doing it right. So being that we don't have any drone now, one would, for the foreseeable future, I think would be sufficient. Oh no, I'm not saying drones. I'm saying how many people should be trained to operate it? Um, I'd like to see at least one other, um, you know, maybe somebody in the emergency management services. Yeah, in the town, we should certainly have more than one. Yeah, that was my question. So if another department needs to use it, how do they hire the police officer to manage it? Where does that funding come from? Yeah, well, that would be, you know, so that would be a reason for having another um, another employee trained so that if the police officer is not on duty, we do have somebody else who would be able to um, use the drone and not have to bring them in on overtime. think oops um the last item there was uh i did not fund wait oh, i'm sorry wait. didn't rifles, fund there are two rifles. more the rifles the rifles i funded that's an ongoing um, replacement program um the idea is that every officer um should have an assigned um rifle um so that's an ongoing pro program and then uh, landscaping. Um, I'll pull up the description. I didn't fund it. Um, it's one of those. It's a little was a little hard, you know, when I was cutting other areas um, to deal with uh, landscaping. So this was to um, make the building look the grounds um, more attractive appearing. Um, they've gotten a little bit overground, so um, the police department doesn't have the staff that can maintain it. Well, I took a look, and I think it's more than a little overgrown, and I think it's a lot of poison ivy, and I think it's um, not manageable for the current maintenance. And if I'm seeing correctly, I think it's a pretty... Chief Anderson, how large of an area are you looking at working on here? Uh, the the overall request is for two different spots. The main spot that's of most concern for me, and I'll explain why, is the hill on the west side of our building. Uh, it's where the parking lot abuts against the, the Nielsen property in the back. It's probably between 15 and 20 feet wide, and it's probably 175 feet long. Now, when they did plantings to buffer the building behind us, they planted coniferous trees, they planted different kinds of shrubs and bushes, but it's a hill. It does not really conducive to mowing the lawn around them. So what happens is it looks like it's an abandoned brownfield there during the summer. And we have people out there trying to pull the poison ivy and then they get poison ivy. So I'm looking for that side of the building to get some kind of uh, plastic down and some kind of trap rock or, or gravel to keep that almost not maintenance free, but certainly much more maintenance, less intensive uh, for our people especially during COVID the last couple of years, they've been running ragged on the inside of the building trying to keep it clean. Now in the front of the building, Parks and Rec for years was very, very nice to us and they took unbelievable care of the front of our building. They almost looked like Augusta National out there. They were detailed to another location and they could not do our building anymore. We just don't have green enough thumbs to take care of some of the plantings that are out there. And three times this year, I've had people contact me and one lady actually walked into the lobby and demanded to talk to the chief and she was very nice. And she said, chief, I cannot believe what the front of your building looks like. I have three three things in my car and I have a shovel and I want to plant these plantings in the front of your building because it looks like the front of your building is abandoned. So again, we're not looking for Augusta National we were, you know, for this request. We're just looking for a presentable low maintenance you know, grounds and physical plant. 
be more than happy to take the uh, Parks and Rec folks back if we can, you know, twist some arms to get them here. I'd like to reconsider this project. <clears throat> okay. Um, that <laughs> is the end of um, the police department budget. If um, anybody has further questions on either the operating or the capital requests. We do have one additional question on the drone. Um, yep. Regarding drone footage, is it similar to body cam where it would need to be saved, available for court, FOIable, and would there be any additional storage costs for that data? It would be FOIable. It would be subject to retention for most, uh, you know, criminal or, or uh, emergency events, yes. I don't foresee that storage costs would be all that much. I think we can probably get that in our Taser uh, Axon recording platform. If not, we can put that on a standalone server here. At, at worst, and we hope we don't have to use the drone too often, it would be a once a week type event. And I don't even think it would be that much. But uh, I don't. I think expenses for data retention for that drone would be, would be fairly small. It should be minimal. Small. Most of it probably can stay on the SD card that comes out of the drone and may not even have to be downloaded onto a server. Okay. That's We're it. good. All right. I just, I just have one thing to add, if I can, just as a point of order. I, I take very, very little uh, credit for crafting this budget. Uh, as Bob Shredders, as, he, as they mentioned, Bob Shredders retired today. I have, I'm lucky to have numerous right hand men and women here. So, Captain Jeremiah Marin and Lieutenant Ali Hadema and Lieutenant T.J. White, they all really carry the lion's share of crafting this budget and giving me everything I need to get this done. And I just want to give them kudos. I appreciate the hard work that they do trying to bring forth a, a reasonable, you know, understandable and defendable budget, which I think we do year after year. Anybody who might be listening that's not on the board who thinks otherwise, please, you know where to find me. I'm always happy to have that discussion. Thank you, Chief. Okay. Thanks, Don. Okay. We will head back over to operating and to public works. And I saw Ed join the meeting a while back, so he's here to help add to any um, any things that I can't give you enough on. <clears throat> Start with management and engineering. This is the administrative function. Sorry. What am I doing there? Um, so in the full-time salary, just to give you a flavor, what we do here is we allocate the salaries of the staff um, to various functions. So uh, you'll see percentages next to their um, descriptions. So uh, depending on each person's function, they may also have a, a portion of their salaries allocated to the sewer fund or the parking operations fund. So there's no changing in staff there. Um, we do bring in seasonal and temporary to assist with the dump permit season. <clears throat> um, so you see a slight increase in there, but reduction in overtime. The rest of the budget is for this section is pretty unremarkable, no significant changes. Um, if there are no questions, on that area. Um, gonna go to um, let's see. Ah, I went out back too far, sorry. Um We'll go to parking operations. Um, 
this is for the town owned lots okay as opposed to the state owned lots so this is leroy west and the center street lots and uh grove street so uh what you're seeing here is salary reduction this is um not a reduction in personnel it's a function of um having a new employee in the last year overtime is up um and that's based on what this employee has been doing for us um it's based on snow and maintenance work um right now we've been having this employee um open the train station um it used to be done by a vendor um that managed the um what do you call it the um you know like a little coffee and news station um, we no longer have a vendor um so we've been having an employee go to open the the um the station up early which is costing us an overtime we are looking into getting remote locks um so that the doors could be open and shut um remotely and save us in overtime um professional services these are credit card fees. I will say we are looking at um, changing our software for the permit processing, uh, which may allow us to reduce this in the future. Um, we do hire outside services to help plow the lots. That's what that number is for. And then facility maintenance, this is for the, the station. Um, <clears throat> for the light posts, um, signs and materials. Kate, yep. is the um, software for the payment, is this all a part of a conversation of the right systems that we should be using as far as, you know, payment systems for everything? Well, um, yes and no. Um, it really started as um, being unhappy with the um, some of the things that we could do with the, the current provider, um, looking to go to a system that would allow us to get rid of the hang tags but still allow for um, permit holders to have more than one vehicle on a permit um, and to integrate our enforcement with our um, permits and daily paying. So that's where it started. Um, public building management, this is um, the expenses of the facilities. Uh, this is town hall and um in the garage so the salaries you see here are the custodians for the town hall uh, slight reduction in overtime security services we've had to get a new um a new system um which is causing an increase Um, slight increase in repairs. It is an old building. Um, we are ticking up in electricity a little bit here. Um, and the sewer, sewer going down a little bit and the heating fuel going down a little bit. Yeah, that, that's correct, both of them. One was a five-year average, the one for the heating fuel. We were pretty steady in this building right now since we had the systems up upgraded as far as the uh, building maintenance system um just for the water use that that, that water use had uh made a, a um a slight reduction it wasn't much and then you see that in the uh the sewer building um so i'm gonna go to the big budget here this is where ed predicts how many snowstorms we're going to have Um, so, you know, if you take a look into the salary, you're going to see um, how we break down all the employees, uh, similar to the police department, just not as many, but you'll see all these positions um, broken down, all that detail for you. No head count change there. <clears throat> um, we do, again, bring in some seasonal employees to help out. Overtime salary, 
Um, so this is where, you know, here's our prediction. Seven storms at time and a half, 11 at double time. Um, and then the other kind of overtime that we do. Um, slight increase in traffic marking and paving these ed just materials costs. That's that's correct, Kate. I think with the last um, issue with storms that we've had, um, there have been requests and, and um, viable requests to change or add basins, and so we evaluated that. So I put some additional money in for some drainage parts, catch basins, piping, so that we can uh, implement some of those changes in the springtime, or in, in, I'm sorry, in July, after, just before we do the paving. Okay, and you can see we do a lot of work on tree maintenance. Um, we do as much as we can every year within the budget. Um, street light maintenance, you know, a few years ago we bought the street lights. Um, so we've been able to reduce our costs um, in terms of maintenance, looking at the amount of um, coverage of service we have to provide and the cost of the repairs. Um, gasoline prices um, have gone up. Um, so we're taking a bit of a hit there. <clears throat> and then heating fuel has stayed pretty stable. Um, tires, this is one of those, as you see in some other departments, where it can go up and down and it depends on the, um, the which tires we have to buy each year. Um, this is a non-loader year. The loader tires are the expensive ones. I've learned that over the years. And then salt and, well, not, I was gonna say salt and sand, but this is um, the salt um, that we buy for the snow removal. Any questions there, Sarah? No question, but I just wanted to say, Ed, I'm not sure where to put this, but thank you again for keeping our roads in good shape. This weekend's another fine example of your team always out there. Seems to be out there 24 seven. So thank you very much. Thank you, I appreciate that. Hey, I have a question on the tree maintenance. So Ed, the 5,000 you have in the capital for tree maintenance, that's something that's replacement and this is more um, pruning and removal. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's correct. Okay. Okay, and then is this where you have paint for the um, for the streets? Yep, traffic marking, the double yellow lines. And crosswalks, right? Yep. And I, I, I can't believe I'm gonna say this, but you budgeted enough for that, right? For, for painting crosswalks, even the right. new ones? <laughs> Just because I know we didn't get um, we didn't get to some last year, and it's always a hot topic, yeah. And I know costs have gone up, so um, I, I will make that work for us to okay. do paint. As long as I can get paint, we will paint. Okay. Any other questions on the roads? Okay. <clears throat> um, the last item in its public works operating budget is waste management. Um, so it represents two employees. Overtime is, uh, it, you know, it's up a little bit um, because of the schedule. Um, one of our employees is regularly scheduled to, um, his regular days are Saturdays. So um, we do have to have um, <clears throat> more coverage here for vacation days or sick days. Professional services. This is our credit card processing fees for the um, dump permits and scale fees. 
We are talking to um, our software provider for the permit system to begin um, passing those credit card fees onto the consumers. So we may be able to do away with um, charge there in the budget. Um, solid waste disposal fees. This is exactly what it sounds like, but it's broken down. You can see all the different um, types of costs. Um, Ed, is there anything you want to highlight there or? I'm going to mention how we have more garbage these past two years during COVID. That's probably the, the biggest uh, item that I have absolutely no control over. Um, but it's the, the other hit that we did take, Kate, and it's shown in the budget is we hit a 4% CPI increase, which a lot of our rates are tied to in our contract with city carding. So that's more of a reflective in that number of 26 grand going up. Um, and we're still seeing a, a, a slight increase in over last year in the uh, MSW that we're getting at the transfer station site right now. Um, gonna take a look at it uh, when we get our reports back for January in a week and uh, see what the trends are. See if it's starting to slow down a little bit. Okay, and household hazardous waste is up significantly. <clears throat> um, was that strictly a number of participants or was it the fees going up? We, we had to get a new vendor. <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> the vendor that we had for quite a few years um, uh, got in trouble with the federal government, so we <laughs> could no longer use them. And in doing that, uh, the new vendor that came in pretty much doubled his prices. Um, that's the increase that you're looking at right now. Okay, and then we have some decreases in telecommunications. It's just getting better rates on cell phone plans and operating supplies down slightly. Um, but generally a pretty stable budget. Just want to mention, Kate, that telecommunications, we have a fiber optic line that we use, and I, I was just happened to talk to Selena about this today. Um, they gave us an option of paying it at the beginning of every fiscal year um, and saving $100 a month on it. That's the credit you're seeing right there for $1,200. So we took that option this year, thought it was a good plan, gonna try to do it next year also. Okay. Okay, any questions on the um, solid waste or other public works operating? Hey, can we go into revenues? Yep. Wait, before we do that, Kate, Ed, where um, where is street sweeping? Where does that what what um, account is that under? It's under the roads. Under, it's right. on the roadways. It's um, generally in our overtime account. We hit the downtown areas, or we hit the downtown area every Thursday, um, first thing in the morning from uh, four to seven. Um, unless it's snowed or the inclement weather or, or like right now, we wouldn't do it right now until it starts to melt. But that's our original. And then rest of the time periods, uh, we designate days during the week to go out and street sweep. So that you wouldn't see it anywhere in a budget or a line item other than the overtime for the downtown areas um, when, uh, when we like to keep them clean for the use down there springtime, summer and the fall. Yeah, I'm just thinking for flooding is um, is the ten times is it, would would more street sweeping help with keeping the culverts clear? I I think we do a great job keeping the streets clear and the catch basins clear, and I think we we make a, a conscious effort to go to our what we call our hot spots or our low spots that have a tendency to flood to make sure that not only the basin tops cleared, but the basins themselves are clear and ready to be used. And Ed, during a flood, how much of the stuff that gets onto the street does not originate in the street, but comes out of people's um, private property and you know ends up flowing down the street and clogging the drains? I, I, I have to say a, 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 the majority of it does. If we, we've done our job and the streets are clear, a lot of the stuff that sits on top of those basins at the end of the storm have come from side properties or side streets or driveways. Um, I, I got to say that we we do a very good job of cleaning these basin tops. And I, I, I'll be the first one to say, though, are we perfect? No. But we make an every attempt during these storms when they're coming to make sure that the areas that we know that flood on a regular basis are ready for the storm that's coming. Thank you. 
Okay, okay. Before we go to revenues, we have two questions on waste management expenditures. Okay. How about it? Is the single stream recycling contract expires in June 2024? Any update on the status of extending it? Should we expect it to make to remain profitable? Um, my question. You know, you know what I don't have in front of me is my calendar, but I, I have a a meeting set up. Um, we had this meeting set up a, or two weeks ago, um, and we met with um, the new gentleman that's running our area from City Carding, and uh, we started the conversation already with regards to renegotiating the contract some items that we wanted to talk to them about with specifically, you know, getting better rates for them. We are targeting to continue to have recycling as uh, generating a positive revenue. Uh, that's- That's phenomenal. Um, that's that's our goal. I mean, that's our, that's our starting point and uh, we're waiting for, to hear back from him. He stressed to us that they'd like to get started negotiating this before the time runs out. And I stressed to him that I liked his thinking. So we're gonna we're gonna continue to push that forward and see if we get something settled. You know, it's gonna take a little bit of time, but hopefully within the next year. This time we're talking about the fact that we've already uh, locked everything in. Thank you, Ed. Sure. Okay, and then the other question is: um, I heard that City Carding was purchased. Can you confirm that? And does the purchase of City Carding have an effect on our existing or future contracts? Um, they were. There's a there's a company out of uh, this gentleman's out of Texas. There's their main office is out of New New Hampshire. They're still calling them City Win. I think it is. I just use City Carding so you folks know what I'm talking about. Um, it doesn't affect our current contract. The con contract still holds. Um, the negotiating is is still the same. Um, still have to determine how we're going to go forward with the scope of work that we've given this company that's purchased uh, the City Carding old contract. Okay, I'm going to revenues now. Um, Sarah, did you have a particular revenue you were interested in? I think Ed answered it. I was just curious about the recycling contract. I know we had talked a couple years about the fact that it was going to be coming, so I'm, he's already answered it. Okay, all right, then we'll go to capital for the Public Works Department. <clears throat> <laughs> so this is one of our biggest um, capital items. Sidewalks. Yeah, so um, starting off, replacing one of the, the, um, the trucks at $225,000. Um, this is part of the change from, uh, you know, what the Board of Finance had done a number of years ago where um, they, they got rid of the vehicle replacement funds. Um, so now we see them um, on an indiv individual basis. Um, so this is one of the large trucks. Um, then the next ones up you'll see are sidewalk rehab and new sidewalks. So. <clears throat> We're looking at $120,000 for new sidewalks, $750,000 for sidewalk rehab. Are there any questions on either the sidewalk um, projects? Okay, yes, uh, this is Mike. Uh, for $120,000, how many miles or feet of sidewalks are that, and how did you make the determination of where they will be placed? Ed, you're on mute. Ed? Yes. You Okay, I was gonna say. <laughs> this uh, is you, this is all you. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, no, I got this. Um, so for, let's first of all make a determination of where. I get a lot of um, input from residents on where we should and should not put new sidewalks, um, where they're needed, where, where there's a high traffic area, and I, I evaluate those locations. Um, we have a, a nice um, matrix of uh, evaluating, you know, anything from need, use, construction, uh, permitting, right, right down to, you know, is there uh, um, uh, 
high expenses that putting the sidewalk in would cost. So that's one way. And the second way is things that I observe out there in the field of people using our town where mm -hmm. I think uh, there's a piece of sidewalk that may be missing. Um, so the, this 120 is going to cover, you know, a, approximately, I'd say about 400 feet of concrete curb and sidewalk. Um, this is designated for one location over on Kingsall, uh, Old Kings Highway North from the Boston Post Road to I-95 Bridge. It is a portion of sidewalk that's going to allow um, uh, a contiguous sidewalk from the Post Road all the way to East Lane. Um, that section up on East Lane to the on-ramp for I-95 is going to be done by a private developer. So this was our um, portion that we're going to take responsibility and then we'll have a completed section all the way down. The other piece of it is on Heights Road from the Neroden Heights uh, parking lot up to um, Neroden Avenue on the south side of Heights Road. There's a section in there that actually needs, it's, it's just missing. It needs it, people don't cross over. Sometimes I see them walking um, in the gutter line along that guardrail, it's not safe. Uh, it's the same thing I did over at Post 53. Ended up putting a nice sidewalk from the Roten Avenue all the way down to the parking lot. Um, I see that used quite often now. So um, just another piece that I noticed out there. Is um, is it possible at some point to uh, share that matrix? Is there a, is that a working document? It's uh, it's public information. You can always look at it. I can always give it out there. I've okay. provided for people that have asked to look at it before. Uh, terrific. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to see it. Sure. Okay. Anything else on sidewalks? Uh, question from the chat. Will most sidewalks be blacktop or cement? That answer is yes. <laughs> it depends. Um, I, I try to be con consistent with the policy that we had, and I think my predecessor put in place, which is actually a pretty good, because we've got a pretty good system, everything around our schools, post road, um, you know, state highways, um, major arteries, all called for concrete sidewalk. I try to be consistent. If it's a concrete sidewalk that's in place, there's a missing portion, I'll put back the, the, the concrete or asphalt, depending on which one it is. Um, but I try to be consistent with the policy of, uh, of what Mr. Steger had put in place, so I thought was a very good one. Um, and very consistent throughout town, he was, um, just trying to keep up with that model. Okay, <clears throat> moving on, the next um, item is a very large one, paving, $1.2 million. This is for resurfacing um, of roads. Ed, how many miles? Does it get us? 6.3. Yes. And just for reference, how many miles do we have in town? Uh, 81. Okay. Do we have any questions on the paving? Uh, one from the chat. With petroleum reaching highs, has that affected the mileage we will be paving next year? Um. It, it, it could, it, it's impacted our fuel purchasing costs right now. I always see that the asphalt prices, the liquid asphalt prices lags behind the gasoline and diesel price increases. Um, but uh, I've already factored in an increase into my spreadsheet for paving for next year. Um, it could, it, it should be okay, but it could be a little bit low, but I'll, if it's, if I miss shot that, I'll end up not maybe not doing a road or two. But uh, as of right now, I, I think I'm in a good place with the estimate. Okay, um, next we have the town hall gymnasium upgrades. Um, just gonna shoot back to the um, explanation. We've been working on um, upgrading the windows and this has been an ongoing project. We have rotted sills, we have flashing that needs to replace, um, planning to tint the windows to help with the overheating of the, um, of the space in there. So it should be a cost um, 
reduction as well. Um, and it's important to um, continue this project and finish it up. What are the uses of the gym and who uses it? A lot of people. Parks and Rec, I would say, is probably our biggest user. They run a lot of programs in there. Um, we ran all the COVID clinics in there, um, the elections, um, uh, use it as a polling place. The um, Mather Center, the senior programs rather, have used it. Um, they have activities, they have pickleball um, programs in there. Um, and the Youth Commission uses it for, um, for various events, for, um, for dances. Um, and then we do rent it um, to other agencies. Got it, thank you. Do we see an end date on the window project? Yes, <laughs> we do. Um, I believe next year would be the, I'm sorry, 24 would be um, the end date. It's been going on for a while. Yeah, there's a lot of windows. Yeah. Yeah, 2024 would be the end. Uh, what I did with that, Sarah, was I, I divided up this, the gym because I can only work in one section at a time and still keep the gym accessible for others to use. So I've been trying to do the two ends first and then I have the sidewalls by the small gym to do. Um, and that's kind of where, how I broke it up. Okay, the next item here, um, $75,000 for repairs to 701 Boston Post Road. If you're not familiar with uh, what that is, it's the small historic um, building that's in front of the Royal. It's where the paramedics are housed. And uh, again, we need to replace windows. We need to replace um, sills. Um, this is something that I did suggest could be a good project for the ARPA funds. Any questions on that one? Okay. Um, you'll see I did not put forward resurfacing the post 53 lot. Um, it was medium priority and um, something I felt could be delayed. Once again, I've pushed off remodeling room 206. Um, I would like to get that done at some point because I feel that room is um, it's old. It's not, the dais is not handicapped accessible, but um, not a high priority item. Um, next is resurfacing the gym floor. Uh, it needs to happen periodically. Um, then we have at the transfer station, replacing the um, the driveway and curb. If I got that right, driveway curb. Um, it's gonna pull up the description. Um, this has come up in the past and we've delayed it. Um, and I think just for um, safety reasons, um, it's time to, um, to replace it. Um, it's been damaged over the years. Um, so I think it's, it's been put off for a number of years. So I decided, you know, with this one, I think it, it, it's time to get done. Um, and it's a big ticket number, but I think if you go over there and you take a look, you'll, you'll see that it's really, um, you know, it's two parts. One is replacing all the curbing, which is asphalt. So it's going to be replaced with cement. And you can see the asphalt is, you know, they're just chunks um, that are um, misplaced and it definitely needs paving. Okay, any questions on that one? All right. And then the last two items, um, tree replacement, which is exactly what it sounds like and something that we do on an ongoing basis. And then small capital, which you, you've seen in a number of the, the departments, it's just to cover some small capital items, um, just a $5,000 ongoing allotment. So any questions on public works capital or operating before we go to sewer. <clears throat> Kate, um, Kate, I'm sorry, go ahead. Jen. Yeah. One question on an out year pro 
project. Heights Road drainage upgrades are scheduled for 2024 rather than this year, or rather than 2023. Given the severe flooding in this area, should this be a 2023 project? The improvements had have more to do with um, getting the flows down to the pipe itself. It's the um, structures that are there right now need to be replaced, but not in their entirety. And, and my thought is I can't do just one little piece. I need to do the parking lot also to upgrade the structures that they were all tying into. That was a big piece of the 150 is fixing and um, replacing a lot of the catch basins with larger structures. And it doesn't do me any good. I'm still tying into the parking lot drainage into the back of a lot of them. So I need to do it uh, alongside and, and in conjunction with the parking lot um, drainage um, project. And we're still waiting on the state for permission for that, correct? That's correct. Okay. Sounds like we have a meeting with them about that. I say sounds like they're gonna mix it together with the pipe culvert under I-95 project on Wednesday. Um, I'm gonna to try to get to that, you know, be part of that meeting. I, the mediation is um, overlapping that same um, meeting with the DOT. So we'll, we'll see, but Darren will be there. I just, I wanted to be involved also. Okay. All right, last call on public works. So Kate, right. is this where I asked for the drone? <laughs> No? Okay. No, no. I'll just have Don. Don will have you to. You just talk to know, Don. Let me, let me yeah. use this. Okay. Going to move to the sewer operating. So first thing, just a reminder on the sewer operating that this is a self-supporting fund. It does not um, draw on the property taxes. So in sewer administration, if you recall back in public works, we talked about um, some of the salaries being allocated. So this is where you'll see some of them. Um, there is one account clerk who is uh, fully charged to this, this budget. Um, over time, we are increasing that, um, finding more of a need for the staff to, to work overtime on sewer issues. That is the administrative staff. Um, Reduction in clerical services, that's for um, leave minutes for meetings. That was not my reduction, that was proposed. Um, printing, $700 increase there, you know, looks significant. This is about um, price increases in the, um, the forms for sewer bills. And, you know, we do send some out for billing collection. Um, there's cost to that, software costs, um, minor increase there. They do pay the, uh, for the tax software that's used for collect for the billing. Um, but overall, not a large increase in that budget. Uh, should not be any Okay, so there are some revenues associated with that. Um, primarily interest on past due accounts. And then we'll go to um, overhead miscellaneous. Um, this is expenses that the sewer fund has to pay for insurance, um, employee benefits. Um, so you're seeing the same kind of things um, that have hit in, um, in the general fund. Uh, liability insurances, medical insurance, um, life insurance and disability. Um, you know, you might see different rates of change here, and that all has to do with the personnel and um, in different coverage levels. Um, we do have um, some money set aside. Um, there are employees in this but in this department who are um, in unions that have open contracts.
um, collection so this is our sewer crew no change in headcount very stable budget not a lot of change here at all um, minor increases this is where the bulk of the revenues come in this is the sewer user fees and then we'll go back out to the most fun line item This is the biggest one. These are the fees we pay Stanford to treat our sewage. And Ed, I don't know if there's anything interesting to tell us about it this year. No, I, I think that just about covers it right there. <laughs> okay. Does anybody have questions on the sewer operating? Ed, were our sewer user fees increased this year? Yeah, that's... Um, 2.9%, I believe it was. Yeah, so the, you know, the interesting thing, we'll tell, you know, when the budget is developed and we tell them um, what the revenues should be, it is up to the sewer commission to establish the rates. So, you know, they're going to get the number that, you know, this big number, the 4.1 million, that's, but it's up to them to set the rate. So let's go find the sewer capital. Okay. So not a lot of exciting stuff. Ongoing maintenance of the, um, of the system. Collection system rehab, root control, replacing of the pumps. These are things that um, we've been doing every year and equipment replacement reserve. Um, that I'll oh, see what that is to replace one of the, the vehicles which is 12 years old so um, I'm going to bring up the six-year plan show them all at once and if anybody has any questions on any of the sewer capital Any questions on sewer capital? Okay. No. All right. We're going to go to parking. Yeah, I do. I have one question on on sewer. And yep. you do you do um, the camera work each year, and you do about eight miles. Um, is and we have eighty some miles, right? Is, yeah, yeah, those. 80, 81 miles of uh, sanitary sewer. Right. So you're estimating it'll take 10 years to do all of the camera work? Mm, that's correct. And then we start again. Well, at that, at that point, you hope you've identified <clears throat> areas that you don't have to go back and do as heavily. Um, other areas you may want to do more frequent. I think that's what the, the first pass gives you. And then the the second go around that the uh, CMOM program allows you to make some judgment calls on where you need to go back and spend more time looking others where you can wait two or three cycles before you go back again. Um, I'm going to start in parking lot administration here. Um, 
So again, these are the state-owned lots. So that's Neroten Heights in the Darien, the two stations or two lots on either side of the train station in that little uh, Leroy East, um, the one that's tucked in between the Coons lot and the train tracks. Um, this, the bulk of this is the salary of our parking administrator, who's also the town hall receptionist. Um, some slight overtime for her during peak permit collection or permit renewal time. Um, professional services is um, software fees, mailing, nothing terribly remarkable here. Um, I keep doing this wrong. Okay, this is the one that I want to make sure that everybody sees. <clears throat> um, this is the parking crew and parking operations. So uh, the thing is what you're seeing here last year, we had budgeted for basically one and a half. We, we had had for um, two parking rangers to manage the enforcement and the maintenance of the, the properties. Um, last year, based on the um, utilization of the lots, I had proposed that we um, we had a vacancy and I proposed that we not fill the vacancy until January. Um, the utilization continues to be off dramatically. The revenues cannot support two full-time employees. So that's what you're seeing here is the elimination and of um, one of the parking rangers um, because there's a vacancy right now in the public works department, I expect it to be done through attrition, um, but the parking fund cannot support two full-time employees at this time. Um, there is overtime obviously with, related to maintenance of the lots. And like I said, opening up the, um, the station at this time, um, professional services, that's credit card fees. Um, again, if we can change our software, that may go away. We do have some money in there for platform training. Um, and snow removal, uh, I reduced it um, based on our, um, our historic actuals. So that's the big change there. Um, wanted to call your attention to that. Um, otherwise, there's not a lot of changes in the budget. Um, although heating fuel is up and that's, you know, over the current year and that's based on going in for more utilization of the stations. Um, this is the other thing to highlight, again, because the revenues are down, uh, the amount that we can afford to transfer to the capital fund has to go down. Um, the other area impacted by um, the change in staffing would be the um, employee benefits. So you'll see reductions here as well. Okay, hey, now snow removal. We hire an outside um, contractor? Yes. Okay. We don't have the capacity through DPW? Um, no, I, I don't think we do. Um, we do have, we do do some of the work like the sidewalks um, and the platforms. Okay. okay, some of the smaller storms we'll do ourselves. <clears throat> there, you'll see a year in there where we probably didn't even use it, the vendor one time and we had 11, 12 storms. So if they're manageable and the guys haven't been working 12, I mean, I'm sorry, haven't been working 18, 24, 30 hours, we'll put the guys in the parking lots and we'll clean the parking lots ourselves. Um, it just really depends on the size of the storm that we're getting. Okay, and this is the revenue side. And what I wanna um, point out to you here, the permits are not the issue. People have renewed their permits. Um, it's the daily parking is off and the parking tickets are off. So our, um, and you know, the, the daily parking is the bigger part of our, our revenue. So 
Um, hopefully, at some point, it will come back. Um, but right now, it's, it's just not there. How does and paving so, of those uh, parking lots get handled? <laughs> um, out of this, out of um, where we're going next, parking capital. And um, you ask that, and the sad reality is that's um, what we're not doing. Um, Ed had hoped to be able to transfer enough in there that we could um, resurface the Neroten Heights South lot, the um, side by the highway, and we just can't. We don't have the revenue right now to support it. And all of the capital projects for the rail, the station, all that comes from revenues as opposed to being included in just a normal town capital project and bonded. Yes, um, you know, remember these these are the state owned lots. Um, right. So, um, the lease that we had that expired ten years ago, um, but it's, so it's still the one that's in operation. Um, that calls for us to basically um, put all the result of operations into back into the stations, whether through operations or through capital improvements. Um, could the town ever choose to pay for work in these stations out of um, general fund revenues? Yeah, you know, we could. Um, that would be a departure from past practice. Okay. That lot's in pretty bad shape. Yeah, I think that's why Ed wanted to resurface it. Um, you know, it's just, um, well, the funding's not there. Um, we could take, uh, you know, we could take a look at um, other products that are planned there and the money's already in there and you know do we re reallocate it but okay okay so any other questions on parking okay that's it Sarah Kate okay. yeah. where's Edgerton Say that again? Where are we putting Edgerton? What do you mean by putting Edgerton? So we, we put some money into the lot to clean it up. Um, if it falls under the Board of Selectmen, which budget would oh, the maintenance um, or any work, where does yeah, that fall? sure. I thought maybe it would be Public Works, but I'm not entirely sure, so. Yeah, it was Public Works. Um, okay. I didn't catch it then. It was, well, but that was last year. Right. Um, so. We spent 74. We budgeted, let's see, where are we? 75. Yep. And then I did, you know, we had talked about maybe at some point doing something with it. I didn't know if there was a plan or. A... Well, the 75 was to remove Clean the asphalt that... and concrete and take down the dead trees. And um... maybe it wasn't pub put in public works. No, it was put in public works. No, Jen... it was uh... last year. Uh, might be general government. Okay. Jen, do you recall? The Edgerton Capital should be in Public Works for 2022. Okay. I think it was 75,000. Okay, so there's nothing in for 2023. There's nothing to do anymore. Okay, there it is. Got it. Yeah. Okay, so that's last year's. There's nothing to do right now. There's Correct. nothing on the table for next year. Okay. Correct. That's what I'm looking for. Thank you. Okay, um, that was all we had planned for the evening and that pretty much wraps up the budget. Um, I'm coming back here at seven o'clock tomorrow and um, you really need to start talking about what you wanna do, um, if anything. You know, are there things you wanna add back? Are there things you wanna cut um, and really start getting that discussion going tomorrow night. Hey, you, you've been keeping a running tally, right, of things that we've discussed? Well, Jen has. Jen, do you think you can send it out 
tomorrow morning so that people can take a look at it? Yeah, I can send that out. I mean, honestly, there's not much yet. There have been a couple of, gee, let's look at this or that, but um, it's not a very lengthy list at the moment. Okay. And we do have, um, we do have information on the grand list. Um, there was some good growth, um, about 1.87% growth in the net grand list. Um, of course, we lost some of our non-tax revenue, and we were informed this morning um, that one of the state grants that we have budgeted for in the past is um, likely off the table this year. Um, Which grant is that? It's the municipal revenue sharing grant. It was about 143,000. Um, yeah, we haven't received it for quite a while. Um, and then it was scheduled to be about 143,000 in 2023, but the guidance from CCM is don't plan on it. So we need to take that out of our um, projection um, I think that was under the assessors. Um, how, how much is that? 142.2. And I believe it's under Board of Select and Cake. Well, I believe you're right. So that's a hit. Um, we've also, you know, have rev revenue decreases in some other areas um, that are offsetting some of the gains we got from the. Um, from the increase in the grand list. So, um, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay. okay. Anything else for tonight? No. Nope. Is there, I'm sorry, is there, what, which budgets, if any, are on the list for tomorrow, or is this a- There are not. Oh, it's a general discussion tomorrow. General discussion, yeah. Okay. Uh, I did um, say to Pam Geary that um, she, I know she sent you some additional information on um, the Weed Beach proposed project. Um, so she will be joining us tomorrow night if you have any questions for her as part of your deliberations. Kate, is there any way to get some updated numbers before then or no? Updated numbers on? The proposal. The proposal. Um, for the Weed Beach, well, okay. Yeah. Um, because they're from two years if, ago. If there are That's any that concern. are available, you'll you'll get them tomorrow night. Okay. Okay. I'm not. I'm just not counting on them being available. No, I just was curious. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anybody else has any questions? I think we'll call it a night. Thank you, friends. All right. Thank you, Kate. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Then. Thank you, everyone. All right. Good night. Good night.
and uh, we are meeting via go to meeting, though Mr. Ginsburg, I believe, is room 206 of Town Hall, um, uh, but uh, should be soloing there at the moment. Okay. Uh, the first matter on the agenda is a special permit application number 323 by Yan Lang Tang for 682 Boston Post Road. I understand this is to be continued immediately to February 8, 2022. Need I say any more? Good. Okay. Then special permit application 276-C for 110 Post Road Partners, LLC at 110 Boston Post Road, a proposal to establish a new 1600 uh, plus or minus square foot home contractor supplier showroom in the space previously occupied by Darien Dental Associates. Associates. The subject property is located on the south side of Boston Post Road, approximately 250 feet west of its intersection with West Norwalk Road and is shown on assessor's map number 32 is lot number four, five, and six in the service business zone. Mr. Ginsburg, would you do the introduction? Sure. sure. Sorry, sorry. I'm supposed to start that. The, the subject property is in the service business zone, which is on the eastern end of town. Uh, well, the building is... Second, Jeremy, let me ask Jeremy. you to please mute their uh, microphones unless speaking. Two-story building. Uh, and this is a special permit request by uh, represented by attorney Bob Maslin for a uh, home improvement showroom in the space now occupied by a dentist's office in the service business zone. Uh, the proposal is for only internal changes, no external changes to the building, Bob, and no external activity, if I recall. Uh, attorney Robert F. Maslin is here on behalf of the applicant. Okay. Fred, can you give me uh, the screen here? Where's that? I like a spaz. Again, would all those other than a speaker please mute your microphones? Okay, you should have. Uh, up on your, I don't know what happened here, but I may have a problem. But anyway, uh, because for some reason my cover slide is not appearing. But basically, this is the deal. Um, we're converting the dentist office into a showroom space for Glazier Experts LLC, which is a glass uh, kind of specialty place um, business that is relocating from behind the post office and uh, is being displaced because of the Corbin project. We're in the SB zone, as Jeremy said, uh, the entire site's a little over one acre, commercial building small, uh, I mean, with off street parking. There are already a couple of home improvement type businesses uh, at the front of the building facing the post road Boston, I mean, uh, Post Road Home Center and Bella Pietra, uh, which is a, a tile uh, company. Uh, the space is 1,600 plus or minus square feet. And uh, as Jeremy mentioned, this used to be a dental office. So let me see if I can, something is awry here, but oops, let me just, I'm having, Let's try this again. For some reason, my slides aren't cooperating. Let's try it this way. Oh, there we go. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> the Glazer uh, business is basically going to be a little showroom with an office and a break room and a restroom, and that's basically it. Uh, no change in the site plan. Uh, i.e. no increase in footprint, no change in parking, no change in the facade. And uh, that's it uh, descriptively in a nutshell. Here's an aerial, which is similar to the aerial photo in the uh, application. Uh, these are all solar panels up here. The space we're talking about is on the right end of the building over here. Um, and I have a couple of photographs 
anybody who goes by here on the post road uh, would recognize this building. Uh, a couple of photographs of the front. And this third photograph is a space over on the left here. Uh, there's some demo and some site uh, fit up work being done. What we're asking for here is a approval by special permit, which is required of um, home improvement contractors and those types of businesses in the SB zone. Here's the space, existing typical dentist office. You walk in the door, there's a waiting area, and you have these rooms uh, where you get your teeth pulled and cleaned and all that. And that's gonna be converted to this, which is basically a showroom area with an office, a restroom, and an employee lounge, and that's it. Uh, this is consistent, obviously, with the two showrooms next door, and uh, it'll actually make the building more conforming because dental offices are no longer permitted in the SB zone. So that's it. Any questions? I know you have a long agenda. I made this as short as I could. Very, very nicely done. Um, <clears throat> I'm not seeing any hands up or anything uh, unmuted. If anyone has a question, please speak up. Uh, among the commissioners, hearing none, let me turn to the public. Any questions or comments from the public? Seeing and hearing none. Well, and do we have a motion to close this application? Mr. Rand moves, Mr. Balgatch seconds. Commissioners in favor, please raise your hand. That appears to me to be unanimous, but I got very small boxes on my screen here, but um, appears so to the be- the hearing was closed. Yes. Right, is that what I move for? Yeah. Yep. yep. Okay, good. Okay, thank, thank you everyone. Thank you, Mr. Maslin. Uh, I don't see Is Mr. Romani there. No, okay. <clears throat> so the third item for our attention today is a special permit application number 322, land filling and regrading application number 520, Anthony DeCellis Revocable Trust, 320 Brookside Road. Proposal to construct a 60 foot by 100 foot recreational sport cart and associated stormwater management on the east side of the property and to perform related site development activities. The 2.32 plus or minus acre subject property is located at the northeast corner formed by the intersection of Brookside Road and Marianne Road and is shown on assessor's map number one as lot 87 in the R2 zone. Mr. Ginsburg, would you introduce please? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> this is Fred Donite. Um, as Mr. Riley has noted, uh, it's a, a 60 by 100 sports court going to be constructed out of concrete materials, um, going to be used for soccer, basketball, volleyball, tennis, um, those sorts of uses uh, on a residential property at 320 Brookside Road. Um, there is no lighting or sound system associated with the proposal. And the applicant proposes uh, uh, some drainage and stormwater uh, features for the site to accommodate uh, or to mitigate uh, stormwater runoff uh, since the, the size of the proposed sports court is more than 1,000 square feet. Uh, we do have the engineer here this evening from Muller Engineering, Brian Muller. Um, Brian, take it away. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, I'm not going to try to repeat everything that was said. Um, that was a pretty good introduction. Um, this property is uh, two plus acres. It's in the RA2 zone. It's on the corner of Brookside Drive and Marianne Road. Um, I've spoken to some of the neighbors. We sent out mailings to them. Um, seems like, you know, uh, we were taken pretty favorably. They just had a couple of questions. Um, so uh, it's pretty typical, you know, we're adding a sport court here, a lot of impervious surface. So we've added in uh, 
24 Coltec systems, 330 units um, on the uh, south side of the sport court away from the septic systems and all, you know, accessory buildings that are already currently on the site. Um, the, we are applying for a land filling and cutting permit, um, but there really isn't much soil or material coming in or out. It's pretty much an even swap, cutting into a slope a little bit, filling in the low side. Um, the property has a mild slope on it in the rear yard from uh, the east to west. So, um, you know, that's basically it. So if there's any questions from any of the board members, I'd be happy to answer. Uh, commissioners, Commissioner Gately. Sorry, Ms. Ms. Gately, um, I think it would just be useful um, just because you weren't presenting on the screen and I understand, I know it's challenging, you know, to do so. Some people like it, some people don't, but can you just, because they are adding impervious surfaces and given, yeah. you know, the focus and concern on, you know, flooding impact on neighboring sites and not want to create an adverse impact to neighbors or the town, given the flooding issues that we've had. Can you just sort of, you know, on any of the site plan that, that you submitted to us, just kind of go through like where you're doing the cutting and digging in and where the cold taxes will be um, with respect to the grading already on the property and sort of, you know, any neighboring properties you know just that kind of stuff oh, of course of course yes Thank you. so um the sport court's going in the center of the the rear yard uh it's going to be in between the detached garage and uh, a small barn um in the back south east corner um and in between those two structures the detached garage and the small barn both of them have no foundations um we're putting in a uh, 24 unit cult tech system which is an underground retention system um, we it's used for water quality treatment um, as well as storm water adverse impact uh, peak flow rates um, as everyone witnessed this past year we've had a good three flooding events I'd say um, depending on where we were in Fairfield County it was anywhere from a 25 year to a potentially 100 year storm event um, I had actually come out to this property during one of those events and witnessed some some pretty good flooding in the area. Um, I spoke to one of the neighbors uphill. He had been concerned about water flow and making sure that we weren't gonna be blocking anything. Um, there is a pretty good um, delineated swale along the back of uh, this subject property, which diverts the water around the property so it doesn't adversely impact uh, the interior of this own property. Um, just... And most of the storm water passes through this property uh, on, on site um, along Marianne Road and either discharges through a series of catch basins uh, with two foot sumps, which also provide uh, additional water quality treatment before it ultimately discharges into the town drainage system in Brookside Road. Um, oh, the pipe sizes are, are large pipes. They're 12 inch uh, PVC SDR pipes. Okay. I inspected all of them. They were all clean. The catch basins were clean. Um, the yards, you know, had some erosion, but overall it was more of a concern of, okay, let's just make sure this water passes through the property, doesn't impact any neighboring properties um, before it safely discharges into the town of Darien stormwater system. Thank you. Um, this, yeah, so if there's any other, you want me to go into any more depth, I could probably talk about this for hours, just wouldn't be that entertaining. <laughs> Monica McNally, she would probably talk to you for hours, she would love that. Um, is, is the fact that you inspected the, the width and the sort of whether pipes were blocked, is that in your drainage report? I read it. Um, I don't yeah. believe I have anything of the existing maintenance on the property. That was kind of a That's separate okay. issue that uh, the owners had asked me to look at. Um, they just That's wanted to make sure because they just bought the property. So. No, I think it's important though that you, it's part of the record and that you did speak about it. So it is part of the record now, uh, even if it's not in your report. So I really appreciate that added um, information. Thank you. No problem. Appreciate it. This is uh, Fred Donut. I would just, I would yeah. just add that um, Darren Ostify, the, Ostify the Assistant Director of uh, Department of Public Works did submit uh, comments on the application dated January 20th, which are included as part of the file. Um, Darren did not have any significant comments 
on the application um he essentially um is is okay with with what's being proposed uh, I, I just wanted to ask if there's uh, any kind of walk path proposed or going to be created to go from the house to the sport court that might be impervious or otherwise of interest no uh i don't believe so there was no discussion of a walkway um uh, presumably they would probably enter straight from the driveway courtyard area between the garage there so i think they would just run across the lawn um I, yeah i can't if anything maybe some stepping stones or something but nothing significant okay all right any other questions by commissioners Okay, then uh, let me open it up to the public. Any questions by the public? Comments? Concern? Seeing none, may I uh, uh, suggest a motion to close this application? Thank you, Ms. Gately. A second. Thank you, Mr. Balgach. Uh, any further discussion? Then, uh, commissioners in favor of closing this application, please indicate by raising your hand. That appears to Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, good presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you. All righty. <clears throat> Next um, matter for our attention is um, landfilling, excavation, and regrading application number 522, Nicholas and Tracy Young, 249 Tokenik Road. Proposal to regrade the western portion of the property to create a level yard area and to perform related site development activities. The 1.13 plus or minus acres subject property is located on the south side of Tokenique Road, approximately 300 feet west of its intersection with Pheasant Run, and is shown on assessor's map number 66 as lot number 111 in the R1 zone. Uh, who would like to make the introduction? Mr. Ginsburg, please. Jeremy Ginsburg, Planning and Zoning Director. Uh, uh, as you can see from the submitted plans, and if you've been out to the site, uh, the property owner has a gently sloping property that slopes, I'll call it from the south uh, to the north to Tokenique Road. This is on the eastern end of town. Uh, there was a lot of ledge on the side of the house, on the west side of the house, in which the applicant was starting to remove the ledge, but because of the extent of the removal, uh, landfilling and grading permit under section 850 of the regulations uh, has been invoked because they're changing the grade more than six inches, more than 15 feet away from the, uh, the house. So the plan prepared by SE Minor shows both existing grades, those grades, under the new proposed condition, they're going to remove some existing rock and basically continue the existing slope of the land from south to north. So the water will still flow in the same direction. And that was important for SE Minor to put, put a proposal forth that doesn't impact the adjacent properties to the east or to the west, and the water flow is the same. The amount of impervious surface is probably about the same. I'll defer to the engineers on that because they're going to just replace what's there, the final graded property with grass seed or sod. So there's no new impervious surface other than a very small terrace adjacent to the house. Uh, the prior condition had a lot of rock, so there was a little bit of runoff there. Uh, Darren asked to find a public works sent a memo dated January 19th, 2022. And you have a copy of that both in the record and in your packets. I'll turn it over to Tracy Young, the property owner, and her representative from SE Minor. Thanks, Ms. Young. Go to it. Tracy? Sounds good. I'm trying to unmute here. Um, and I have I have Larry um, Liebman from SE Minor here, too. So I don't know if, Larry, you want to do the more official talking or if you'd like me to walk through. Um, <clears throat> good evening, um, everybody. Uh, my name is Larry Liebman from SC Minor uh, um, and Company in Greenwich. Um, we 
um, prepared a grading plan. And thank you very much, Mr. Ginsburg, for a wonderful presentation. Um, it is a gently sloping lot. Um, the activity started to take place, and then we were we, we were asked to come in and, and prepare a plan. Um, we have erosion controls on the plan, and with the, it's a very very um, simple application that it's going to be regraded, and uh, and we uh, it's going to be regraded, and there is no not going to be any impacts to the neighbors, nor is there going to be any additional runoff since we're going to be grassing over the area that has been impacted. And I can answer any questions that anyone may like. Questions? Any questions? No, I, I mean, I think you hit it. You hit our concerns. You understand why we're, you know, yeah, so thank you. I, I think we all appreciate that. Good. Great. The proposed deck addition, uh, uh, there is an existing deck to be removed, the proposed deck, but that is not relevant to the area we're talking about, right? That is true. Okay. That's good. Anything else, commissioners? Then let me open it to the public and ask for any comments or questions. Please unmute yourself. If you're not on camera, speak up. I am hearing nothing. Then I would entertain a motion to close this application. Mr. Rand, and seconded by Mr. Belgotch. Oh, sorry, Ms. Gately, next time. Okay. The, <laughs> I like um, a bipartisan kind of like we're a, we're a exactly, cool. Exactly, my mission. <laughs> uh, in favor of the uh, motion to uh, uh, close this application, please indicate that appears to be unanimous. Thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Young and Mr. Lehman. Appreciate that. Okay, the commission will be deliberating and deciding this at a future meeting in... Uh, two to three weeks. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the next matter on the uh, agenda is a landfilling and regrading application number 521 by Mario Lombardi for 72 Old Kings Highway South. Proposal to construct a series of stepped stone retaining walls with associated landscaping on the north and west sides of the property and to perform related site development activities. The 0.6 plus or minus acre subject property is located on the north side of Old Kings Highway South, approximately 190 feet west of an intersection with Andrews Drive, and is shown on assessor's map number 63 as lot number 42 in the R13 zone. Doing the introduction will be Mr. Jeremy Ginsburg, Ginsburg, Planning and Zoning Director. Uh, this is a situation you uh, on Old Kings Highway, number 72. You've probably seen they've been out there uh, doing some rock removal and regrading. Uh, I'll call it similar to the last application, but this is a much smaller lot. And in this case, what they're doing is putting in some new rock walls. You may have seen uh, some of the wall in the, uh, I'll call it the middle of the project, which is out there now. And... So certainly we've been uh, working with the applicant to get them to submit an application and bring an engineer on board. Rob Frangione from Frangione Engineering is here. Uh, before the meeting, we gave Rob a number of questions that the commission's likely to ask uh, that will help him run through the proposal. It's a little unique in that uh, they're taking the rocks that they're uh, uncovering, if you will, as part of the grading and putting in new walls, uh, which are, and you'll see if you've been to the property, there's much higher elevation than the adjacent property. So Darren Ostefine also commented on this application in a January 20th memo, uh, but I'll turn it over to Rob here and hopefully Rob can go through some of the questions and your, as part of your presentation to assist the commission in better understanding existing walls, proposed walls, um, and how it's all going to work. Sure. Uh, again, for the record, Rob Frangione from um, talk about great timing. I literally was just on a public hearing with the Rye Planning Board. Um, so that's the great thing about these uh, virtual hearings. I can be in two towns at one time. Very, actually, good. Very good. Actually supposed to be in Canada tonight, too. I delayed that one. 
Um, okay, so we're happy to have you. <laughs> we'll be happy to have this uh, parcel attended to. Yes. So, um, you know, I got brought on board once this wall was constructed. Um, I'm assuming you can all see the screen that I'm sharing of the yep. um, of the plan. So, you know, it, it was constructed, and really, it's kind of like in the middle of the property. So, what the plan is is to build a series of terraced walls that will have land that'll be four feet high. So, up four feet, back four feet, up four feet. Uh, and planted in between uh, each of the different terraces. We've provided a planting plan done by Stonebridge Associates that shows how that's going to be screened, and furthermore, how um, I-95 is going to be screened, um, or at least attempt to screen. Um, as far as being able to get in there and plant the wall, you know, in between the walls, you know, the walls are open on the sides, uh, and there's this open side here. Let me see if I can get this in a little bit better. Oops. Um, that might be a little easier to read. Um, so you can kind of see how from this upper portion, you can come in here, plant this. And they're only four feet high. Um, so if they had to, you could step down uh, with a small step ladder to get in there. Same thing with on this side of the wall. It's going to be open on the sides so the workers could come in um, and stay entirely on this parcel. Um, while doing the work. Uh, a question was asked if we think that there might be some more home ramming or any uh, blasting. In speaking with the, the owner uh, or, or the owner's builder, um, we think that there might be a, about five days more uh, just based on the topographic irregularities. Basically, this property was a cliff um, and it was all a lot of exposed ledge. And that's what the wall that's here uh, predominantly was made from. Um, that's going to be repurposed in parts to build the wall here. Um, we estimate that with the backfilling and, and leveling of this area, uh, that it'll be about, a, a, I did a cut fill analysis, it's on the site plan, it's about 1400 yards, given a 27 yard truck, that's about 50 to 52 truckloads, give or take. Um, we think that this is gonna take about four months to do so 50 trucks over four months it's not a lot of trucks um, the driveway will remain in its location um, and as far as safety uh, Jeremy and I talked about it and I talked it over with my uh, client yeah we're, we're gonna propose a um, chain link fence on the uphill side of the wall again there's gonna be screening and planting and that's you know the planting plan so that'll help hide uh, that fence uh, and that's just to prevent somebody from tumbling over the side of the wall. And, uh, yeah, it's a quite a drop over there. Um, so that's pretty much the presentation. Uh, we provided these plans, the erosion controls uh, we show on the, uh, the the next slide here, as far as the um, you know right along the perimeter, um, you know, the, the area of disturbance. It's only about ten thousand square feet, ten five. Uh, not a big area. It's not a big lot. Um, and so that's really it, unless you have any further questions. Yeah, Rob, Rob I do have a question. You're, you're going to be out there for four months lowering the grade of this property, is that? And then taking the rocks as you lower the grade, saving the rocks no. on site, and then raising building grade. walls with these rocks? We're raising the grade in this corner. The, um, the, the, really, where the, the bulk of this wall is in the northwest corner, and we show a proposed 66 contour coming through here, and then 64 comes right here. So this is where the fill really is occurring over here. For the most part, in this area, it's not as much of a fill. I'll let Jeremy speak. No, you're not crushing or uh, breaking rock on site or anything like that are you is there going to be any machinery on site um just the whole ram to break up the rock uh but uh, no no rock um tumbler or you know what's uh, no explosives no what no explosives uh, well, no, I don't, I don't think they plan on blasting. I think they've done the blasting that they, that they intended to do, uh, which they had permits for. They okay, did get gotcha. a blasting permit for that from the building department. Okay. So. All 
Correct. So what is the uh, surface of this area going to be, uh, you know, long. in this person? It is going so, to be long. It'll be long. I mean, you know, th there's so much exposed ledge that was out there. Um, you know, this will be an improvement in the runoff simply because it's going to flatten it out. It'll slow down the time of concentration. It'll provide some infiltration, whereas the way it was, there was none. Very little. And the, the existing two-story wood frame building, is that to remain? Yes. And there used to be a house on this property, which was torn down. This was long before I got involved. Right. Um, and that's roughly from the GIS, so, you know, the town aerial maps. That's roughly where that house was. So this no. is beyond the scope of your application, but do you know what the future of that two-story wood frame building is? Uh, the intention is to keep it. Um, somewhere down the road, once this site is stabilized and the owner has a better idea of you know, what he's got to work with, um, yeah. he's most likely gonna come in with a, a site plan for a house. Um, I don't know what the disposition of this frame building would be um it's within the front yard setbacks that's a that's a tale for another night so understood yeah no i got it okay wait it is the applicant so the applicant began this work and regrading and hole ramming with permits and or no so my recollection is the building department did give them a blasting permit to do okay that. Uh, Did they have permits to regrade and? Well, that's where there was a disconnect, apparently. Um, you know. Okay, so is this guy a builder? I'm sorry, say that again. Is this guy a builder? Yes. Okay, right? so he didn't know he needed a permit. Well, I think he thought he needed a building permit, or, you know, a blasting permit from the know. building department, which but I he was regrading. He wasn't. He was doing more than blasting. He was regrading. True. Okay. And he's a builder. Yes. Okay. Thank you. No, he knew he knew, he knew that uh, when he got the build, blasting permit uh, in 2021, we had sent the builder a letter saying, wait a minute, this seems a little out of the ordinary. Uh, please let us know what's going on because this is not typical blasting for a construction project. Uh, this is blasting and blasting and blasting with and, and no I mean, end in sight. And then all these rocks started getting piled up. So is, certainly there was a lot of concern out of our office. And uh, we did record? reach out to the property owner because uh, the work he did certainly did require a permit. I think yeah. one of the concerns we have, Rob, is not only the amount of hole ramming, but how the property, you know, if he's going to be out there for four months, mm -hmm. uh, he's going to be hole ramming for five days out of those four months. Is he bringing fill on the site or off the site? Is there an erosion fence or? Hang on, so, Commissioner Gately. Let's go to. Answer. Okay, I'll try to, I'll try to tackle those questions one at a time. Um, so yes, the fill's being brought onto the site because. You know, like I said, there uh, in our uh, cut fill analysis. Uh, well, it's over here on the screen. I can't see it because everybody's faces are over it. But that's where we did. You know, and I did a cut fill analysis. Um, it came out to about fourteen hundred yards. Um, that's going to have to be uh, imported in order to backfill and put in you know, topsoil and, and, and friable material to get something to grow on it. Uh, in addition to you know uh, the, the stone and, and everything else. So. Um, so that yeah i mean it could take three to four months um you know it uh, could be less uh, you know i've imparted upon my client that it is imperative to work as quickly as possible on this one uh given the history um i think uh one of the questions was is there an erosion control fence yes so it's um uh, i show it along the perimeter that's what this sb is that's the silk fence so basically, you set the, the silt fence on the property line, and it's a gravity rock wall. You just stack rocks and pile them on top of each other. So. Now, now Rob, uh, as you said, three, four months, uh, and the plantings, uh, at 
no drainage to be installed uh, and your client's aware of the plan you propose so he he can live with this plan that you've put together he's seen yes. it and can live with it yes in fact the uh the landscaping plan was done in concert with the with the client you know he helped pick out the kinds of plantings that he wanted uh, particularly with the screening to um um to 95 you know the plan by the landscape designer wasn't created in a vacuum uh, he got the uh, buy-in and and rob you would be your client would be okay if uh the commission as uh, if they were to approve it have you come on site every couple of weeks to see what's going on make sure it's in keeping with the plan certainly if that's what one of the conditions of the permit is then that's what my client will have to abide by in order to fulfill the permit and uh, you said four four months four months to do the work approximately yes. how will we know when he's done <laughs> <laughs> is art ever finished um the uh it'll be substantially complete when, mm. when the walls are erected and the plantings are in um at that point you know the majority of the earthwork will have been completed um you know getting the grass to grow that might take a little longer but the plants those can just be plopped in um per the planting plan that that'll go certainly much quicker than getting the uh, grass to stabilize All you right, would, Rob. Your client, your client would be comfortable if we gave him five months to be whatever you you get done in five months. You're done. I believe so. I, I I think my client understands having gone through this now for quite some time that you know we've we've got to have an endpoint. Uh, we can't let this go out in limbo forever. So. Yeah, I think that's a concern. Is he's already been out there working for what would you say four to six months? And you're saying he's got another four plus months, I think, uh, in the interest of the neighborhood and the commission, because before you're like, this is not that big a job. It shouldn't take that long to do. And I don't think the commission wants to see this being an endless construction project. I agree. It's just we have to be wary of the, the weather. I mean, it's, you know, we're about to be February 1st. Even if you were to stack the walls right now, I don't know if you could get the plantings in until March or April for them to start growing through the grow, you know, through the growing season. So um, that's why I've got that kind of, you know, approximately four months, because four months from now gets us into May. At that point, you know, the plantings can have been in and they can be you know, dealing with that. So. Uh, Ms. Gately. I guess, so, you know, in previous, in other applications where there is um blasting and i always get the words wrong Ho ramming <laughs> i don't know where you know there's like this kind of extensive earth work going on we have in the past in residential neighborhoods put conditions around especially um in the COVID era where people are working from home and children were, you know, remote learning school at home. And this kind of work is very, in a residential neighborhood, it's disturbing both from a noise, you know, movement, um, you know, dust, you know, kind of aspect, trucks, you know, it, it causes quite a disruption to a residential neighborhood. Are the neighbors aware, have they been noticed, and are they aware that there will be another expected four to six months of extensive earthwork going on? So the neighbors were noticed uh, as required. Uh, and uh, when, when were they noticed? Um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I have not received work, and, and when did the work begin? Uh, the work's been going on for longer than I can remember. Um, so they, the neighbors actually, just nothing's been going on recently. So that's the other thing. You know, this basically I, I'm all came facts to facts on the spot. record. I'm not questioning you. I'm really trying to get facts on the record just so there's clarity. Yeah, and I just don't want to give uh, false information. That's the thing. Uh, no, I, oh, I, I completely appreciate that. So, but they, <laughs> they, were, they were noticed recently. Yes, yes. Okay. And usually when the neighbor notices go out, I typically get at least one call from a neighbor. Yeah, nothing. 
I got nothing. So okay, all right. Yeah, because that's my concern. Obviously, right? Is like right, and I and I understand the concern about the noise. Um, you know that whole ramming brings to the neighborhood, but <laughs> let's not forget the elephant in the room. We've got I ninety five right here. No, I get that, and I also get that you're probably overextending given weather, so that there will not be continuous. Right. During the entire four months, you're giving yourself that time because I think I heard you say there might be times where it's not possible given. Right, like right now, we couldn't plant. Right, now. right. So, so yeah. okay, I just wanted to make sure that the, I mean it's still a even though there's 95 there, it's still a residential neighborhood, and um, this is extensive work and extensive land regrading. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. Thank you. Mr. Donut, want the floor? Mr. Donut, did you want the floor? You're unmuted. Yeah, um, I would just note that we did receive a call today from uh, Mr. Michael Kibitz, and um, he had uh, he's the neighbor across the street from the subject property. He did have some concerns regarding the application. Um, so when the uh, uh, when you opened a public comment, he may wish to. I wish to comment on the application this evening. Okay, thanks. I just had one more question. Back to my favorite topic of that two-story wood frame building. Uh, do you happen to know? I, I believe it's been rented in the past. Do you know if it is now or will be during this process? I believe it's it is being rented currently, um, and for the foreseeable future. Okay, and you're you've got appropriate fencing or other uh, safety measures in place for that. I don't know whether there are kids involved or anything else, but uh, yeah, I mean the, the the nice thing about this building is it's actually on the complete up opposite side of the property and on the other side of the hill from all the work that's going on. So you know the kids really have to climb up a big hill in order to get over to here and take a look at what's going on. But you know we can. Yeah, it's, not, it's not that big a parcel. <laughs> All right, but my point is, it's you know we can adequately portion it off so that you know people living here they got to work yeah. to get up. And, I would encourage you to do that. Yeah. Uh, yes. Certainly. And, and I also, um, I, I'm sure the owner knows that we're pleased that he is uh, you know taking the appropriate steps now to um, improve this parcel, which has, shall we say, been an eyesore for some period of time. So. We do want to encourage that, and that's uh, that's fun. Um, all right, shall I? Um, uh, any other commissioners? Any questions? Seeing none, let me open it to the. One, I've got one question, George. Yeah, go to it. The um, obviously the front of the property now. I know it's not part of this application. Is pretty derelict. Um, the stone walls is pretty awful, uh, as well as the building. The regrading in the back isn't going to impact any future work that would be done to the front of that property, would it? Like since you're raising the back up, you're not going to change how the water flows back down onto um, Old Kings Highway instead of you know backwards, right? <laughs> No, we are not redirecting water. We're not changing the watershed. Uh, this proposed elevation is 66. There's an existing 68 here, and then there's another 68 here. There's a bit of a little bit of a high point knoll. So whatever water is coming from this high point this way will continue to go that way, and then everything from the house and uh, and this high point continue forward. So. Okay. Yeah. All righty, if nothing further from commissioners, let me open it up to the public for any questions or comments. Just unmute your mic or otherwise there's someone on the phone who's unmuted. CO, any comment, question? No, my name was mentioned. My name is Michael. I'm the, the neighbor across the way. Um, so I appreciate you guys having this call and I'm glad I'm able to join this evening. Um, just a general comment, I think everybody else on the call kind of um, has a, a similar impression of the property in terms of it being derelict, in terms of it being an eyesore. Um, I haven't lived uh, in this area for very long, but since I have been, um, there's been numerous trucks parked there for long periods of time with zero activity. Um, there has been trucks coming and going with zero activity happening at the house for a number of years um 
and just an overall, I believe it's, it is relatively um, unsafe uh, in terms of the property, um, the activity and the amount of equipment that's there on a regular basis. So uh, reviewing, I just uh, get my limited knowledge of, of construction, but I'm, I'm looking at the, the plans here. Um, I guess my overall question is that um, these activities I'm, I'm hoping will leave, will, will, will lend itself to some sort of long-term solution, right? Uh, so it's no longer just an eyesore. It's no longer just a, what I would call a vacant parking lot for construction trucks. Um, I, I just want to make sure that that is, uh, I know we're not here for that, but if that is a long-term solution to ultimately build a house and uh, whatever you would call this wood frame building uh, that sits on the side of the road as well. Before I get a response to that, can I get your last name spelling and your address, please? Sure, at 77 Old Kings Highway South. Last name is Kivitz, K-I-V-E-T-Z. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Franjohn, you care to comment on that? Or I, I expressed my personal opinion that that's exactly what we hope is going to occur over the next four months, that this eyesore will be remedied. And that's what I was brought on board to do, is to try and fix the problem and help come, you know, solution so um you know we went through a lot of work to get a planting plan with azaleas and dogwoods and you know all kinds of <laughs> um the uh, uh, you know, um to make it attractive to make it better looking than it is now because uh, i agree it's it's, it's not in a, in a good state in its present condition and it can be better mm -hmm. all right any other public comment or questions Seeing none, um, let me suggest Ms. Gately. Did you Sorry. want to say something or, yeah, go ahead. No, I just want to follow up because I think that was an important point that the neighbor raised and having, you know, followed zoning and enforcement issues in our neighboring towns and cities of Stanford and Norwalk is there is a significant issue in those towns of lots being used to you know park where there's no other parking available construction vehicles and large equipment and this kind of this has been a lot an ongoing issue in neighboring towns so i i, I don't and i feel bad because i think you're probably not equipped you know, don't have this not your wheelhouse to answer this question but are they committed and understand or do we as a town have an answer or a solution to this parking enforcement issue. Is that a question for me or Jeremy? It's the planting <laughs> yeah, and the other stuff, right? It's not. It's sort of a different issue. Yeah. So Jeremy Ginsburg, Planning and Zoning Director. I agree with you, Kara. And that was my question of earlier. How will we know when this is done? And that's why it may be helpful to have Mr. People? Frangione on site. Uh, on a routine basis, because what we don't want this to turn into is the, I'll call it the never ending project where the builder has his vehicles out there. There's little to no activity. And just what uh, the neighbor across the street mentioned, month after month after month, they're dragging their feet and just parking vehicles. So I think it's imperative in this case, if Mr. Frangione, who's a professional engineer, can represent that it's a four month jo job and Maybe the commission can dictate, hey, once you get a starting date, you have four months to complete the project. Five days of that can be home ramming, and then you're done. You can't have this drag on and on and on, moving rocks, moving dirt, and having vehicles parked out there disrupting the neighborhood. I think it would be in everyone's best interest to finish the project. And I know, Mr. Frangione, we did talk about this when you came into the office about making sure that it's it's a project and it doesn't become a contractor's yard. I, I had a conversation with the owner's rep earlier today about that, um, explaining that, you know, this needs to move along and you know, we can't park any kind of commercial vehicles on the property uh, if there's not a project going on. So I, I, did, I did impart that to him. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, at this point, if there's no further comment from the public or the commissioners, questions? Sorry, just, just one more 
comment on when you guys mentioned an end date, but is, 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 is there a way to document a, a start date? Like, what, I, I'm not familiar with the with the program, but will they come to you and say we're starting on February 1st? I suspect it will be when the permit is issued, um, but Mr. Ginsburg have a different answer? Right, in this case, if, if, if the commission closes the public hearing tonight, uh, they have a few months to make a decision, but it's likely they'll get a decision uh, in mid-February, say the 8th or the 15th, something like that. Uh, and uh, that would be a logical thing to do is to say that once uh, they, e they should email the office once work is about to commence and they have four months from that date to complete the project. So certainly it may take them uh, a week or two or three to uh, figure out how they want to get started and then once they notify the office, certainly that would be one way to do it. Um, but it will, if the commission does close the hearing tonight, it's likely that they won't get a decision till February 8th or 15th. Great, thank you. All righty. Then I uh, suggest a uh, motion to close the application. Hello, hello. Hello, yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Wonderful. My name is Michael Agostino. I've been listening to the uh, comments being made. There's a little bit of misinformation here. I'd like to clear the air for people. Um, the property has significantly improved as to what it was. Uh, because we've had to stop working on the property, it's been sitting idle. So now what's going to happen is the long-term plan is to build a house there, not to use it as a construction warehouse or yard to park vehicles or anything else. The idea is to build a brand new home there. That has always been the objective. Now, we have to go through the process of building retaining walls and bringing in planting and doing all that. The weather will play a significant role in that because we don't know what's going to happen in February or March as far as the weather is concerned. Uh, and we can't buy plants until probably the end of March, the, the beginning of April sometime before the nurseries even have the plants. The idea here is that we will go in there, finish doing the walls, get the planting done and clean the property up. The building that's existing there now is, is so-called cottage that was part of the old property. That building will stay permanently, uh, as which is what the owner wants. It will be used as a storage facility after the pro after when the house gets built. The uh, condition to getting a permit to building a new house is that the facility could not be used for anything more than a storage facility. So that will happen then. Trucks will only be there and equipment will only be there when it's being used, not to park there or anything else along those lines. Now, um, there isn't that much work to do as far as degrading is concerned. Uh, the uh, majority of rock has been broken. So and, why do you need four uh, months? Uh, please, Ms. Gately, hang on. No, go ahead. I'm listening. So, Mr. Agatino, okay. what, what, is, what is your relationship to this matter? Uh, I know the owner. He's a landscaper, not a builder. And uh, I know the owner. He bought the property. Commissioner Gately, could I have a second, please? Uh, I'm just wondering, are, are you his representative, or what is your function? Yes. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not. I'm working with him. I'm trying to assist him to get through this process and to move okay. forward. He had so contacted me a while back, telling me he was having some issues, uh, and could I please uh, intercede with uh, planning and zoning and okay. try to get things moving along uh, so that he can get get the property prepared to build on. Can I get your address, please? My address. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My address is uh, 35 Timber Mill Road, Stanford, Connecticut. Okay. 06903. All right. Now, you recognize we've heard most all of this, I think, from Mr. Franjohn. It's been. Uh, yes, I know. I just want to make sure because there's, when you don't have all the information and the facts, it's easy to think something that's not completely accurate. And as I said, the idea here now is to go in and prepare the property with the land use permit so that a home, a house, can be built on the property. Yes, yes sir. Thank you. You did say that. So we, we need to move on. Appreciate it. Ms. Okay. Gately, anything further? Oh, I mean. Anything we haven't covered? Well, only that there seems to be an inconsistency now between, unfortunately, the two representatives. <laughs> the new guy and. Oh, we're gonna, I think we've got to rely on the paid. Uh, That's what I'm hoping. He's saying the work is almost done and we don't need, you know, 
<laughs> and we're going to start building a house. We have a designated representative from the owner, so I think we got to. Right, so I, I just think we need clarity on that now that there's been another speaker who claims that he's also speaking for the owner. So, so Mike and I have discussed this. He was the person who was in the office earlier today. Um, you know, my job is to get the landfilling and regrading permit so that we can bring this to a resolution. Um, and my future endeavor with this will be to somewhat shepherd it, I suppose, which will be part of the permit condition. Um, you know, I, I feel like we really should not be saying anything further on this. It's like pushing through an open door. So uh, with that, if there's any further questions, I'll, I'll be All quiet. Right. <laughs> then may I uh, suggest a motion to close the application? Or, yeah, oh, Mr. Rand, okay, we have a second for that notion. Or do you want to continue to talk? <laughs> I'm not seeing a second for this motion. All right. You can, you can George, I did not see anyone else from the public that wanted to speak. I, uh, I don't see anyone else. No, I don't either. But unless Mr. Commissioner Balgatch, is there a reason you don't want to second that motion? I can't hear you. Sorry, I just unmuted it. No, I'm just I'm just entirely taken aback by what just happened. Um, so, do you, Rob? Do you know that prior speaker? Have you met him? Is that your? Yes. You were, he was in your office today. Yes. So is is he? You said that you spoke with the owner regarding the planting plan, um, and he was fully aware of it. Does this other individual, is he also aware of it? Yes. Think, yes. We've, we've gone through all these plans. Um, I've given copies to both the owner and Mr. Agostino. Um, yes, we, we are on is, the same page. We're in the same book. We're in the is same Mr. book. Is Mr. Agostino the contractor who will be doing the work? No. I didn't hear the question. Is, is he the contractor that will be doing the work? No. The answer was no. Okay. They, they do have to a contractor to do this. So, okay. No, I, I guess not. It's odd, but yeah. There's a motion on the table. Uh, motion has been made to close this up. Thank, is that a second, Mr. Bell? I'll second it. Yeah. All right. Then, uh, commissioners in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three. Four. Okay. And oh, the chairman is weighing in as well with a positive vote. Thank you. All right, so this uh, application is closed. Thank you. We'll look forward to that resolution. Thank you very and, much. Uh, I am happy to uh, uh, turn the spotlight over to the chair and thank him for the opportunity to serve. Can't hear you, Mr. Chairman. How about, is that better? I hit the wrong button. I'm sorry for being late, everybody. I appreciate you, George, taking over. Thank you very much. Um, so without further ado, we'll just keep moving on. The next item on the agenda is landfilling and regrading application number 523 Peter Doyle at 289 West Avenue. Proposal to widen the existing driveway with an associated retaining wall and to perform related site development activities, including cutting of the existing grade on the northwest portion of the property to accommodate the widening. The 0 0.6 plus minus acre subject property is located on the south side of West Avenue, approximately 70 feet east of its intersection with Bridgeley Street. And as shown on assessor's map number 75 is lot 11 in the R1 fifth zone. This sounds like a project right like the one that was next door. The woman. Uh, yes, Jeremy Ginsburg, Planning and Zoning Director. Uh, Mr. Alvani's right. We did see a similar application uh, a few doors down at 288 West Avenue or across the street, I believe. Uh, similar fact pattern. We have a driveway with retaining walls on both sides. In this case, the property owner wants to widen the driveway, get a little more room in there, make it a little easier for cars to get in and out. Uh, because the grading is near the property line, uh, it requires a landfilling and regrading application to the commission. We did refer to this to 
Assistant DPW Director Darren Ostefine, who sent a memo dated January 19, 2022. He acknowledged that although uh, no stormwater has, retention is proposed, it's approximately 150 square feet of new impervious surface, which is well below the threshold of 1,000 square feet. Um, so the um, one of the issues DPW has is to make sure that uh, no new stone wall gets constructed on town property. They would need a permit to do that. Again, West Avenue is a, is a town road, so they would need a street opening permit to widen it and approval to put the stone wall into uh, the right of way, and that has to be approved by DPW. Um, Want to make sure that the the I'll call it the curve of the driveway doesn't go in front of the adjacent property. And based on the plans that were submitted, it does not appear that that is the case. Uh, Mr. Doyle, the property owners here to add anything uh, to that what I just mentioned. Uh, I'll let him explain how long the project's going to take, what the regrading's going to look like, and any details I may have left out. Mr. Doyle. Hello. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it should take about two weeks or less and uh, there we plan on doing it with minimal impact we're just simply moving the wall back five feet so we're gonna uh, take the wall down and we're gonna put up uh, fabric to hold the, the soil back and we're gonna construct a new wall with drainage um, basically a better wall that's there right now and uh, we don't plan on impacting or going past the sidewalk or the uh, town property Mr. Doyle, how, lar how large is your property? With um, well, I, I submitted a survey that I had done also to bring it up to uh, a, a newer survey. So the property is, sorry, I would have had that information if I knew you needed it. Um, so, uh, that was my Wait, question. Uh, um, because the, the, the public notice says it's 0. 0.6 acres, which is more than a Correct. half an acre, and you're in a one fifth acre zone, which is 20,000 square feet. Or actually, it's 15,000 15, feet. So I'm trying to, something's, something's wrong. And I, I have this, what we call this a survey. I can't read the number of it. So it's probably just some kind of typo. Right. Can you pass me the survey? I have it over there. The world. Just take a look. All right. <laughs> it is unmuted. Turn on. Oh, yes. Speaker is so the area is uh, seventy five hundred square feet. I'm doing this. There you go. Do, do, what do we think, Peter? Do, is it on there or no? Yeah, it said seventy five hundred square feet. Uh, the survey I just had done. Okay, I just want to make sure it's right. It, it, and it, in honesty, it doesn't have a whole lot of effect with the wall that you're going to move. The only question right. I really have is, um, right now it looks like there's bushes on top of that wall between you and the they've neighbor. Been, uh, Do you plan yeah, on landscaping it after you move the wall five feet? Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, you know, overgrown shrubbery, which we removed. We're going to replant with uh, new shrubbery and plantings. Okay, great. Okay. It's up here. Yeah. Okay. The, the 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 public notice for the record is is incorrect. The the lot I think is fifty by one fifty or one fifteen. 
150 by 50, which is most of the lots in that neighborhood. So we'll get that <laughs> corrected when this product is found. Does any um, community <laughs> questions to this application? Steve, there is so much feedback. I can I'm get, I can only hear like every fourth word. I know, I, this is not working. Can you turn off your speaker? Okay. Can you hear me now? My speaker's notice. not working on my computer. That's the problem, and Carol. I'm sorry. I just want to. I, I just want to make sure. I heard something about Why? public notice. And so I just want to make sure that kind of stuff gets on the record. And maybe it's getting so on the record, and I just can't hear it, and that's fine. What the heck? Yeah. Jesus. We're never gonna get well. <laughs> that's not good. Get rid of that. Area. It's back to you again. Was your mic? I'm going to open my. Kara, can you hear me now? I can. There you go. Good. I can hear you too. I'm sorry, Mr. Joe. All right, let's go back to where we were. Do any other commissioners have any questions relative to this application? Jim Rand, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, what I need just to get this straight in my own mind is somebody, maybe, maybe Jeremy, you can do it. The, the drawings that we have of the uh, existing driveway and the 15 foot driveway. Um, you mentioned or so, um, someone in town mentioned the encroachment of the wall into the street. I'll, I'll take this. Am I, am I expressing that the way you intended? Okay. Yes. Is it okay now? And would it be okay the way it's drawn here, this red line going out into whatever it says Eversource? Yeah, Jim, this is Fred Donut. Let me clarify that for you. Um, Darren, Mr. Darren Ostafine, Assistant Director of Public Works, and his comments to the commission wrote um, the application will include construction of a stone wall on town property which is specifically prohibited by written policy of DPW. The DPW does grant exceptions when, reten when retention walls are required to provide access to the site. So we did speak to Mr. Ostafind about this and he indicated to us that the DPW was granting the waiver for this wall um, in, 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 in coordination with, uh, with DPW policy. Um, he also notes that there's a pull-off parallel parking space that the DPW does not allow um, and that's, that this is an existing condition on the site. Uh, Mr. Ostafine also said that they were waiving that and because it's an existing condition, an existing non-conforming condition on the site, that they are not requiring any change in that regard. So there'll be a, so somebody can parallel park along the front of the property. Yes, that's correct. Someone can parallel park along the property. Okay, last question. Um, one of the neighbors, when I was out at the at the property trying to figure it all out, um, expressed some concern about um, the setback rules and so forth. Having had a a previous experience that I think, without putting words in her mouth, I would say left her left her somewhat confused. And that may be the, the application that Jeremy was referring to. Uh, it's uh, uh, the next door neighbor. Now, and are, are you referring to the setback of the, the, the side yard setback? Yes. Of the, the driveway and the retaining wall? Yeah, I mean, if this is three and a half feet enough? Yes, 
So there, there is no required setback. It can, the driveway and retaining wall can essentially be right on the property line. So there is no specific setback in that regard for a driveway and a retaining wall. Okay, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other commissioners have any questions? Karen's good, Jim, we got him. Adam's good. Uh, George, you're okay? Mr. Thumbs up to George. And I think um, Jeff Paul's on the phone, so I can't see him, but he would chime in if he had any questions. Is anyone in the general public like to speak to this application? If you can turn on your uh, video and turn on your mic, if you can. Um, seeing none, with that said, it's a pretty straightforward application. We did something similar across the way. Um, and I understand what Mr. Doyle is trying to do. So with that said, um, I would like to turn the motion to close. Motion from Adam, looking for a second. Tara Gaines got a second. All in favor? Five zero. Five zero. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Doyle, we're going to probably debate this or deliberate this in a week or two. Yeah, please Decision February 15th. Great. Did you hear that, sir? I did. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. Thank you for coming in. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. Um, that is the end of the public hearing. Now we're going to go um, into the general meeting. You have to say goodbye to me. Oh, goodbye, Karen Gately. See you next week. Just in time to pick up from basketball. Bye, guys. <laughs> Ms. Gately is refusing herself from this application. Um, we're going to go to Parkland. Uh, and we have a draft, right? Yes, this is the zone change application that the first item the commission is going to discuss. That's two. Yeah. I'll, read, I'll read it into the record. Um, proposed amendments to the Darien zoning map COZN. Uh, number two, I want to see Parkland Drive put forth by Parkland Darien LLC. This is the proposal to apply the design office multifamily residential for one of the DOMR to the subject property to permit multifamily residential dwellings as a principal use requiring a special permit for 3.915 plus or minus acre subject property is located on the southern end of Parkland Drive, approximately 1,100 feet south of its intersection of Old Kings Highway North and Australian Assessor's Map number 35 is lot number 34 or unit two in the design office. And we have this for yes. uh, And we have a draft resolution um, that was about to we debated this or deliberated this is the better word um, a couple weeks ago. At the end of the day, I think everyone um, was on board with granting the um, over, over, overlay to land. Some, somebody's people have their, their mics on. I can hear like a baby in the background, somebody shuffling papers. Can everybody mute their microphones? Can you do that, Fred? Or is somebody can give you some and I do that? No, it wasn't you guys. Yeah, no, I'm no, gonna, no, I'm, I think we have the override control of the close. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and mute everyone on this conference right now. If you want to speak, you'll have to open your microphone. You've been muted by the organizer and by yourself. Okay. Um, so the, 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 at the end of the day, the the, the the pick up word, the test, or the right. The standard for the standard. commission under the state statutes is: is the proposal consistent with the town plan of conservation and development? And you may recall there was evidence at the public hearing presented by the applicant and evidence presented by the neighbors. When the commission deliberated at their meeting on January 11th, the sense I got, uh, Don I and I as staff, is the consensus of the commission was that this new overlay zone, which the commission established last year in 2021, could be applied to this property. Uh, you may recall uh, when this came before the commission last year to create this new overlay district, uh, the commission did approve that and adopt that change, but did not apply it to a property at that time. The subject application is to take that overlay 
and apply it to the 3.9 plus or minus acre property, which we've been referencing as three parklands drive. So the draft resolution walks through uh, the evidence, the findings, talks about the proper standard and condition of finding number eight, what is the standard and what, uh, as with any zoning change, the commission needs to establish an effective date, which must be after the date that the notice gets published. So you can see if the commission were to vote tonight, it would get published in the Darien Times on February 3rd. So it only go into effect once filed with the town clerk, and usually our policy has been uh, to give us a little time to staff to print up, new, in this case it would be a new zoning map, and file that zoning map with the town clerk. Okay, one quick typo I think I have. Mm -hmm. um, page 3B, December 22nd, 2022. I think you're correct, but let me pull the file which I have here. I think that could be 2020. You're correct. Okay. okay, and just for um, a little bit of clarification, can everybody hear me? If you can't just say yes. Yep, good, okay. And just for clarification, one of the things I think um, Commissioner Rand brought up last go around on page two, number six, it says the placement of the overlay zone does not prohibit the continuation of the office building use on the, prem on the premises. Um, if they never do um, anything to this after the zoning gets changed, the office building can stay um, forever and be used forever. It doesn't preclude the office building use on the property. Um, what else? Questions, comments, typos, scrivener's errors on this one? If you have anything you've picked up or caught other titles besides what I just mentioned, that would be great. He talks about the petition. Okay. Pretty much it. If you guys remember, this this um, old day zone goes to everyone that's a, um, a design office zone, which includes um, other buildings that are in this zone too, which is part of which is the truck stop, 85 Old Kings Highway. Excuse me. I think it goes to the tennis building. Some building that took any road. That's correct. Quickly be applied to those. The applicants in those case, the property owners would have to come before the commission. In there a very similar procedure as we had for this application, the public hearing to apply that overlay zone. Right, and there's also um, let's say uh, this uh, Thorndale Circle office park, which was Mr. Nielsen, Jerry Nielsen's property. Um, he was um, anything I missed on this one, everybody? anybody? Jim Rand, you okay? Yep. Adam, you okay? George Riley, you okay? And then Jeff yeah, Ball, oh, Jeff yeah, Ball's here with his range chair, so he's okay. Okay, with that said, I um, entertain a motion to approve this resolution as edited. Adam? Adam makes a motion, looking for a second. Jeff, Jeff, Ball. Jeff Ball makes a second. There you go. All those in favor? Five to zero. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. That's great. That piece is done. The next item that we have on the um, agenda, I'll read into the record. Deliberations only on the following items. Site plan application number 309, special permit application number 42-I. Um, is that dash wrong? Or I? That's I. That's I, okay. Land filling and grading application number 516, excuse me, Parkland Development, LLC, one Parkland Drive, and three Parkland Drive. Excuse me. Prepare to raise the existing office building at three Parklands Drive, convert and redevelop the property as a multifamily residential, consistent with design, office, multifamily residential overlay, zone D O M R regulations, uh, regulations and perform related site development activities, including the recreating of the property, installation of landscaping, lighting, stormwater management, 
The applicant proposed to construct a three-story multifamily building with a total of 60 apartments, studios, one and two bedroom apartments, including seven deed restricted affordable units. A total of 131 parking, 139 parking spaces will be created, of which 86, 86 of which are proposed for exclusive use by the residents of Three Parklands Drive, and 53 of which are proposed to be shared with the assisted living facility at One Parklands Drive. Ancestors map number 35, lot 34, unit number one. Improvements to one Parklands Drive are limited to sidewalk extensions, underground utilities, parking and related improvements. Three Parklands Drive is a 3.915 plus or minus acre, acres and is located on the southern end of Parklands Drive, approximately 1,100 feet south of its intersection with Old Kings Highway North and is shown on the Cessna's map number 35, slot 34, unit number two, currently in the design office zone DO. Um, companion zoning map change proposed to rezone three park and seven to design office multifamily residential overlay zone DOMR. The application materials are on file and reviewed for public review in the planning zoning office and online at darianct.viewpointcloud.com. Okay. okay, Jim, you give us green sheets again. Yeah, what we wanted to do is kind of Deputy Commission methodically walk through this in terms of uh, issues, concerns. Uh, I know some commission members ask that we put things that were in the record uh, in your packets to bring it to your attention. Uh, it's quite an extensive record, obviously. We heard about nine hours of testimony. There's a number of letters from neighbors, uh, submittals from the applicants, et cetera. So it, there's a lot to digest here. Um, we may not even get through it all tonight, but at least uh, what we want to do is see if we can figure out where the consensus amongst the five commission members is in terms of uh, how to address the site plan and special permit. So uh, as we discussed last time, there's specific standards in the Darien Zoning Regulations, uh, Section 1020 for the site plan, Section 1005 for the special permit, and the Landfilling and regrading is addressed through Section 850 of the Zoning Regulations. So I know there's a lot of topics uh, that the Commission will need to touch on. Certainly, we've addressed the zoning maps. The Commission just voted on that a few minutes ago, so we don't have to cover that as part of this because it has already been rezoned. Um, so I don't know if you want to start with. The site plan, the special permit, if you want to take it by topic, say drainage, grading, landscaping, uh, you want to talk about procedural issues with construction. Not sure how you want to begin in terms of the deliberations. What I was thinking is, is do some of the um, of the potential proofs with this one. This yeah. So here. So some of those items we talked about that um, we talked about it at various different times. Um, and I think if we give you direction on that or come to consensus on that, we can take a chunk at it. Um, the first item, I'm on, I'm on what I call the green sheets, which is our um, cheat sheet that Jeremy puts in our packets, or the staff puts in our packet. Potential conditions of approval to address concerns. Um, the first bullet point is here is main access, maintain access to solid wood center construction, public access easement. We definitely do not want to cut off uh, anything with regards to um, with regards to getting to Selick Woods and those. I think there's nine parking spaces in the today. Yeah, there's nine parking spaces today, and um, we don't want to cut off people with their cars. With their, I don't know if dogs are if dogs are allowed on the on beach. I don't know. I don't remember. Um, yes. Yeah, they are. Right. Yeah. Dogs are allowed most things on beach. Um, I don't think we, there's any argument relative to that. Um, so in terms of staging and, and planning, that's going to have to make sure that gets maintained. Anybody have a problem with that? I want to go as fast as I can, or, or as, as not fast, quickly as I can, um, and thorough as I can. So if, if I, everyone has a problem, just chime in. The next item is um, requirement to post performance bonds for planning and drainage. 
I think this is um, an offshoot of what uh, Commissioner Rand suggested last week or two weeks ago on this. I think it's a great idea. Um, the plantings, you know, we've had issues with plantings at places like Highland Farms where the cane and rent didn't go. Um, and the drainage um, is important to everybody, especially. Um, I think the biggest question is, is how big of a bond is one and two when we sunset? Yeah, we can, as staff, we can try to figure that out based on the plans. Uh, what's there? So certainly we can do that is when do they have to be posted and when would the contractor be able to re request a release? So staff can work on that. Okay. My initial question or suggestion, both in one, is uh, a year from the first temporary um, TCO was issued. Mm -hmm. They get you through a full year, uh, which is a, for, for, really for the drainage bonds. I just know that when that, when that other building was built, um, that was a big question, a big problem that, that came up. I'd like it to get through a full year before anything like that gets lifted. Anybody have any questions relative to the, to, to the drainage at this point and a bond for that? Okay. Um, yeah, if I may, I, I think that the, it, the, it has to be drafted in such a way that uh, the test is, does it work? Not, did we install the 150 feet of PVC pipe that we said we would in the plan? It's got to be does it work? And I think some effort, as long as I can volunteer the staff for additional work, should try to ascertain from the residents that complained about the, the nursing home um, what the baseline should be. Because if there's no change from last year to next year then the bond should be released I mean, it would not make it any worse but the question is where do we start uh and i've that's that's all i got to say <laughs> i think one idea jim i know uh, what the commission has done with the um with the federal realty project is you brought in an outside engineer in that case, it was, uh, I believe it was Joe Rizzoli's office, uh, who is uh, caught keeping an eye on or going out and seeing for can the installation. So even though, uh, in that case, Federal Realty had their own engineering firm, uh, there was an outside engineer hired at the applicant's expense to ascertain that it was installed properly. And certainly that, that is a potential to, as you said, Jim, there's two aspects. Install it properly, number one, and make sure it works. No, does it have to work um, within a, what's the proper word, um, a level of what it was designed to do? Right, and then I think that's the other aspect is, you know, these, these uh, systems are designed to meet certain storm standards, whether it be 50 year or 100 year, whatever it's designed for. So in the case of the September storm, you may recall that uh, many engineers say that was a 500 year storm. So no drainage system in Darien is designed to that extent. So certainly, Jim, your point is a good one, that we have to acknowledge the word, uh, the phrase, is it working is to uh, uh, the storms it was addressed to address, so to speak. So you're right, Jim, that's important to document is it's not design, the system that they've designed won't handle a 500 year storm, but it will handle a say a 50 year storm. So yeah, I think the word I was, was, was looking for was, was tolerance. Yeah. So it's within a 90% tolerance or something like that. Because relative to like things like the federal project, that was not designed to fix all the flooding on um, it's really designed to cover it. Okay. Is that okay? So relative to the
Um, George, you turn your microphone on, sir. I just wanted to add into the mix here um, the question of what is handling a hundred year storm. Uh, does that mean there's no overflow into, uh, in particular, the uh, Salix Woods, Dunlop Woods area, or does it mean that it's moderated or that there's no flow uh, because it's all in the Caltex drainage system or whatever it is? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm just supposing we would need to define the success, I guess. Yeah, I, I think that's what I think that's what I was trying to, to um, articulate. Where it's a level, a level of tolerance that that it's that it's designed for, and relative to the example that Jeremy gave, where there's a third NGM, we call it, um, that's overseeing federal to make sure that's done. Because you got to remember when federal did it first, they their their application had an engineer. Then we got a third party engineer. Look over that, do that, and now there's another engineer on top of that, making sure the things put in as designed. It might be. It, it depends. It will be. be it could be. It could be all higher. It depends who we're able to bring up like that. But certainly that we want to make sure that everything is done correctly. I think that's the key here. That's working as designed. Yeah. Okay. Um, then the other piece of that one bullet point is plantings. Uh, and that's the same thing. I don't know if we have a full sense of what the, of the plantings are and where they're going to be. Um, most of them, I think, it's currently designed. They're on the, I'm going to call it the, the east side, which is the side that faces the truck stop. It's not the side that, that goes. Yeah, I'm, just right here. I'm just, I was trying to, I'm driving with north, south, east, west. Good question. Um, but that, and we're going to probably get into this later on if we, if we want any more plantings or less planting. I don't think we have to want that. Yeah, um, you recall that Matt Pop of uh, Environmental Land Solutions prepared a landscape plant, a version I have here in my hand, is dated November 3rd, 2021. Um, so the, the, the way. The, the way we usually do those um, in terms of sunsets, which is my big thing, is to get through one growing season. So it, it meant to, from the year that, from the date they're put in, which may be six months after the temporary certificate of occupancy is, is issued, depending on the completion date, then, it, then it's going to go one growing season with that between land of actually being like a year ahead. Right? Um, and again, we have to figure out, you know, values and whatnot. We'll work on that. Okay. Anybody have any questions or problems relative to that? And remember, the thing we have to remember is there's there's two there's two functions or people here. One's the applicant, and one's the developer. At this point in time, you know, they're not necessarily the same. Um, they may be the same. They may not be the same. So when we're talking about. The item we're going on the guy who building the building. Right. There'll be a point where, uh, and it's, it's, it's this case with every application the commission sees, it's not specific to the applicant, um, but we run with the property. So, right. yes, we'll have to make it clear that, uh, and that's what we're talking through today is what additions, uh, let's. Yeah, as a commission, you'd be able to make the right to finding special permits. Because two two quick examples just for for um, your edification is one is relative to federal. That first resolution was done by Tom Golden, um, and, and part of that stuff carried on for years and years and years. Was passed out to federal. Um, and the other example is um, three part fence drive. That applicant um, was one. One uh, one partner said that applicant was not the ultimate builder of the project. Um, after the project was approved, the land transfer and a new person built it. Um, so as so everyone just remembers and knows that this stuff runs with the land. Um, any questions, comments on those two items? As we get to the next one, okay. The next one on here is, is requirement for construction management logistics plans. Um, uh, file prior to issuing of building permits, hours construction, delivery, settlement control, 
a lot of this stuff is pretty much, um, um, I want to say, boilerplate or, or, you know, what we do all the time. Um, and, a, and a lot of instances, did they file as a, um, a, a staging plan for this or a construction, construction schedule? Phase, a phasing plan, I think. I don't think they did. I'll have to go through and check yeah, the records. Yeah, yeah. And so if they didn't, that could certainly be a requirement for the commission is a uh, staging phasing plan. Okay. So something like that is, is, is staging a phasing plan. So for argument's sake, the demolition of the building is going to take, you know, three months. And then they're going to grade it for three months. And then the steel goes up for three months. Um, I've seen Redis and me do things like that before. It's a really cool spreadsheet. We definitely, definitely, definitely had it for um, Oxford School yep. when that was done, because um, that was really important. This is kind of similar to Oxford School, because at Oxford School, you have the school going on, and kids going in and out, and this one, we got an apartment building going on, and people go, I mean, it's just a little bit going on, kids going in and out. Right. Um, anybody have any questions about this, something like that? It's it's it ends up being a long spreadsheet. And it's got a bunch of colors and it goes up and down. It's really it's kind of cool. And and when you say odd time odd budget, those guys pulled out that spreadsheet. And they said right now we're you know 15 weeks in the project and we should be at X spot. And you look at it, they're at X spot. They're dead on. Um, hours of construction deliveries. What's our standard with that? Um, yeah, usually actually. construction uh, is sun sundown. That's typical building department type construction and most contractors builders start about 7 a.m uh go to about three certainly if the commission wants to say nothing can start prior to seven that would be pretty typical do we ever do that does it change at all when the building's enclosed i think what the commission has done in the past is as you're getting toward the end of the project where you're doing interior finishes uh, Etc. Uh, if it's indoor work, you can certainly start earlier. Uh, but generally, the commission has in the past said no outdoor construction type work before 7 a.m. So they come back sometimes on stuff like that? I, mean, I just feel it. Like, I just think like Token 8 Club, they came back you know, six months into it and said we really need to paint on Sundays. Yeah, I think indoor work is they different than outdoor back. work. All right, so you see where I'm going out there, people like right now, um, Federal has not enclosed their two new apartment buildings. Um, the one that's on West Avenue is pretty much very, very close to being fully enclosed. They're doing the outside shingling of it. Um, and then once they start putting in bathrooms and, and interior, you couldn't hear from the exterior anyway. Um, the other that's in Federal's parking lot is still wide open, it's not enclosed. So, there might be a shift. I think right now, if we just lock it in at one time frame, and then if they want to come back later, we can say, hey, it's all closed. You know, we do that. Is that okay with everybody? I'm getting shaking heads. Good. Okay. Um, sediment and ro erosion controls, that's pretty much standard operating procedure. All that stuff's got to be in place well in advance. Yep. It's inspected by everybody before they start construction public contact phone number. How have we been handling that? Uh, well, that's two things, a public contact phone number versus calling you. Yeah, I think that if we found that in generally to be successful where there is a contact of the contractor, builder, someone if there is a problem or issue that can be reached out to who might be able to address it seven days a week. Okay. In, in, in the state of New York, on the building permit, it says on the bottom, any information, please contact, and it's got the names and phones of people. Did we do that around here? We do make people post their building permit, but in this case, we can certainly... Is that a contact name? Uh, the contact name would be on the permit, but not necessarily number, but certainly that could certainly be a condition. Okay, so we could do that, would be great. But when I go to construction sites in New York, if you go there, the things under construction, it's right next to the building permit, it's a contact list. A lot of this, you know, the first one's 311, but then it says, like, you know, um, structure tone construction, this is their phone number if you have any problems or issues. That's in Connecticut, they don't really do that. I've not seen it around here, but I know I see it in New York. So that's something where 
if you go over and you're there at you know six fifty five in the morning, you take a picture of people working, you can call somebody and, and contact them versus us. And that's gonna be some we call that liaison. Yeah, we can certainly call it liaison for uh, names and contact liaisons. Okay. Is everyone okay with that? That something's gonna get posted um, next to the building permit at the, at the property. Um, versus, you know, send out some kind of email blast to a neighborhood, which is, I don't know. I don't know if that works. Um, right next is limits on blasting, home revving, and chipping. Um, we always have that. Do we give them the number of days for the land blasting? I think there was some blasting. There's a piece of ledge that needs to come out. I have to reread the record. Fred, do you remember? Yeah, I think we'll have to get some further clarification. On, I would love to reread the record. What? the uh, how many days that they're requesting i seem to recall it was something like four or five days it wasn't a lot but okay. we'll we'll have to go back to the record and confirm yeah. what that is i think the record's what it's like two two filing drills full yeah <laughs> yeah there's, pretty much there's nine hours of testimony but yeah. uh we, we you know certainly the pnc minutes are helpful to us okay. in tracking down when they talk about a topic so we'll, we'll track that down Sam, track down the last thing Okay. So usually what we do relative to that, we give them a couple of days of, of blasting and a couple of days of programming. Relative to blasting, there's fire there's fire marshal permits and notification permits and all that stuff. That's all again standard operating procedure, um, which I don't think um, will ever ever change because once we created these best practices, we try to stick to them as long as we can regularly stick to them. But I think for the most part, we have we have developed them and stuck to them. Um, it's really just one portion of the site where there's a ledge outcropping. There's not many different areas on the site that need to be blasted. I think it's restricted ju to just a, a, a relatively small area of the site. So, yeah, because yeah. it kind of scrapes yeah. the new building is supposed to be in the same spot as basically the old building. Right. Um, everyone's good. Again, just scream me if, if I'm if I miss you. Supplementation or modification of landscaping screening in key areas, larger plantings or more plantings shown on the limited um, landscaping plan. This is this is partially me and partially the neighbors. Um, I'm trying to figure out how we get the general public to not going through this grill section. I think that my hold on. I mean I don't remember if they ever did an alternate site plan. They did. They made some changes. So um, there, there, in the November 3rd letter, because you would ask that last time, the yep. November 3rd letter from Mr. Flaherty yep. uh, talks about that change. And I think that's in, if I recall, number 40, uh, page 12, uh, public access to the courtyard. Uh, Mr. Flaherty's response was, we revised the site plan to indicate a sidewalk following the access drive around the easterly side of the building, which no longer cuts through the residential courtyard. Because you would ask that. So that's what this is here now? Yes, it's been, this has been revised. This is I think this is a revised plan. The November 11th plan. So it's got to be a couple of days before November 3rd. Anything after, anything before November 3rd should be later. And this is the old landscaping plan. This is the October 8th version. So the version you're looking at it is the visit on the third. Well, that's trail and sidewalk. Okay, good. All right, so that, my, my issue was, was taken care of. The other issue was um, some of the neighbor comments were that a large, the, the largest trees were on the, where's the second? There's north. Yeah, so that's the left side. That's building one. So that's what? Yep. This is California. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so right now, most of the trees are on the west side of the property. Those are the big ones, which are ARs, which are um, Acer, Robert, there's eight of those guys on the west side of the property. There's not a whole lot on the east side of the property. Remember, partially because this thing is, is above, the, the site slopes up from west up to east. But one of the neighbor requests was to put additional screening on that side. Um, is there a spot where we can put it? This is a road here, right? 
Yeah, we'll have to look closer at the plan. There are some existing plantings. Uh, if you look on uh, Matt Pop's plan, you show some of the existing trees. Huh? Yeah. yeah. And so that's the key is, is there room to put in new plantings and how much room? Again, what he shows at the I'll call it the east start part of the site is this existing tree area, which is called woods, right? Which he's labeled as woods. 